Chapter 151. Dogfight. Part 2. I have Ragus's words and the dragon weapons as proof. Ragus spoke these words when he spoke about Carlos. You send my friends to the underworld. Azel had extrapolated from Ragus's words that the other dragon demon generals would be unable to return from death unlike him. Laura queried. What about the dragon weapons? The guy called Jeffers Almeric wasn't using Almeric's dragon weapon. It seemed the soul hammer wasn't passed on. And it seems the storm's scream hadn't been passed on either. That is my proof. If his speculation was correct, it was the worst case scenario. Ragus had become an undead, yet he had become stronger than the version of himself during the Dragon Demon War. Almeric might be in a similar situation, and if Atane revives, no one will be able to stop them. Azel bit his lips. His heart felt heavy, and his head hurt. It had been a long time since he felt such a desolate feeling. In the past, he had a friend that had been able to share such emotional load with him. Carlos. Azel's eyes unconsciously headed towards Euron. Euron smiled as if to reassure him. Don't worry about it. I'm not sure what our enemies will do, but when I took a nap, I received a new secret technique from the guide. I'm sure everything will work out. His words failed to reassure Azel. Euron was claiming he had learned a secret technique he didn't know by taking a nap. He was claiming his overall battle prowess had been strengthened. How could he feel reassured after hearing such words? The problem was the fact the urine could really back up what he had said. Who and what the hell is this guide? Was Carlos really the unidentified guide leading urine? He didn't have proof, but he wished it was so. He wanted it to be as Ragus had suspected. He wanted Carlos to be alive. No, he didn't have to be alive. Azel just wanted some part of Carlos to exist in this world. How great would it be if Carlos had left behind a presence in this world to help him? If you are alive, this is the time to show up. If you made the effort to send your descendant, you should have at least given him a dragon weapon. Azel knew he was being a baby, but he continued to complain within his thoughts. The dragon demon king worshippers caught up with Azel's party once again on the next day. After their first attack, Chiron, Euron and Leticia tried to avoid as many locations that possessed waypoints leading to the Road of Darkness. Then they assessed possible locations where the enemies could station their troops. They moved to avoid such locations. Still, there was a limit to such a method. Their enemies could track them, and they could travel long distances using the Road of Darkness. Ignore them. Just run away. Chiron didn't engage each and every one of their enemies. Protect. The man from the prophecy. We will. Protect. The sound of whispering children rang out from the surrounding. The white ghost-like figures ran through the forest. They kept appearing and disappearing as if they were false images. It was a bizarre sight where they were sliding across the grass. None of the party members knew their exact number, but it was evident that the number of guardian shadows following them had exceeded a thousand. It was such an overwhelming number that it really made one wonder if all the guardian shadows on this continent was gathered here. The dragon demon king worshippers had created a wide net to impede the progress of the party. They were taken aback by the sight. What is going on with these ridiculous numbers? In the past dozens of years, they had fought the guardian shadows in the dark. They had never faced such an overwhelming numbers before. The guardian shadows operated all across the continent and highest number of guardian shadows gathered in one place was 200 according to the records. The net they had formed was made up of around 100 dragon demon king worshippers. The difference in number couldn't be overcome. It was true that each dragon demon king worshippers were stronger than the guardian shadows. However, the guardian shadows moved as one. Their teamwork was excellent, and they weren't weak against physical attacks unlike humans. This was why the Guardian Shadows became more effective in rough terrains where they held a decisive numbers advantage. In an instant, the Guardian Shadows destroyed the enemy line. Azul's party was able to break through, and they didn't even have to participate in the battle. However, this skirmish allowed the Dragon Demon King worshippers to narrow down the party's route. Another day passed yet their enemies had not attacked. However, the party knew they were being watched. Chiron was able to guess at the enemy's plan. 
They want to avoid a direct confrontation for now. Are they trying to herd us? If the Guardian Shadows were included, the party was a fairly large army. However, they weren't restricted in their movements by their large number. Moreover, as the party's health improved, their travel speed increased. The healer and the recovery items provided by the Keepers of the Prophecy had been a big help in this respect. They were even able to switch out their damaged armors. They drank healing potions and magic recovery potions like water to hasten their recovery. It had been only two days since Azel had clashed with Ragus, but he had recovered enough to be able to summon his dragon weapon. However, in a direct confrontation, I'll still be a burden. Currently, he could merely walk on his own two feet. It would be impossible for him to fight. However, he was able to use his magical energy. It would take some time, but it would be possible for him to be of help by using his sky splitter and clones. Chiron spoke. Unlike yesterday, it seems they aren't willing to waste their troops. They are observing us in real time to accurately predict our route. It seems they plan on putting up a barricade to stop us. They could feel the gazes of their enemies. Moreover, they could feel the gazes coming from all sides. It seemed they had dispatched scouts in the distance as the party was put on a constant surveillance. It seemed they would be unable to avoid the surveillance of their enemies. Chiron spoke. We are traveling at pretty high speeds, but Azel was being moved with flight magic, and they had traveled in a straight line for about 70 kilometers after they broke through the encircling net. If they wanted to maintain enough magical energy and stamina to be able to battle at any moment, they had to maintain this speed. Even if we make changes to our course, we can avoid the fact that they would also be able to make changes to their prediction. They can't concentrate all their forces in a single location, but it is possible to choose two to three locations. So we have have to choose a location where Ragus isn't stationed. No, in my estimation, it won't matter which route we choose. Chiron explained his reasoning. As time passed, the party was getting healthier, and the number of Guardian Shadows were swelling. Their enemies knew this fact, so it meant that their enemies had come prepared. No matter which force they faced, it would hold troops that would be hard to break through. Moreover, Ragus would show up when the party was bogged down in the fight. Chiron spoke. We have to defeat them. How would you suggest we do this? At Yuren's question, Chiron looked at his surrounding as he spoke. Our strength is the fact that we are gathered in one place. Don't we have our dependable allies with us? I guess you are right, but it was unknown as to how many Guardian Shadows were actually with them. The number kept swelling even after the number reached a thousand. It was now plain to see why such powerful beings such as the Dragon Demon King worshippers had been afraid of the Guardian Shadows. If there were a couple hundred of them, maybe Ragus might not be able to overcome them. Even if our enemies gather a big force, we are at an advantage. When the number of troops exceeded several hundreds, they needed a decent amount of space to be able to fight effectively. However, the party had strictly traveled locations where there weren't many people around. Basically, they were traversing through mountains or forests. If one looked at the history of wars on this continent, there were many cases where a specialized troop could easily hold off an opponent that was several dozen times larger if they held the right terrain. There was no way such a large group of Dragon Demon King worshippers could display their full strength in this forest. In that aspect, the existence of the Guardian Shadows were a cheat. They were phantom-like figures that could ignore the restriction placed by their surroundings, and they boasted a preposterous ability that linked each of the Guardian Shadows to each other. Chiron spoke. The thing that bothers me the most are the keepers of the prophecy. If they are with us, the probability of victory rises. So why aren't they showing themselves? Chiron didn't expect much from the keepers of prophecy in terms of individual fighting prowess. However, the undeads they traveled with were very skilled. It would be a big help if such strong beings could join them. This was especially true, because the party wasn't in perfect condition. Suddenly, Euron spoke. Maybe they are waiting for a crucial moment to show up. Him, what if they show up during the moment of direst need? Maybe they are trying to show off. I would like to believe they are above such petty way of thinking. Chiron shook his head from side to side as he made the decision. 
we'll prioritize breaking through their line. Our most important objective is to reach the Alberton Forest. It would prevent them from chasing us. Another seven hours passed. The sun was about to rise in the early morning when the party clashed with Dragon Demon King worshippers that numbered over a thousand troops. The ones to attack first was the Guardian Shadows. The Guardian Shadows had the stealth capabilities of ghosts, so they attacked after getting close to their enemies. After the first clash, the white forms swept over their enemies like a wave as the sound of battle rang out. Azul's party slowly followed behind them. They were assessing the number and composition of their enemies. This wasn't a fight where they were trying to with. They had to break through this line, so they didn't charge headlong into the battlefield. Still, their enemies tried to attack them from a distance. Magic spells and arrows traversed a distance of 300 meters towards the party as they detonated. However, Laura and Euron was able to block these attacks easily. Euron expressed his amazement. There are so many of them that are able to show such accuracy at this distance. It was a location where a mountain met another mountain. It was the worst terrain for a large force to operate on. Moreover, the sun hadn't come up yet, so visibility was a problem. The trees should have also helped in hiding the party. However, a good amount of attack was flying towards them. There were several dozen skilled practitioners that were able to accurately attack them in such conditions. It signified that the Plane of Darkness had gathered their elites for this venture. Even if the Guardian Shadows held a decisive number advantage, they couldn't be overconfident. Azel focused his mind to survey the large battlefield, then he spoke. Ragus isn't here. Laura spoke immediately afterwards. There is Jeffers. Moreover, the Ornsaurus tribe is here. Everyone turned to look at Laura in surprise. Isn't that your tribe? Yes. I can feel the energy of the elders. How strong are the elders? They stopped leading from the front when they aged, but they are excellent magicians. They were our teachers. We'll have to be cautious. Their bodies weakened as they aged, so they had withdrawn from participating in battles a long time ago. This was why their senses had dulled. If they were to fight as warriors, this fact would have been a critical weakness. However, as magicians, they would be dangerous despite such a disadvantage. Blade of Storm. The surrounding trees shook as a powerful wave of dragon demon magic spread into the surrounding. Jeffers Almeric had summoned his dragon weapon. It wasn't just him. Chain of Storm. Son of Fire. Spear of Pain. Dragon weapons were being summoned from various locations. Leticia was taken aback. They had this many dragon weapons. Chapter 152. Dogfight. Part 3. They've been gathering them for the past 220 years. Laura answered him. Of course, they would have a lot. Him. The party groaned. Dragon weapons were being summoned in succession. Their enemies had already summoned nine dragon weapons. It was inevitable. The plane of darkness severed the succession of dragon weapons in the outside world. Yet they continued to create dragon weapons. Then there was the dragon weapons possessed by the survivors of the Dragon Demon War. Those that were from the Dragon Demon race used their longevity to work on their own dragon weapons over time. The Dragon Magians used the Dragon Slayer's ritual to make their dragon weapons. These dragon weapons were passed on to the next generation. Even if some were lost during battle, the number of dragon weapons continued to grow. There was a change that occurred on the battlefield. Holes started to form in the wave of guardian shadows. The powerful attacks by the wielders of the dragon weapons started to change the tide of the battle. Azel spoke. Don't be afraid. Dragon weapons aren't created equal. Not all dragon weapons possess terrifying power such as the soul hammer and the Vitten's chalice. The dragon weapon possessed by Jeffers isn't sublime. However, it would be considered above average even during the dragon demon war. That is really comforting to know. Leticia grumbled. Azel grinned. Then let me tell you an additional information that might soothe your mind a little bit more. Even if all the dragon weapon users here attacked at the same time, Laura could handle them on her own. What? Everyone turned to look at Laura in surprise. She accepted their gazes with a blank face as she slightly nodded her head. If we are talking only about defense, I can do it. Everyone was at a loss for words. 
Then they remembered how Azel had used the Vitans' chalice against Regus. It wasn't out of the realm of possibility. Moreover, there was a fact that the party had overlooked. The Vitans' chalice was a dragon weapon made for a magician. In truth, I was only able to bring out half its power. When Azel received the Vitans' chalice from Laura, he had talked about this fact. Of course, the previous Laura hadn't been that strong. However, she had learned how to bring out the true power of the Vitans' chalice from Azel. She was a much scarier being compared to before. Him. Chiron was observing the battlefield through the magic eye put up by Euron. After surveying the battlefield for a short amount of time, Chiron spoke. These guys. It seems there are close to 3,000 guardian shadows gathered here. It might exceed that number. There are that many. Leticia was surprised. Even if the terrain caused them some trouble, there was a reason why the elites of the Dragon Demon King worshippers were struggling against the Guardian Shadows. Chiron spoke. We'll traverse the ridge on the left. We'll climb it diagonally to break through their line. Can you do it, Azel? In this instance, I'll have to do it even if it kills me. Azel grinned. Laura spoke. I'll support you. Don't worry about it. I'll leave it up to you. In Azel's current condition, he couldn't generate the requisite speed needed to break through their line. In the end, he had no choice, but to rely on Laura's magic. Azel spoke as he looked up into the sky. Shall I send a single blow towards them as a greeting? At the same time as he spoke those words, the fading darkness covering the sky parted. Come out Dragon Macon. In an instant, all the Dragon Demon King worshippers on the battlefield looked up towards the sky. From beyond the heavens, a light exploded to rip apart the darkness of daybreak. Sky Splitter, an elder from the Ornsaurus tribe was a survivor of the Dragon Demon War. The elder once again felt the fear he had felt from several hundred years ago revive within him, and he felt his body freeze. That cursed sword really made its appearance once again. It was the weapon of the devil. It had killed their god, Dragon Demon King Atain. However, the fear they felt overshadowed the hate they felt. How many of their comrades were killed by that sword? The elder's voice shook as he shouted out his words. Ah, Azel Kazark is over there. Everyone go get him. The current young generation had no idea how frightening an existence Azel was. For them, Azel was the devil from a legend. The ones that had faced him before was the only ones that knew true fear of facing him. This was why the Elder knew his troops would be able to fight him without being overwhelmed by the fear. The Elder was frozen as he tried to rationalize the situation. However, his face froze again. Come forth dragon weapon. Vitans chalice. A wave dragon demon magic on par with the sky splitter spread into the surrounding. Then the space in front of him became distorted. Laura, you ungrateful traitor. The light let out a sound akin to a scream. The pure white light looked like thunder, and it was coming towards him. No, I have to get out of here. I have to break away, so I can stay hidden from him. In a flash, the thunderbolt burned through his defensive magic, and the inside of the elder's head turned white. He was paralyzed from fear. He couldn't even think. Before he could respond, a dimensional distortion appeared next to him. The sky splitter, which was in a state of light, cut through the elder. It was a direct hit. The magic eye in the sky allowed Azel to lock in on the Elder's position, and the dimensional distortion of Vitan's chalice bridged the long distance between the two locations. The sky splitter was sent through to hit the target. The sky splitter attacked at the speed of light. This was why it was possible to hit one's enemy in a split second. Of course, it was demanding to hit a target that was far away, and it was hard to lock in on one's target. This limitation was solved by teaming up with Laura. The two of them worked closely as they let out a continuous stream of attacks. They did this as they charged towards their destination. Sudden sneak attacks kept popping up all around the battlefield. The Sky Splitter's attacks disintegrated the line of the Dragon Demon King worshippers. This doesn't make any sense. Even if that is a dragon weapon of a Dragon Demon General, how can this be possible? Everyone started to scream. The fact that there were over 3,000 Guardian Shadows was a disaster in itself. 
Now, the Guardian Shadows were being used as shields as Azel and Laura used the legendary dragon weapons that was famous, even in the Dragon Demon War. A nightmare occurred when the two weapons were used in concert with each other. When Laura was their ally, she had worked in the darkness. So they didn't know how scary she was. However, now that they had to face her as an enemy, they understood why the humans had feared Ornsaurus. They felt the fear deep within their bones. She wasn't the only one that was terrifying. Dragon sword, burn the evil darkness. Chiron climbed to the highest point on the ridge, and his chant echoed throughout the mountain. A sharp sword energy cut through the air as Chiron swung his dragon sword. The sword energy flew horizontally as it cut through the mountain. The mountain peak fell on top of the dragon demon king worshippers. The dragon demon king worshippers screamed. In such pandemonium, only one person was running. He ran faster than the falling speed of the mountain peak. He ran across the side of the mountain cliff to climb up the ridge. It was a surprisingly acrobatic move, and he was able to escape the attacks of the guardian shadow. Come, oh, storm. A swirling gale of wind swept over the party. It was Jeffers Almerick. He used the gale created by his dragon weapon to restrict the party's movement and he aimed the blue flame crawling up his transparent blade towards a single spot. He concentrated his attack. The blue flame swirled into the air. The magic flame was added into the gale as the flame was amplified. One couldn't breathe in such a firestorm, and it felt as if one's body was about to be swept up into the air. The blue magical flame kept swirling to increase its effectiveness. However, how laughable, the current of cold air blew the flames away. The surrounding temperature quickly dropped as if it was winter. The precipitation in the air froze to cover the mountain with snow. Leticia's yellow-red eyes held murderous intent as she climbed up towards him. Jeffers grinded his teeth. Ice Queen. After Leticia used instantaneous movement to charge forward, she clashed with Jeffers. When the sword and spear clashed against each other, a clear sound rang out. Then the cold current and the hot gale clashed against each other. Leticia. Euron immediately moved to support Leticia, but Jeffers hadn't come here alone. Chet. Annoying bastards. The magicians supported Jeffers from below as sparks detonated in the air. It was the side effect of spells not being able to materialize. Leticia spoke with an icy voice that was colder than the cold current created by her. If you just stayed silent in the corner, you might have gotten out of this alive. It seems you are begging for your death. However, I also am eager to put you in your grave. You speak such words even though you are the shame of our tribe. I will kill you here to recover our honor. You are a spoiled young master that is putting too much trust in your dragon weapon. Ha laughable. Leticia snorted. However, unlike her words, she didn't plan on fighting a life and death battle with Jeffers. Jeffers with his dragon weapon wasn't an easy opponent. Moreover, the objective of the party was to break through the line of Dragon Demon King worshippers. She would bide her time before she would escape. She would leave behind Jeffers. It happened at that moment. Darkness started to sweep over the battlefield. The sky had been slowly getting lighter, yet an unnatural darkness invaded the heavens. Laura groaned when she saw this, and she mumbled a single word. Niberus. It was as she said. It hadn't been long since the party had stated their battle with the intent of breaking through the line. However, the enemies stationed in other locations had already started to trickle in one or two at a time. One of the first ones to arrive was Niberus, who had arrived with her Book of Darkness summoned. The one with the name steeped in sin. No, the great sinner Azel Kazark. From the time Niberus showed up on the battlefield, the darkness started to spread like a tsunami. She spoke in a low voice, but there was authority behind it that made it hard for others to breath. It is hard for me to believe that you are actually him, but I am thankful for the chance to be able to recover my father's honor. Moreover, a killing intent that was as cold as ice was omitted from her. I'll avenge Duran's death. In a flash, everyone's gaze was focused on Niberus. It was because the presence she was exuding was overwhelming. It was a stage where all kinds of dragon weapons and high-ranked magicians were showing off their powers. However, 
The imposing presence she was exuding was too large as it overwhelmed their presence. As the darkness spread into the surrounding, bizarre monsters started appearing from within the darkness. They were composed of darkness, so no light reflected off of them. One could see the barest outline within the darkness. It was as if someone had drawn these monsters. The tentacles of darkness danced as they appeared from within the darkness to lash out at the guardian shadows. From between the tentacles, large monsters rampaged. They were made out of darkness, yet a purple flame covered them. They were made from the pain and grudge of the dead. The corrupted energy from these beings were used to devour corpses, and black magic was used to raise the corrupted bodies. The surrounding darkness was basically a domain that was under the control of Niberus. All kinds of curses were inflicted onto the guardian shadows, and she imbued more power to her familiars. Even if Niberus was a high-rank black magician with superb dragon demon magic, she was showing a surprising amount of control over her power. Azel immediately saw through to the reason behind it. It seems you plan on avoiding your earlier mistake. You've come up with a pretty clever idea. I'll think of your words as an innocent compliment. Niberus approached him. Cybane's Book of Darkness was also a top-shelf dragon weapon that had etched its name in the legends. There were many spells imbued within it, and in the past, Azel had stalled a great magic called, Queen of Darkness before it could manifest. Just the initiation of the great magic had made Chiron shudder. This magic had the effect of explosively boosting the darkness magic of a magician. It was such a large-scale magic that it took a long time to materialize, so it had the downside of compromising one's defense. Azel had used this weakness to his benefit in the last fight, and Niberus didn't plan on repeating the same mistake. She had summoned the Book of Darkness before entering the battlefield. She had completed the Queen of Darkness spell in preparation for this battle. Chapter 153. Dogfight. Part 4. You won't be able to run away so easily. The darkness around her danced as corrupted bodies rose up. The ominous product of black magic stopped the advance of the guardian shadows. Darkness arose from the Book of Darkness, and it was as if several dozen magicians were attacking at the same time. Magic spells carpet bombed the party. It was a terrifying amount of firepower where she would be able to handle even an army by herself. The mountaintop couldn't withstand the assault, so it disintegrated. As she oversaw all of this, Niberus mumbled to herself. It won't work. Azul's clone, which had been one with the darkness, had appeared from next to her. The clone let out a surprise attack however, it was as Niberus had said. It wouldn't work on her. She had already formed the Queen of Darkness spell, so it was akin to her having control over a castle wall and the troops within it. Now that I know you are the great sinner, I will never treat you lightly. The emanating darkness blocked Azul's surprise attack, and a spell appeared from within the darkness. However, instead of Azul's clone being destroyed, a powerful force struck her barrier. She raged as she was pushed back in midair. Laura. Laura had used Vitten's chalice to create a dimensional distortion, and it had turned Niberus' attack on herself. Niberus' gaze met Laura's gaze. Yes. I'll use this opportunity to settle my ill-fated relationship with you too. In the past, Niberus did not have a dragon weapon, so Laura had always been superior to her. That wasn't the case now. She had inherited the Book of Darkness, and she had learned how to operate it now. At the very least, she was sure she was on par with Laura. No, since she had formed the Queen of Darkness, she was stronger than Laura. However, when she was about to attack, the sight in front of her eyes suddenly became distant. It was the eternal plane opened through the Vitten's chalice. Niberus' eyes widened. What the hell? Laura had unnaturally expanded the space of a particular location, and it created a severe problem for Niberus. She had spread a cursed darkness over the entire battlefield, but now she was far away from that darkness. I've been had. Niberus was sure Laura had made this calculated move to exploit her weakness. As a magician, no, as a dragon weapon user, Laura had predicted how Niberus would use her dragon weapon. Niberus had completely lost in terms of reading how her opponent would use her dragon weapon. This hadn't resulted, because she was inferior in terms of power. 
The difference came from Nibiru's lack of knowledge. Laura had heard all the facts she hadn't known about the dragon weapons from Azel. She had heard all the account of how they were used during the Dragon Demon War. It was possible that Laura knew more about the Book of Darkness than Nibiru's. This was why she was able to predict what Nibiru's would do, and she was able to come up with a plan to deal with Nibiru's. When Nibiru's came here, she had already brought out her dragon weapon, and she had activated the Queen of Darkness spell. Afterwards, she had been complacent. Laura had taken advantage of such mental weakness. The cursed darkness she had spread over a large region continued to move farther away from her in the Eternal Plains. Then a light tore through the darkness as it moved towards her. It was the sky splitter. Cold sweat started to emanate from Nibiru's body. She had been able to block the attack, thanks to the Book of Darkness, but her defense had been shredded into pieces in an instant. Since she was focusing only on her defense, her situation was steadily getting worse. The eternal plane that had filled her vision started to distort as buildings that looked to be made out of countless mirrors started to emerge. Nibirus knew what this change meant. Her face paled. This is the Vitten's maze. This technique had always been Laura's strong point. It was a technique that created an isolated dimension. At the same time, Nibirus felt a terrifying amount of pressure wash over her. If she lost her concentration for even a second, all her magic spells would probably be cancelled. If she was to make a comparison, it was as if she was fighting in high altitude where oxygen was scarce. The act of trying to use magic in this space put a much bigger burden on her. It wasn't simply that the Vitten's maze created a pocket dimension. The pocket dimension itself gave an overwhelming advantage to the owner of the Vitten's chalice. This, Laura joined in the attack as she let out a torrent of magic. Nibirus was forced into a corner. She had completely fallen for a trap. She had wanted control over the entire battlefield, so she had used the Queen of Darkness spell. She had used her magic over a large area, and that had been a mistake. From the moment she was isolated from the battlefield through the Eternal Plane, all the spell she had prepared on her body had been cancelled. Moreover, her opponent had created a battlefield that was absolutely advantageous to her. I knew who my opponent was yet I was careless. I'm pathetic. Nibirus raged at her own easy-going attitude. Suddenly, a red flower petal fluttered past her eyes. The red flower petal was so stark against the cursed darkness that it looked unnatural. Nibirus knew what the flower petal signified. Garden of Blood Flower. Afterwards, several hundred to several thousand flower petals started to invade the space. The attack applied on Nibirus by Azel and Laura was blunted. As massive amount of magical energy poured in, Nibirus broke out of the Vitten's maze. Bleeding Star. Kieran Baldazark had entered into the fight. Laura swallowed a groan when she realized this. Laura had thought she had completely isolated Nibirus from the others. However, when she was transitioning from the Eternal Plains to the Vitten's Maze, Kieran had applied a sharp attack. One had to be well informed about the special characteristics of the Vitten's Chalice, and one had to focus one's whole being into exploiting this opportunity. The Vitten's Chalice and the Bleeding Star were very talented at creating advantageous fighting ground for their wielders. The two techniques that influenced the battlefield clashed as a powerful repulsive force formed. There was no time to warn the others. The Vitten's Chalice and the Field of Blood Flower collapsed as storms swept over the surrounding. In a flash, everyone on the battlefield halted. The explosion itself was secondary. The wave of magical energy assaulted everyone on the battlefield like a storm. In the epicenter of the explosion, gusts swirled as four people reappeared into normal space. Laura, it is regrettable that our reunion happened under such conditions. It was a young dragon demon male with beautiful blonde hair swirling about him. He spoke, and it really looked as if he found the situation to be regrettable. I owe you my life, thanks to your actions last time, but... I cannot forgive traitors. It is regrettable, Sir Baldazark. Laura answered him. However, my heart wasn't with your side from the start. I found my passion when I met Azel. Since it was Kieran, Laura decided to tell him the truth. At the very least, Kieran had treated her like a person. Kieran asked her a question. 
Does this mean the nefarious rumors about the Ornsaurus tribe is true? I'm not sure what you know, but it is probably true. I see. Kieran's expression turned bitter. Every rumor involving Laura had been nefarious in the plane of darkness. No one thought black magic experiments were wrong. However, these rumors had to do with the air being made through an artificial process. Laura was his peer, so it was a bitter pill to swallow that Laura had been made through such a horrifying experiment. This is my last offer, Laura. If you surrender yourself, I'll guarantee your survival. You know my answer, right? Yes. When he heard the answer he expected, Kieran let out a sigh. Soon, his face hardened from his resolve. Then I'll treat you as the greatest of my enemies. Countless bead of blood rose around Kieran. A large blood construct that was ten meters in size was floating above his head. Kieran spoke. I admit that the Vitten's chalice is a terrifying dragon weapon, but there's been plenty of blood spilled on this battlefield. Do you really think you'll be able to escape this place? Kieran had also summoned his dragon weapon before he arrived at the battlefield. Then he fetted all the blood flowing on the battlefield. He changed the blood into his power. Laura looked at Kieran and Niberus with nervous eyes. Kieran and Niberus possessed powers that was on par with Laura. The technique he had just used was proof of that. If Azul's body was whole, it might have been possible. However, they were at a disadvantage right now. Suddenly, Azel spoke in a serious manner. Something is coming here. Something, at Laura's question, Azel answered through whispering instead of vocalizing his words. I'm not sure. However, it is a being that is on par with Ragus in terms of power. This being is coming, while displaying his power quite openly. It's that bad. Unlike these guys here, he hadn't brought out his power, yet he is strong. Kieran and Niberus was strong, but they were using all the power available to them. They were using their dragon weapons and the powers bestowed on them. The being that was coming towards them was setting his teeth on edge. The power he was leaking out was small, yet the latent power he possessed was huge. He is still far away. Still, he is overtly sending his presence only towards me as if he is trying to get a reaction out of me. This truth caused Azel to shudder. This being was a long ways away, yet he was able to reveal his presence only to Azel, while hiding his presence from everyone else. He is coming here at an abnormally slow pace. It is as if he is taking a stroll. That was the part he couldn't understand. Azel made a decision. We can't waste any more time. We have to do this now. We are still too far off from being whole. If the sun isn't up, the speed at which we can gather won't be. It'll have to be enough. I'll create an opportunity for our escape. Leticia was occupying Jeffers. Euron was occupying the magicians supporting Jeffers. Chiron was going around slaughtering the magicians one by one. The guardian shadows still held the upper hand, but the problem was the fact the enemies were being reinforced as time passed. If they stayed any longer, Ragus would be here. If that happened, they would really be stuck here. They had to get out of here before that happened. Azel sent a whispering to all the members of his party. Soon, the sun will rise. At the first hint of light, I'll use a single attack. It'll be a signal. Azel would know the exact moment when the sun rises above the mountain. The first one to break the glaring contest was Niberus. After falling for Laura's ploy, her cursed darkness had been cut off. However, there was some darkness that hadn't dissipated. When she filled the partial darkness with her magical energy, it immediately attacked her enemies. As a high-speed magic battle occurred, numerous sparks flew into the air. However, the taut battle lasted only for a moment. Laura started being pushed backwards. Their abilities as magicians were almost equal. The problem was the fact that Niberus had raised all her abilities to the extreme. Moreover, Niberus used the strong advantage that came with possessing the Book of Darkness. She was able to simultaneously use all the magic spells engraved into her weapon. Of course, Niberus was doing this, because she was worried the Vitten's chalice would send back her attacks using the dimensional distortion. Kieran grinded his teeth. The Sky Splitter is really troublesome. He had joined forces with Niberus to overwhelm Laura with a single attack but Azel didn't allow them do that. Clones were appearing from all directions, 
and the sword made out light raced through the sky. He is this strong even after suffering a life-threatening injury. No wonder the king and my ancestor suffered defeat by his hands. If he was healthy, we wouldn't have stood a chance. Kieran shuddered. He could tell at a glance that Azel suffering from an injury. He was seriously injured yet he was able to use a combination of incarnation and the sword splitter. He was showing unbelievable amount of battle prowess, yet it seemed he was having a hard time coping with the backlash from using his magical energy. Kieran was at peak condition compared to him. In a battlefield overflowing with blood, he could use his dragon weapon to its fullest potential. He would be able to take down the injured and out of breath Azel. I have to take him down right here and now. Above all else, Azel had almost killed Nibirus on numerous occasions. When he thought about that fact, he knew he had to bring this to an end. Suddenly, Azel spoke. Chapter 154. Dogfight. Part 5. The sun is rising. What? In the midst of the loud sound of the battle, his opponent had spoken with magical energy behind his words. Azel had made sure that Kieran had heard his words. Kieran couldn't decipher the meaning behind Azel's words. However, it took only a moment for Kieran's confusion to dissipate. A powerful light stabbed at his eyes. The sun had risen. The first sunlight started to part the dim darkness. Azel knew the precise moment when the sun came up. Azel had already positioned himself, so the sun would be at his back. On the other hand, Kieran was facing towards the light. For a brief moment, he hesitated in his attack. That brief moment was all Azel needed in a flash. Azel's clone rushed forward. The blue dragon Macon raged as it attacked. Kieran was thrown off his guard, so he was frantic as he was pushed backwards. However, there was a limit on what he could do when he was so close to his opponent. He would have to calmly solve each problem as it arose. As he came to that conclusion, Kieran was about to let out consecutive magic spells when Azel's clone disappeared. What's going on? The clone had disappeared with impeccable timing, so Kieran had expended his magical energy for nothing. His dragon demon magic flowed freely, and it created a static noise for a brief moment. Afterwards, another clone appeared from behind Kieran to swing a burning light sword. It was as if the thunder was roaring. Horn of the Thunder Dragon. The blue thunderstrike sliced through Kieran as the after effects of attack reached even the next mountain. However, a fierce energy erupted from within the dissipating thunderstrike. Kieran had been able to block the horn of the Thunder Dragon head on. As expected, it seems you have the requisite skills needed to become the successor of Baldazark's dragon weapon. Azel wasn't surprised. Kieran had brought out his bleeding star, and he was able to bring out the full extent of its power by enslaving the blood on the battlefield. The amount of magical energy he possessed was overwhelmingly immense right now, so Kieran didn't have to dodge the attack. He was able to block it head on. Of course, Azel had expected all of this. It happened at that moment. They are retreating. There was confusion amongst the ranks of the dragon demon king worshippers when they saw something they couldn't comprehend. The guardian shadows had been pushing them hard, but now they were exiting like water ebbing on low tide. They used their special brand of stealth ability to escape. They disappeared as if they melted into the ground. They couldn't comprehend the actions of the guardian shadows. Kieran became guarded as he glared at Azel. It is right on time. After a moment, Azel's clone raised his hand to point at the sky. Since the clone had the sun to its back, the gesture was highly suspicious. However, Kieran couldn't help but look up at the sky. Then, Nibirus, look up. Kieran finally realized what had happened, so he yelled out. The sun had risen slowly towards the east, and it was burning in the middle of the sky. There was also a region in the sky that was opaque as if there was a strange distortion. It was as if an enormous tear was floating in the sky. It was proof that the dimensional distortion was being used at a large scale. As the heir to his tribe, Kieran knew what caused this phenomena. Goblet containing the Heaven's Tears. Heaven's Tear Goblet. During the Dragon Demon War, this was one of the main reasons why the humans had been terrified of Ornsaurus. The fear of him had been bone deep. Laura spoke as if she was whispering those words. 
you were too late. The dimensional distortion floating in the sky went through a change, and the sunlight from the eastern sky was gathered. The sunlight fell to the ground as if it was an unavoidable iron mace. Heaven's Tear Goblet. It was both Ornsaurus's technique and nickname. The calamity was undeniable proof that the Vitten's chalice was preposterously dangerous. Azel remembered how terrifying it had been. Ansaurus rarely used the Heaven's Tear Goblet. In the early days of the war, the Human Alliance found out the terrifying nature of this technique, so they tried everything to prevent Orsaurus from completing the technique. In the early days of the war, Orsaurus fought against overwhelming number of enemy forces. He used this single technique to almost wipe out a large Human Alliance army that was 10,000 strong. After Azel took part in the war, Ornsaurus had also burned a city as a tactical move. It was done to delay the progress of the Human Alliance forces. Azel had urged Laura to learn this technique. I cannot use the technique properly, because I'm not a magician. However, it would be possible for you. When he used the sun lightsaber against Ragus, Azel had used a technique to gather sunlight in one spot. However, the scale of his technique was unbelievably small compared to Orsaurus's technique. On a clear day, Orsaurus could gather all the sunlight for his use. As a magician and a dragon demon, Laura could bring out the full potential of the Vitten's chalice. She used the dimensional distortion over a large area to gather sunlight in her pocket dimension. It wasn't just gathering sunlight. The power of the magic spells engraved inside the Vitten's chalice would get a massive boost she would be able to create a strong stream of light and heat. When the maximum amount of heat and light was gathered in the dimensional pocket, she would open a hole where the power could be emitted outwards. She could create a one big explosion, or she could freely dissect a battlefield with a heat ray. Laura chose to use the latter strategy. The unavoidable light mace cut through the mountain, and a massive amount of heat exploded along its path. Every being in the path of the light had died. The layers of defensive magic was burned away like paper, and even their bodies were turned into ashes. It won't last over two seconds. Laura mumbled to herself. The party hadn't been able to see the moment when the calamity descended on the ground. The Heaven's Tear Goblet was released at a predetermined moment, and when it was unleashed, she had immediately moved their party into a separate space. The only worry was whether the plan was properly disseminated amongst the Guardian Shadows. Surprisingly, the Guardian Shadows reacted precisely as planned. It was as if they followed the party's will. As a result, they were able to create the perfect result they had wanted to create. Unfortunately, there was a problem. The Heaven's Tear Goblet was incomplete. When the battle started, the sun hadn't come up yet. This was why Laura had to focus the dimensional distortion in the Far East. Moreover, she hadn't been able to gather sunlight for long. All the sunlight was used up in two seconds. Azel spoke. That should be plenty enough. They'll be in a state of confusion, so we just have to escape. Suddenly, the pocket dimension shook. Laura's expression turned pale. What is it? Something she couldn't understand was happening. Someone was assaulting the pocket dimension she had created. In the past, she had experienced the Vitten's maze being invaded twice. It was when she had saved Niberus from Azel. The most recent attempt was Kieran coming in to save Niberus in this battle. Now that I think about it, Niberus was involved in both attempts. Of course, this was completely opposite of what she experienced twice before. The situation right now was entirely different from what happened twice before. Azel had tracked her down from the other side of the dimensional divide, and Kieran had exploited a weak point before the Vitten's maze could be completed. This being was trying to break the magical energy forming the dimensional pocket. The unbelievable part was that the attempt was effective. Laura only knew one person that knew how to do this. Azel. Someone is attempting the same thing you showed before. Azel had cut the wave of magical energy swirling in midair. It was an absurd skill. From Laura's perspective, she had no idea how it was possible. When she had asked Azel about it, he gave her this answer. It is a skill that is pretty useless in real battle. You can't use this skill in the heat of battle. This is why it is used in ambushes or when one wants to break through a barrier from the outside. 
Azel had re-emphasized this fact. When one stretches out one's senses to the extreme, the surrounding magical energy looks like strands. I'm not a magician, but I know the shape and structure the magical energy needs to take to form a spell. After I focus and assess the spell, I cut the strands. This is probably what non-magicians feel when they listen to an explanation from a magician. That means you don't know what the hell I'm talking about. I like the expression you just used. Who else can do this besides you? Azel had explained the shortcomings of the skill, yet it was an incredible dangerous technique against a magician. This was why she couldn't help, but ask the question. The Duke can't do it yet. Will he be able to do so in the future? I'm not sure. In the past, there were exactly two people who could use this technique. Who were they? It was the old man Kwa and the dragon demon king Atain. Some unknown being was using that exact technique to dispel her pocket dimension. Did the king revive already? From Laura's perspective, this was the only possibility that seemed plausible. When she was still with the plane of darkness, they kept saying the king's revival was near. Then there was the dragon demon general Ragus. He had become a preposterously strong undead, and Ragus was still tracking down their party. In such a situation, Azel had said someone on par with Ragus was approaching them. In such a situation, Chiron spoke to a pale-faced Laura. Laura, I want you to withdraw the Vitten's maze. But, if we drag this out, it'll be to our detriment. We will become surrounded. Since we have no idea what is going on outside, we can't, continue putting our trust in a wall that will eventually fall. Chiron was cold as he made the decision. Laura turned to look at Azel, and she dispelled the Vitten's maze when he gave a nod. A suffocating wind immediately assaulted their skin. They saw a sight they would have never imagined seeing inside the dimensional pocket. If things had occurred as planned, heat should have emanated from where the heaven's tear goblet had impacted. The surroundings should have been burning. However, the sight in front of them had nothing to do with heat. A storm. Laura was amazed as she mumbled to herself. Thunder was crackling in the sky and a gale powerful enough to throw people around was swirling around them. Soon, there were harsh raindrops mixed in with the gale. They were basically in the middle of a storm. However, the intensity of the storm was quickly dissipating. The suffocating winds dropped off, and rain started falling harder instead. No, the raindrops that had been carried by the wind was now falling normally. After the gale, a regional shower fell from the sky. Everyone was amazed by the sudden change. Azel mumbled his words to himself. He's coming. His expression hardened, and it was a scary sight. From across the falling rain, someone was approaching them. This being was coming here at a leisurely pace as if he was on a stroll. His dragon demon magic was so weak that the members of the party hadn't felt threatened. It was directed only at Azel. It was an enormous pressure. It was as if a mountain was pressing down on him. This was why they couldn't understand why Azel was so tense. What was he sensing at that moment? The puzzled Chiron was about to ask Azel a question when a large sound rang out. At the same time, a fierce wave of dragon demon magic spread into the surrounding. Everyone was taken aback. The suffocating wave of dragon demon magic reached them as it resonated. A thunder exploded forth. From a specific point on the ground, a thunder rose into the sky in reverse. For a brief moment, the world was dyed white, and the thunder ripped apart the clouds letting out the torrential rain. How can this be? Chiron was shocked. As the rain clouds in the sky dispersed from explosion, the rain stopped. The morning sky was clear, and a dragon demon male was walking towards them from the east with the sun coming down on him. It has been a while. The silence that had suffocating the entire battlefield was broken as a solemn voice rang out. Everyone turned to look at the owner of the voice. It was as if they were mesmerized. When Azel saw his face, his expression turned strange. Who are you? Chapter 155. Prophesied Being. Part 1. When he saw the earth-shattering feet in front of his eyes, he thought of a single person. It was the man that was called, the sword that parts the storm, Almeric. He was one of the four dragon demon general, and his dragon weapon, Storm's Scream, had a special characteristic that was quite troublesome for Azel.
Almeric was able to control the weather and storms. This meant he could freely control thunder. This special characteristic was very advantageous to use against large opponents like dragons, and large armies. Its effectiveness decreased when it was used in one-on-one -on -one battle. However, Azul's forte was to create and control thunder to cause confusion amongst his enemies. It was frustrating, since he wouldn't be able to use one of his strengths. Almeric was called, the sword that parts the storm, because he could control the weather to create a localized storm. However, his power didn't end there. He was also able to disperse the storm. It wasn't an exaggeration to say that the feat he had just pulled off was proof that he was Almeric. However, the one to appear in front of Azel was an unfamiliar old dragon magen. He had white hair, and blackish-blue horns. He was an old warrior wearing a heavy armor. The answer came from Laura. Elder. He's that elder. Azel was surprised. Laura had talked several times about some unknown elder she had consulted before. She knew that he had lived for a long time. He predated the Dragon Demon War, and she was told he was a being that caused fear and confusion amongst human just by showing his presence. However, no one in Zlora's vicinity knew the true name and identity of the Elder. In the past, this was how Laura had described the Elder. He looked like a frail existence, but Laura had speculated that a magical rite had caused him to look like that. In truth, he probably was hiding an incredible power. The old dragon Majin spoke. I'll have to put up with the hassle of putting on a mask I've taken off once before, but Orsaurus's heir had been a companion with whom I could chat with, so I feel the need to give her a formal introduction. As he spoke those words, he brought his hand towards his face. Then, he slowly started ripping away the skin on his face. It was an unbelievable sight. No matter how one saw it, the mask had looked like his real face, yet he was ripping it away with his bare hand. At the same time, his appearance started to change. Euron was surprised. Illusion. I couldn't detect it at all. Laura was also surprised. Two high-ranked magicians had been unable to detect the disguise of the old dragon magen. As the skin on his face was ripped away, his appearance started to distort in small increments. The height and width of his body grew. He now stood tall, and his body had turned imposing. The texture of his horns turned into that of volcanic stones, and his right eye was dyed red. Azel spoke his name. You are still alive, Almeric. His opponent didn't deny the fact. You too, Azel. We should be surprised at each other's survival, but now that we are facing each other, isn't it too obvious? Almeric, who had become a legend as one of the four dragon demon generals in the dragon demon war, grinned. According to historical records, all four dragon demon generals had met their end on the battlefield. The first one to die was Ragus, and it was thanks to his personality. He had charged into a trap set by the allied forces despite the fact that he had lost a massive amount of blood. The second to be killed was Baldazark. He was killed in a duel with Azel. The third to be killed was Ormsaurus. He had lost to Carlos, and while retreating, he had been killed. The last to die was Almeric. In the final battle, it was known that Duke Qua Nidal had killed him. Laura vacantly mumbled to herself. Elder was Almeric Nim. I wasn't in a position where I could reveal my identity so easily. However, nothing I told you before is a lie. I know. While Almeric posed as an old dragon magen, he had told Laura a lot of stories. She had been surrounded by Ornsaurus tribe, who was filled with madness. The stories he had told her, and the different perspective of the world he offered her had been a big comfort to her. Still, she had hardened her heart, since she knew she would have to oppose him in the future. However, she would have never imagined that he was the dragon demon General Almeric. Azel spoke, since you've gotten a little bit older, have you decided to be more respectable? Your style have changed a lot. Almeric's outer appearance differed greatly from what he remembered. At the time, he had been a ferocious-looking middle-aged dragon demon, who had just popped out from the wild. He had dirty long white hair, and his red eyes had been filled with chaotic murderous intent. He possessed thick horns that had the quality of volcanic stones, and he never wore armor. 
he had been quite the sight wearing only dragon leather. After 220 years had passed, he had tamed his unruly white hair by brushing it backwards. The light within his eye was much more grounded with reason. His outfit was quite fashionable as he wore an all-black armor. The air of being a dangerous beast still remained, but it felt much more restrained than the version Azel remembered. Even how he spoke had softened, so Azel wondered if this person was really Almeric. By looking at the resonance of his dragon demon magic, he can't be someone else. No, 220 years had passed, so maybe the fact that Regus's personality had remained the same is abnormal. Suddenly, Almeric's hand touched his left eye. There was only an ugly scar left there in place of an eye. Azel knew the origin of that scar. The scar came from the wound he had given Almeric. I had to act like an old man in the back room living a free and easy life in retirement. It made me turn out this way. Since I only had one eye left, I took up reading as an hobby. You and reading, it is an unlikely combination. I think so too. However, I had nothing to do, and I couldn't go anywhere. This was why I found a hobby that brought pleasure to my mind. Old man Kwa said he made sure he ended your life. He was telling the truth. However, a magical rite prepared by the king revived me. The old man had been satisfied with just piercing my heart. He should have destroyed my entire body. Unfortunately, the old man is long dead, so I can't complain to him about it. They said such words in hindsight, but Azel knew Duke Kwa Nidal hadn't been in a situation where he could do so. By the time he killed Almeric, the Duke had also suffered serious injuries. The remaining enemy forces had been ready to die as they charged forward to recover Almeric's corpse. The Duke had been barely able to escape with his life. Suddenly, Almeric let out a bitter laugh. However, I never expected to take off my mask in this fashion. I thought it would happen at a much later date. However, once you took the child, what do you mean by that? Vitin's chalice. Him, you probably heard it from this child, but our four dragon weapons are returned to the plane of darkness when they become ownerless. They return through the great darkness. Moreover, I'm able to locate all of them. So that is why you guys were able to track us. Azel swallowed a groan. He had wonder how they were able to track them down, and now he knew. However, something was wrong. According to Laura, the great darkness was under the domain of Queen Ainsera. What if the ability to track the dragon weapons of the dragon demon generals wasn't an ability possessed by Queen Ainsera? What if it was Almeric's ability, and it was kept secret from the dragon demon king worshippers? They didn't reveal such important truths to the younger generation, who are working as their main force. I wonder what problem exists between them. The problem between them was much too large to call it friction between two factions. Azel knew there was important circumstances involved in this matter. Almeric asked him a question. Things have devolved to this point. So why isn't Carlos showing himself? You guys are saying that again. What evidence do you have that Carlos is alive? I'm not sure if you are acting ignorant, or you actually don't know the answer. Azel, you were always great at hiding your true intentions. However, the fact that he hasn't shown himself yet makes me think you are telling the truth. The only thing I'm sure is that you guys think Carlos is still alive. There is no reason why I can't tell you the basis for that opinion. What? Almeric spoke to the puzzled Azel. The king had a divine revelation. Ha! You are going to spout some religious mumbo-jumbo. The Almeric I knew wasn't that kind of a person. However, I'm telling you the truth. When the king's revival became near, his will came to reside within the great darkness. Originally, the king created a groundwork for the four of us to be revived before his revival. Atain hadn't been planning on just reviving himself. He planned on reviving all four dragon demon generals. This was why he made a mechanism that would preserve the dragon weapons. If their body was preserved at the time of the death, the revival was able to occur at a relatively fast time frame. It took Almeric 50 years before he was revived. As soon as he woke up, he received a Tyne's order. He kept his identity hidden. We did this, because an enemy of ours could peek into the great darkness. Almeric knew about Omega. He didn't know how such an existence could exist, 
and he didn't know the exact identity of this being. However, he had known that someone was peeking into the great darkness to steal information from them. This was why Almeric had been careful to keep everything hidden. Originally, Ornsaurus should have been revived around the same time period as me. However, it didn't happen. This incident had caused great shock to Almeric. Atain had put great efforts in preparing this plan over a long period of time, yet someone had intervened in the execution of this plan. It was unbelievable. Atain was the first magician, and his knowledge about magic was transcendent. In terms of battle capability, Baldazark and Orsaurus were said to be comparable to him, but they couldn't even reach his toe in terms of knowledge of being a true magician. So who was able to interfere with Atain's arrangements? Azel asked a question. Are you trying to say Carlos did that? That's right. We had stolen power and knowledge over a long period of time from the humans. This was why we were careful to monitor all the possibilities. After the Dragon Demon War, the Plane of Darkness kept close eyes on all the high rank magicians, spirit order practitioners, and dragon arts practitioners. Then they took every opportunity to eliminate him to methodically weaken humanity's power. Most of this happened before I was revived. I was able to read the record engraved in the great darkness like a book, and no one truly terrifying had appeared. They were all quite mediocre. The only surprising part was about Bayon, who ended the great darkness. At his words, Euron flinched. However, everyone was focused on Almeric, so no one noticed his reaction. On the human side, there had been only one person that was able to mess up what the king arranged. It's Carlos Rizesta. That's. It does sound like something he could pull off, so I'm not saying it couldn't be true. It seems you don't plan on telling me anything until the end. If I kill you here, will he finally show his face? Why don't you test out that theory? A thick killing intent started to emanate from Azel and Almeric. Almeric spoke. When I see your weakened state, it reminds me of that time. Which incident are you talking about? The time when I lost an eye to you. Almeric brushed the scar that had replaced his left eye as he spoke. Azel knew what he was talking about. At the time, Almeric had lost an eye in a fight with Azel, and he had suffered heavy wounds. Almeric had to retreat, but he was chased down by Duke Qua Nidal. He had to fight the Duke when his wounds hadn't fully healed. He had met his death in that fight. Now 220 years had passed, and Azel would have to face Almeric with a wounded body that was incapable of fighting properly. Almeric couldn't help, but think about the past. This will leave a bad aftertaste. Still, I have to end you here. I'm not as big of an idiot as Ragus. You know I am listening to you, yet you are able to say such words. From a faraway location, the ominous voice of an undead rang out. Chapter 156. Prophesied Being. Part 2. On the ridge of a mountain located on the other side, a being shot into the air like an arrow. He was a three meters tall giant with black armor surrounding his body. It was the undead named Ragus. In a flash, he had flown several hundred meters, and he had landed on the ground without decelerating. The ground exploded as it shook. A being made out of flesh and blood would have been pulverized, but Ragus pushed past the dust. He was unharmed. Azul's party swallowed their breath when they saw him. This is the worst. Chiron was letting out cold sweat. The plan was to break through the line of Dragon Demon King worshippers before Ragus arrived. However, everything had gone to hell when Almeric had made his appearance. How long are you going to yap with your mouth? You used to speak with your sword first rather than your words. It seems you've really mellowed out, while living in retirement as an old man. Since I've already gone through death and revival once, it wasn't a bad way to live. Anyways, I planned on fighting soon even if you hadn't nagged me. It seems I won't be able to find the truth through this conversation. Almeric raised his sword. It was his dragon weapon Storm Scream. He was able to create and cut through storms by using the power of his dragon weapon. The sword was unusual INL size. It was one and a half times larger than a normal longsword. Almeric wasn't as big as Ragus, but he was still over two meters tall. It was as if his muscles were chiseled from rock, so his sword was a perfect fit for him. 
The sword was the same as the storm of blades used by Jeffers Almerich. The blade was transparent like glass. A blue spark soundlessly danced within the blade as it lit up its surrounding. Regus mocked Almerich. Don't tell me you will be cut down by one strike, because you are rusty. I'll shut you up. You can try. Regus shrugged his shoulder as he backed off. Chiron stood in the way of Regus, and Euron compressed his magical energy. Laura was taking care of Kieran and Niberus. Leticia was holding off Jeffers. Therefore, they couldn't retreat quickly. Fortunately, they had killed a large number of magicians supporting Jeffers, so Chiron and Euron was free to fight Regus. However, Regus tilted his head in puzzlement. Do you really plan on fighting with me? We won't let Azel shoulder any more burden. Chiron was firm with his words. Regus's skeleton clacked as he laughed. You just told me a great joke. Do you really think I'll interfere in my friend's battle? You don't plan on doing that. No. You sound as if you plan on just spectating the fight between them. So what if I am? Are you being truthful? I'm not some country hick that would interfere with a one-on-one -on -one battle between men. The fact that we are speaking such words does make us sound like outdated country hicks. Ah, you guys can attack me all at once. I'll complain a little bit, but I won't condemn you for doing so. You guys can do whatever you want. What? I love a one-on-one -on -one fight with a strong person, but I also like breaking through a large number of enemies. Don't you think I'm heroic and manly? That is why I gladly welcome attacks from numerous people. Chiron was at a loss for words. He heard this bastard died, because he charged into a trap. He was set upon by numerous people. How could his way of thinking remain the same like this? At the same time, his anger rose. There is a limit on how much you can look down on us. Even if Regus was a legendary figure from the Dragon Demon War, Chiron was also a living legend inside the Rulin Kingdom. Until now, no one had dared to ignore him, yet he was being treated like a small fry by Regus. Regus spoke. You guys will really attack me. Will you do so knowing what your actions would precipitate? At his words, Chiron came to his senses. Regus's taunt wasn't meant to portend their death. There was a different meaning behind his words. The moment we charge the bastard, this ceasefire will end. Everyone on the battlefield was focused on Azel and Almeric, and a weird ceasefire had developed. The members of the party and the guardian shadows had stopped fighting, and they were just keeping the dragon demon king worshippers in check. However, when Chiron engaged Regus, the paused battle would start once again. Would that be a boon or a detriment to his party members? Chiron was working through this problem when Almeric spoke. This is only a fleeting form of entertainment for us. You guys should show some patience. Since Regus and I are already here, it wouldn't be too bad for you guys if we prolong this. It was as he said. The ones they had been most afraid of showing up were already here, so it didn't matter if more of them showed up. In fact, it might be the opposite. Guardian shadows were still trickling in one or two at a time, so the delay could be used to their advantage. Almeric took one step forward. Well, Azel, shall we exchange a light greeting? Afterwards, two puppets appeared from between Azel and Almeric. An explosive sound rang out. They were clones. Both Azel and Almeric made clones that possessed substance as they clashed. Then, how many are there? Chiron swallowed his breath. It wasn't just him. Everyone were at a loss of words by the sight unfolding in front of them. As the light dispersed, Azel and Almeric charged towards each other. It wasn't just a single location. The clashes between the clones were occurring all over the place, and simultaneous sounds of explosions rang out. In the dragon arts, it was called incarnation. However, Azel's ultimate form of this technique was called the Dance of the Shadows. Magical energy was used to change the attribute of the clones in a free-flowing manner. This was why the clones could fight as if they were real. The clones repeatedly switched between their energy form to cross space, and they solidified to battle each other. It really was an unbelievable sight. How could this be called a one-on-one -on -one fight? Even during the Dragon Demon War, Azel and Almeric had been the only ones able to control their clones to this degree. Even the Dragon Demon King Atain couldn't follow them in terms of manipulating clones. Suddenly, 
Almeric spoke. As expected, I'm inferior in terms of using this tactic. You look as if you are about to fall over, yet you are able to do all this. Azel was superior in using the clones. Almeric's clone kept increasing one or two at a time, but it capped out at 16. Azel's clones continued to grow as they attacked Almeric's clones together. Azel was letting out cold sweat. His real body hadn't moved an inch. His dragon Macon and the clones were the ones fighting the battle, but he felt exquisite pain wash over him. His heart was racing, and he vibrated his vessels and arteries to increase his magical energy. It reached a point where his body became too messed. It was unbearable. No, he still hasn't started in earnest, yet I, from outside looking in, it looked like an earth-shattering battle. However, it was merely a light greeting being exchanged from the perspective of Azel and Almeric. It was merely a reconnoitering skirmish. He was able to fight evenly using his clone technique, but he wouldn't be able to do anything if Almeric himself joined the fight. Moreover, it didn't take them too long to reach that point. You've gotten better from the version I remember. However, you've always been a human that evolved at an abnormally fast pace. In terms of battling with clones, Almeric was at a disadvantage. Azel had more clones, and he was using battle tactics to destroy Almeric's clones one by one. In the end, Almeric moved. In a flash, he used instantaneous movement to swing his sword towards Azel. When Almeric received the attack from Azel's clone, the sound of a thunderclap erupted from within the clear blade. The thunder that had been dancing silently started to burn. It was blinding. The thunder erupted as it tried to rip Azel's clones into pieces. Azel had predicted his attack, so he changed the attribute of his magical energy into thunder. However, you made such a basic mistake. A cold voice rang out, and Azel's clones. To be precise, the magical energy of thunder forming Azel's clones were eaten by Almeric. Azel groaned. The storm's scream had dominion over thunder. In terms of control over thunder, Almeric's sword was superior compared to the sky splitter. It was impossible even for Azel to wrestle control away from him. Shit, his vision blinked out for a moment as Azel fell to one knee. It was the backlash from having the magical energy under his control ripped away from him. He couldn't maintain his balance. Almeric used the moment when his concentration lapsed to ruthlessly push his way towards Azel. This is boring. Is it really going to end like this? The sword surrounded by thunder swung towards Azel's neck. It had happened so suddenly that no one had the chance to intervene. The party members were about to yell in surprise. Light exploded. It wasn't thunder. The swirling light expanded, and Almeric was flung away. He let out a ferocious laugh. I expected at least this much even if you were dying. There wasn't a single trace of the thunder that had surrounded Almeric as he retreated. As the light dispersed, Azel's form was revealed. He spoke as cold sweat ran down his body. I thought you were caught. I knew you wouldn't be taken down in such a disappointing manner. I'm not arrogant enough to think that would happen. Azel had purposefully created an opening as he invited Almeric to jump into a trap. When Almeric tried to swing his final blow, he created another clone to take the blow for him, and at the same time, he prepared a technique that would be catalyzed by his clone being destroyed. Thunder Eater. A portion of the thunder emitted by Almeric was sucked into the clone. It was converted into light before it exploded. It was an unbelievable technique that only Azel could use. He was the only one able to use such a technique with high degree of difficulty through his clones. However, Almeric hadn't put down his defense. The trap dug by Azel couldn't even leave behind a scratch on Almeric. Let's end our greeting here. Shall we start this for real? As he spoke such words, thunder erupted from the horn that looked like volcanic rocks. It joined with the thunder being emitted by the dragon weapon, and it created strong winds. It felt as if it would sweep away everything. The storm and the thunder threatened Azel at the same time, and all of Almeric's clones turned into thunder as they charged forward. Azel, who had a numerical advantage, started to be pushed backwards. This is quite unfortunate. You aren't able to have a proper clone fight with such magical energy. It doesn't matter that there are a lot of them. They are garbage. 
Almeric gave a declaration. His dragon demon magic was on par with what he had during the dragon demon war. It was so overwhelming that no one would measure up to him in this place. Azul's magical energy wasn't very very far off from the magical energy he possessed during the dragon demon war. However, his body wasn't whole, so he could barely use half his skills. Azul's clones were being destroyed one by one. There were a lot of them, but each of Almeric's clone was stronger than his. Sky Splitter, please endure. Even the Sky Splitter wasn't its normal self. Normally, it was something that couldn't be brought out unless the vessel holding the Dragon Majin was whole. However, he had pushed himself over the limit against Ragus, and afterwards, he hadn't recovered his Dragon Demon magic fully. As the owner, Azul's status was a mess right now. In the end, the defense of the clones were broken, and the Sky Splitter in its light form was dominated by the storm and thunder emitted by the storm's scream. Azel coughed out blood as he fell over. Azel. Chiron ran forward. Almeric had been about to apply the final blow when Chiron blocked it. Almeric let out a laugh. Your bravery is admirable. He pushed aside Chiron, and he spoke in a haughty manner. I want my allies to hear me. Don't interfere. They are great candidates that I can use to rehab my skills. You bastard. You were killed and revived once. Yet you are holding up your head so high. You are a brat without a dragon weapon. I have no reason to be afraid of you even if you attack me by the bushel. I'll let you attack me until your heart's content. As if by illusion, someone appeared behind him. Leticia had suppressed her presence to approach him, and she stabbed with her cross spear. The strong doesn't turn away from arrogance. The strong accepts it. However, Almeric already knew she had approached him. A clone wrapped up in thunder flew in to block her spear as Almeric spoke. Your stance is good. I like the fact that you do not hesitate. Another clone appeared next to her as it attacked. When Leticia became startled, a beam of light flew in as it exploded. It seems you owe me a life debt. It was urine. Leticia snorted when faced with the grinning urine. Don't you have a lot of debt you haven't paid off against me? This won't even cover the interest that you've accrued. You were being miserly. When Euron laughed in a playful manner, Almeric's expression turned peculiar. Him. You are the brat that betrayed us by claiming that you are a descendant of Carlos. You really do look like Carlos. I'm well aware that humans resemble their ancestors. Still, it feels weird seeing someone with a similar face as him. Oh, it is an honor to be spoken in such a way by the legendary dragon demon general. In return, I will no longer worry about the consequences. What do you mean by that? This is what I mean. Yuren's brown hair whipped around fiercely as the unbelievably ominous magical energy spread into the surrounding. His slate gray eyes was dyed red, and black smoke gathered at his back. It looked as if evil spirits were congregating behind him. He was calling forth the demon. He wasn't thinking about the consequences of his actions. It caught Almeric's eye. Interesting. The fact that you are able to do this in a battle without prior preparation is quite surprising. Instead of answering with words, Euron answered with his magic. His magical energy increased exponentially, and he unleashed a powerful cursed flame. In a flash, the violent flames engulfed the surrounding, but the flames didn't reach Almeric. The storm he had brought forth was perfectly sealing off the curse and the heat. At the same time, Almeric's clones aimed for Euron. As if he had been waiting for this, he let loose the magic spells he had prepared, but the magic spells itself is quite good. However, you are far away from having the depth of power to use such spells. The magic dumbfoundedly just passed through Almeric's clones. Euren's eyes widened. He knew what this phenomenon meant through Azel. Shit. He knows what I'm going to do. Euron had waited for Almeric's clones to attack and he had shot a beam of light towards them. However, Almeric changed the attribute making up the clones into light, and he let the attack flow off his clones. Then he reformed them. Before he could prepare his next magic spell, the clone's sword struck out toward Euron. Leticia didn't even have the chance to intervene. Euron was sure he was dead. In the next moment, his surrounding changed. Almeric's clone realized a beat too late that he had his back towards Euron. As if by instinct, 
he let out another attack. A sound of an explosion rang out, and Almeric's clone was destroyed. Almeric spoke from beyond the explosion. It seems you have firmed your resolve. Yes, Elder. It was Laura. She had used dimensional distortion to save Euron. We are enemies now. That's right. He nodded his head as Almeric continued to speak. I want you to drag out every ounce of power you have when you come at me. If you are going to die, don't leave any regret behind. After he said his words in an arrogant manner, he relentlessly attacked like a storm. Chapter 157. Prophesied Being. Part 3. As the storm raged and the thunder roared, numerous clones switched between being illusory and real as they attacked the party. The only thing that was definite was the fact that it was a four-on-one battle. In truth, there was only one real body, yet sixteen clones were attacking the party. When Almeric foe Azel, he had only used clones that had substance. Now that he was adding in illusory clones, so they couldn't even count how many there were. After clashing several dozen times with the storm's scream, Chiron's dragon sword was broken. The blade of thunder pierced Leticia's abdomen. The swirling gale slammed Euron into the rock face. Then, this is it. The last one to kneel was Laura. Laura was breathing heavily, and the light from the Vitten's chalice dispersed. Then her body fell to the floor. She had used all the techniques she could use with the Vitten's chalice. If it wasn't for her, this battle would have ended long ago. However, they were of no match to Almeric. The four of them had used all their might for a joint attack, but they couldn't even harm the tip of his hair. It was a shameful defeat. The Dragon Demon King worshippers were at a loss for words. Niberus and Kieran was completely intimidated as they watched the sight. Is this the might of the Dragon Demon Generals? They had witnessed it when Ragus had used his full power to fight Azel. Their power was on a different level. The Dragon Demon King worshippers felt it in their bones as to why these figures had become legends. They also understood why the Ornsaurus tribe had used such evil methods to create an outstanding heir. Niberus, Kieran and Jeffers were descended from noble bloodline, and they possessed potential that matched up with said bloodline. The Dragon Demon magic they were born with were clearly superior to other people. However, they couldn't hold a candle to the Dragon Demon generals, who were their ancestors. The Ornsaurus family probably knew how incredible an existence the Dragon Demon Generals were. This was why they weren't satisfied with naturally born heirs, and this was why they put their hands on the forbidden methods. In some ways, their actions were a natural consequence of knowing the might of the Dragon Demon Generals. It made the Dragon Demon King worshippers have such thoughts. Suddenly, Ragus spoke. If our side hadn't done such needless act, we might have had some pretty scary enemies. I've made the same assessment as you. This guy is special. He is quite skilled. I almost feel bad for him that he doesn't have a proper dragon weapon. Almeric let out a bitter laugh as he looked at the fallen Chiron, who was a bloody mess. The one that put up the best fight amongst the party was Laura, but if one was talking purely about how much energy one possessed, Chiron had the most. Chiron was the only one Almeric thought was a waste. It is a shame that his talent will be for naught. I can see why our side considered him to be a subject of caution. It happened at that moment. No, we won't let you do as you like. The Guardian Shadows had been observing the battle, but they now ran forward. At the same time, the paused battle started to move again. The Dragon Demon King worshippers blocked the path of the Guardian Shadows, and they fought. The Guardian Shadows didn't care about the progress of the battle. They ignored all else as they charged towards Almeric. Suddenly, Almeric spoke. You are pitiful souls of the dead. So what do you think you can accomplish here? The Guardian Shadows were unable to get close to Almeric. He was surrounded by the power of storm and thunder. Any Guardian Shadows that approached him were sent flying. Azel stood up. He could no longer his psychokinesis, since he lacked magical energy. He used his dragon magian as a cane to stand up. Almeric lamented as he spoke. So does this mean you want to die on your feet? Maybe. Azel smirked. I just. Don't like lying down. That's the spirit. You are our old foe. I recognize the feats you were able to accomplish, so I will show some mercy. 
After you and your companions are dead, I promise not to insult you to the envoy of death. Ha ha ha. I'm so thankful. That tears are coming out. The guardian shadows enclosed around Azel. They were prepared for death. No, these spirits had already died. They were beings that endlessly ruminated on their hate. And now they were showing a resolve that was considered to be transcendent. Almeric was in wonders when he approached them. He is more important than your hate towards us. In the past fifty year, Almeric had to hide his identity, but he was able to observe the guardian shadows through the great darkness. They were the personification of hate, and the dragon demon king worshippers were the cause of their creation. The dragon demon king worshippers had overturned the world through malice and ambition, and as a result, the guardian shadows had appeared as an antagonistic force. They always moved based on their hate and murderous intent. They didn't converse or negotiate. They just sought the destruction of the dragon demon king worshippers. They were irrational beings made out of hate. However, at this moment, they had risen above their hate, and they were trying to protect Azel. Almeric couldn't help, but ask for the reason behind their action. Why? Why are you moving past the driving force that supports your existence? Why are you putting the protection of Azel above it? Hope. Did you say hope? It was as if he had heard a bad joke. They were crazed beings that had only wanted the destruction of their foes, yet they were talking about hope. Everyone is gone. Taken. Still, there is one light left. Unexpectedly, you guys are poets. Azel is your hope. As expected, did Carlos make you guys? That still doesn't explain why he won't show up even now. It happened at that moment. Murderous intent stretched out from far away, and it agitated Almeric's senses. Then, something he couldn't see pierced through Almeric's barrier. A sniper. From where? Almeric was surprised. He had barely been able to dodge before the arrow had hit him, but his shoulder armor had been ripped away. It wasn't as if his shoulder armor had been smashed into pieces. It was a wound akin to a wild beast being cut by a piece of paper. Of course, Almeric was using gaze detection technique, so he knew someone was aiming at him in an attempt to snipe him. Even if one was able to hide one's gaze, one would have to omit killing intent right before attacking, so Almeric would have known the exact moment. It was strange as another arrow tried to snipe him. He dodged it again. He spread his thunder to detect the attack. It allowed him to react at lightning speed. Still, it was very close. The arrows were coming in at a speed several times the speed of sound, and he couldn't sense the arrows until it touched his field made from thunder. Is this perhaps? Almeric knew of this attack. His gaze naturally headed towards Azel. In the past, there had been a bow that was able to shoot invisible magical arrows. These arrows couldn't be traced. It had no presensence, and its true form couldn't be discerned. It was a nightmare of a sniper's weapon that couldn't be recreated with any other magic. That bow was made by. Azel mumbled in surprise. Underworld ruler's marksman. Its presence hadn't been seen in this current era. The dragon weapon got its nickname from the arrows that seemed to fly in from the netherworld. It was forgotten in history, but many officers of the dragon demon king's army was taken down by this weapon. It was the dragon weapon of the blood and iron knight. Eliolum was a female knight, and she had almost killed dragon demon general Baldazar. When her allies were being overwhelmed, she had jumped in to save them by taking on Baldazar. Both Eliolum and Baldazar suffered serious injuries in that battle. They were both at the brink of death. In the end, she never recovered from her injuries, and she had died. Her dragon weapon was inherited by one person. It was inherited by the hero, who would one day kill the dragon demon king Atain. It was given to Azel Kazark. Him, the magic arrows that was several times faster than the speed of sound kept flying in. They kept penetrating Almeric's defense. Almeric had no choice, but to retreat. The guardian shadows took this opportunity to attack Almeric from all sides. Almeric spoke. Ragus, I think I know what you want to say to me, but... Ragus was showing signs of distress. Almeric was puzzled, but he became surprised when Ragus's magical energy started to shrink rapidly. Is it that the bastard from before? I believe so. From afar, Balseru was watching Ragus with his eyes, 
which held a mysterious power. Almeric clicked his tongue. That means the backbone of the Guardian Shadows are coming here. However, he don't have any information regarding them possessing the underworld ruler's marksmen. The Guardian Shadows were like raging waves as they rushed towards Almeric and Ragus. They were above the restraints of the material world. They didn't bump into each other, and they didn't run past each other's. This meant an overwhelming number of enemies were rushing towards them in concert. It was such an overwhelming number of attackers that it was hard to see one surrounding. The Guardian Shadows didn't care if they were ripped apart by storm and thunder as they charged forward. On top of that, Almeric and Ragus were pinned down by the continuous sniping by the underworld ruler's marksmen. The several thousand Guardian Shadows gathered in one place, and they ignored everything on the battlefield to execute a suicide attack. Even the almighty Almeric and Ragus were being pushed back. Moreover, explosions rang out on various parts of the battlefield. It was a wave of magic energy that had a strong scent of dragon demon magic. A golden-colored light that was the size of a child's fist was flying around. It was a construct made out of magical energy. Every time it hit a magic spell it created a strong magical backlash. It caused the magicians to fall over. Azel mumbled to himself as he was struck dumb. Box of hate. There was a man that had lost the people he loved through dragon demon king Atine's magic. He lost his home, and he had even lost his homeland. His name was Jeez, and he had fought the dragon demon king's army using the flames of vengeance that burned within him. He had willingly participated in the dragon slayer's ritual to move past the limitation of being a human, and he realized a truth about himself. He hated magic itself. The dragon demon king Atane was the first dragon demon, and he was the progenitor of magic. He hated Atane, and the magic that created such supernatural destruction. This hate and anger was tempered to create a dragon weapon. It was called the Box of Hate. This dragon weapon was able to obstruct the magic spells of enemies in a limited region, yet one's allies could use magic freely in this space. It created a cheat-like situation. This made the allied forces very cautious in how they deployed G's. However, there came a time when he was deployed as a winning gambit against Almeric and Ragus. Jeez had fought without a care for his body. After a fierce attack, his hate-stained life came to an end. My body may perish, but my hate will never die. Jeez left behind his will, and he passed on his dragon weapon to Azel. Moreover, the box of hate had a crucial role in him defeating Baldazark and Atain. Azel was able to fulfill Jeez's dream of revenge. I think that is its name. Suddenly, a sharp female voice was heard from Azel's side. She was able to approach him without revealing her presence. She was a woman in her late thirties with long blonde hair and cold features. She spoke as she gazed at Azel. I've never been able to call it by its name. Azel Nim will be able to call it by its name from now on whenever you need it. You are. I am the keeper of prophecy Iota. Please save your breath. Everyone will be here soon. When she said everyone, who was she referring to? Soon, he was able to learn the answer to the question. Chapter 158. Prophesied Being. Part 4. Several humans appeared one after another as they pierced through the explosions and the thundering noises. Balseru, who usually had his eyes closed, had his eyes opened as he glared at Ragus. Jaras appeared next with a bashful smile on his face. Then others that weren't known to Azel appeared. An average-looking girl with freckles appeared. Her blonde hair was split into two ponytails. It was Omega. She fidgeted as if she was embarrassed. An old dragon magen with a fierce-looking face appeared as he cleared his throat. Then a middle-aged woman walked forth. She had a kind smile on her face. A very thin man wearing raggedy monk's robe appeared next. The color of the robe had been faded away, and he was carrying a book. Next to appear was a youth with sharp eyes that was reminiscent of a wild beast. It has been a while, Azel Nim. Ah, it does feel awkward calling you that. The last one to show up was the youth called Leon. He used to have a perpetual smile that made his face look like a mask. However, his laughter was different from before. He was laughing shyly. Leon's face wasn't like that of a mask. 
His expression made him look like a living person. Him. I understand what you all are feeling right now. But we are going through hell fighting right now. Could you keep it short? The undead Theta was floating in midair as he fired his magic spells indiscriminately. It wasn't just him. The undeads that had fought alongside the Keepers of Prophecy across the continent were fighting all over the battlefield. Leon spoke. We will do so. However, give us a little. At the very least, please allow each of us time to confess to him. Since this will be the last of your willful behavior, I will allow it. Theta elegantly bowed towards them as he flew towards the battlefield. Azel dumbfoundedly looked at the keepers of prophecy surrounding him. He was the prophesied person they had been waiting for. Azel already knew this. However, he had had no idea about the specific meaning behind such a designation. He also had no idea why they had come here. The keepers of the prophecy looked at each other. There was an awkward silence as they hesitated. Jarrah's cleared his throat as he took a step forward. First, he was the one that had left the worst impression on Azel. However, unlike before he spoke in a respectful and dignified manner. I want to apologize for my previous rudeness, Azel Kazakh. You are our great progenitor. What? For a moment, Azel thought he had heard wrong. However, there was endless affection and respect for Azel in Jarrah's eyes. When the land of Liesa fell to the enemy, you fought four days and night by yourself to protect the town. There was a maiden, who risked her life to deliver a cup of water to you. Her name was Katrina Isa. Azel's eyes widened. That did happen. She was the second daughter of the Count of Liesa, who was in charge of the region. She had been a maiden that had been highly intelligent and brave. Jarrah spoke. I'm her descendant. To be precise, a child was conceived on that one night you spent with her, and that child grew up to lead the family. He had offsprings. The bloodline was continued until I was born. This is. Azel was struck dumb. It had been that kind of an era. No one knew if they would be able to greet the next day. This was why everyone had been focused on the present, and they acted out on the passion of the moment. This was why Azel had shared a lot of one-night stands with many women. Officially, Azel didn't have any children. He had adopted many children, but none of them had been of his blood. However, Azel had descendants he hadn't known about. It was the same for my grandmother, and the children she sired. I am proud to be your descendant. Since we were born of your blood, even as we took on the mission born of hate, we were able to preserve the keys to our final hope. Now we can return him to you. Jarrah's took Azel's hand and he put his lips to the back of his hand. In a flash, a light erupted from the two of them as something was absorbed into Azel's body. It was a dragon weapon. Chain of the Earth Dragon. It was one of the twelve dragon weapons he had used during the Dragon Demon War. In front of the surprised Azel, Jarrah's gave a reverent bow as he expressed his respects towards Azel. Jarrah's retreated towards the back before Azel could say anything. Iota switched places with Jarrah's, and she opened her mouth. In the Delcern region, there was a young woman named Alan. She was captured by orc bandits, and she was kept as their plaything. She had wanted to die every day as she was violated. It was when Azel was still a common knight. Azel kept changing his main residence as he helped the towns that didn't have the power to protect themselves. He had killed the bandit groups that had preyed on these towns. In the process, he was able to free slaves that were being exploited. Amongst these slaves, there had been a young woman, who clung to him as she cried. Her only wish was to have your child, and she had her wish. The story of our proud ancestors were passed down our line, and I was born. I consider myself fortunate that I was able to take on this role, since I was born as your descendant. I will now return this to you. The dragon weapon called Box of Hate was returned to Azel. Azel looked at them as if he was mesmerized. They were still in a desperate situation, but now everything didn't seem surreal. Half of Azel's mind was lost as each keepers of the prophecy told their confession. They told him about their ancestors. There was the heroine that took up the sword in revenge when she lost her husband. There was the woman that had been fated to be changed into a monster through a black magic experiment. He had saved her. Then there was the woman. We are all your descendants. 
They were all descendants of the women that had fallen in love with Azel when he had shown him kindness. Their existence hadn't been known to the world, but they were all descendants of the children he had out of wedlock. They were of Azel's bloodline. They were Azel's descendants, and at the same time, they had lost everything to the dragon demon king worshippers. They held a grudge that couldn't be washed away against the dragon demon king worshippers, so they were able to become guardian shadows. Moreover, they had the prerequisite to be able to carry out the most important mission. Azel would wake up one day, so they had to act as the vessels that would safely store his dragon weapons. It seems you have the charm of a bad boy. Balseru laughed as he spoke. He was still suppressing Ragus, so he wasn't able to turn to look at Azel. Our grandmothers carried your children, yet they didn't notify you. Some were satisfied with just having the child, and some didn't want to burden you with the news when you were carrying out such a big task for the world. If others found out their reasons for not doing so, they would have pointed their fingers at the idiocy of their reasonings. When it was framed that way, Azel had sired children all over the place, yet he hadn't taken responsibility for any of them. He was the bad guy. No, it isn't like that. They were in a desperate situation right now, but Azel was swept up in an indescribable feeling. He wanted to give some kind of excuse, but if he did, he would be branded as the worst human trash. You probably have many more descendants out there besides us. However, we are the only ones gathered here. Balseru retreated a step backwards as he placed a hand on Azel's shoulder. The dragon weapon he had kept safe was transferred to Azel. I'm very sorry that we weren't able to preserve all twelve. However, we did our best. I hope you are thankful for our efforts. At last, Leon stepped in front of Azel. Him. Balseru's words are correct, but it isn't as if there isn't something that could be said in your defense. Azel wanted to ask what he meant. However, he was having a hard time saying anything. His mouth just opened and closed. Leon spoke in a playful manner towards Azel. Do you remember the maiden named Lazara you met in the Rarun region? Of course, he remembered her. She was the daughter of a provincial lord. Her sister had been raped when the rear of the dragon demon king's army pillaged her town. Her Uni had taken her own life afterwards. Lazara had wanted revenge for her Uni, so she had used all her remaining money to hire mercenaries. However, as soon as they traveled towards a region that was sparse in population, the mercenaries changed their attitudes towards her. They had been plotting to turn on her. They were going to sell her in the black markets as a slave. Azel possessed supernatural senses, so he had heard them whisper their plot to each other. Azel stealthily chased after them, and he had saved her before the plot could come to fruition. However, when Carlos and Azel saw Lazara shed tears, they decided to help her get her revenge. At the time, Azel couldn't forget what Carlos had said to him. I worked like a dog alongside you, yet good things only happen to you. After they finished their revenge, Lazara discreetly spent some good times with Azel. It was because Carlos had a bit up a messed up personality. Carlos was cold, and he spoke cruel words as if it was nothing. This was why Liza had been afraid of him. However, that didn't matter anymore now. Leone spoke. She was with child, but she didn't have any methods of finding you thanks to the war. It was a wall that all women pregnant with Azel's children faced. When the war ended, her child was still too young, so she couldn't travel far. Liza had wanted to notify Azel of the birth of his child, and she wanted to entrust the child to him. However, Azel lived far away at the county of Kazakh. She had no choice, but to wait for the child to grow up until the child could survive such a long journey. However, you went missing two years after the Dragon Demon War ended. That had been the biggest problem. During the war, the women didn't dare to search for him. When they tried to go see him after the war ended, he had gone missing. From Azul's perspective, he would have taken responsibility if the women had shown up at his doorsteps with his children. However, he couldn't do so thanks to a Tyne's curse. However, you left the county of Carrick under the stewardship of Archmage Carlos until your adopted children came of age. This was why he was able to recognize Liza, and he confirmed that the child was yours. This was how they became a part of your family. Liza was the daughter of a provincial lord. 
but she had lost everything during the Dragon Demon War. That was why she joined the county of Khazar with her son. She lived there until her life concluded. This wasn't known to many outside the county of Khazark, but according to memories of his ancestors he had inherited, there had been many cases like that. However, when Liza's son came of age, he had a falling out with her. This was why he rejected the life of living within the county of Khazark, and he went out into the world. Moreover, such stories hadn't been rare. Carlos had been relatively good about directing the traffic, but Azel was missing. Azel was supposed to be the pillar of this community, yet he was considered to be missing. He was as good as dead to them. Moreover, Azel had adopted too many children. There were a lot of conflicts and confusions amongst the people living there. For everyone that found a home in the county of Kazakh, another went out into the world to seek new possibilities. This was why the Dragon Demon King worshippers were able to slaughter everyone inside the county of Kazakh. Yet Azel's bloodline had been able to survive and appear in this place. Balseru smiled as he added his own words. In truth, it was the same for my ancestors too. For a moment, Azel wanted to smack him. He had made Azel look like human trash. Then he revealed the truth later on. All the keepers of prophecy looked relieved once they unloaded their burdens. Anyways, we are thankful to you. Leon let out a playful laugh. His laugh was unlike the ones Azel had heard before. It was a laughter that went well with his youthful look. We had already lost everything. Our lives had ended. We often complained as to the reason why our memories were taken. Now we know. They had recovered all their lost memories. No, they had also gained the memories of their ancestors, so they had arrived at an understanding now. The creator of the Guardian Shadows had been worried about the Keepers of Prophecy falling into enemy hands. If it was Atine's descendants, they probably knew of a way to analyze the, the Guardian Shadows system if they could get a hold of the memories within the Keepers of the Prophecy. This was why they were left with the knowledge of their mission. They were kept in ignorance. It was done to protect the truth. Leon wondered if that was the correct decision or if the creator had been overly cautious. Still, Leon didn't resent the choice that had been made for them. Several keepers of prophecy had fallen to their enemies, yet no secrets had been revealed. Now the day when their purpose would be realized had arrived. After finishing his story, Leon smiled radiantly. We'll leave the rest to you. I hope you are able to bring about the prophecy. The dragon weapon in Leon's care was transferred to Azel. Ah, when he inherited nine dragon weapons. The sight in front of Azel's eyes blurred. Azel realized this wasn't a natural phenomenon. Leon had used some method to put him to sleep. Moreover, you might consider it as us whining, but we have one little request. Leon spoke towards the faltering Azel. Please don't forget about us. Wait a moment. Azel tried to grab Leon with his hand. However, Leon sidestepped his hand as he turned away from Azel. Each Keepers of Prophecy paid respects to him before they receded into the distance. Wait, Azel wanted to hold on to them, yet he could no longer maintain his consciousness. The ground shook from the explosion, and loud sounds washed over him. However, his consciousness kept falling into the darkness. Please don't forget about us. Leon's last words rang in his ears as Azel slumped to the ground. Chapter 159. Inherited Resolution. Part 1. He was having a dream. He had never been there before, and he was aware of that fact. However, it was a dream where he was able to meet someone that looked very familiar to him. It was a space where the light reflected off the surface of the water. The reflected light danced on the wall. Normally, it was supposed to be an underground space where no light should be able to reach the place. However, the magical light that was emitted in the middle, and it was creating a wondrous sight. You finally reached this point, Azel. He knew this person better than anyone, yet his voice sounded so foreign. He spoke towards Azel. It was a very bleak voice. It was as if the deepest darkness below had been squeezed to create this voice. It felt as if his lifespan shortened by listening to this voice. It sounded similar to the voice of an undead, but it was a voice that incited a more basic fear from the living. Azel looked at the owner of the voice. Water had gathered at a corner of the space. 
There were fragments of light dancing above the water as if they were fireflies dancing in the summer night. The light was so faint that it was as if it was about to be eaten by the darkness. However, the fragments of light continued to be reflected as the beautiful dim light remained. In the middle of it all, there was a silhouette surrounded by darkness. Fragments of light was dancing around him, yet his face couldn't be seen. It wasn't, because of the darkness cast by the worn-out hood. It was probably caused by the ominous energy surrounding his body. His body was wrapped in a ragged robe, and something was planted deep in his chest. The end was rounded, and it was embedded with a clear gem. The wooden staff was pierced through his chest as a quiet darkness emanated from it. There was a rectangular pillar made out of silver erected behind him. Black chains were tying him to the silver pillar, and darkness crawled up the surface of the pillar in the shape of letters. It was a bizarre sight. Azel called out to him. Carlos. He was the magician that has founded the Guardian Shadows. He was Azel's closest friend Carlos. Carlos laughed. An eccentric laugh rang out. It sounded completely different from his previous laughter. You are able to recognize me when I've turned out like this. I'm moved by it. I also know that I'm not seeing you in reality right now. Yes, this is a message I left within them. Is this like the thought construct you left behind when I woke up? I created this to deliver a more important message. Moreover, the conversation you have with this thought construct will be delivered to you in reality. What message? I am at the sacred mountain of Laos. Laos was the highest mountain on the continent. It was located northeast of the continent, and it was part of the Atazan mountain range. This mountain range was like a natural barrier that bisected the mountain range of darkness and the demon lands of Alberton. You should come there to meet me, Azel. I have the final key. I have a mountain of questions I want to ask you. I'm guessing I don't have much time. Yes, I didn't give this thought construct much time. I can see from your state that you didn't endure the ravages of time with a living body. Still, I never expected the dragon demon king worshippers to get this right. You were able to create the guardian shadows with such a body. Did you do it as a preemptive move to block the revival of Atane and the dragon demon generals? In truth, I hadn't thought that far ahead. Carlos cackled as he laughed. I experienced something unexpected in my latter years in life. As L, the world faced two very serious threats after you died. Do you mean the fall of the empire? I'm not talking about such worldly problems. Of course, that was a very big event, but that occurred after I retreated from the forefront of history. The empire broke apart after Carlos was officially declared dead. Calamities that threatened the existence of our races had appeared. The funny thing about it was the fact that they were released, because Atane was killed. What do you mean? It means Atane had fought calamities that would have wiped out the population of the world in the past, and he had sealed them. As I've told you before, Atane and the dragon demon generals were once called heroes that saved the world. Him. Azel furrowed his brows. It was a truth that had been revealed when Carlos dug into the past of Atane. Whether it was the past or present, Azel was having a hard time accepting it as truth. Somehow, I was able to block those two calamities, but I ended up like this. I wasn't capable of stopping any troubles that occurred afterwards. Did this occur during the time when your death was officially recorded? That's right. I did die in some fashion. Carlos shrugged his shoulder. Azel tried to ask another question. Then, ah, we really don't have much time left. I'll tell you the rest when you visit me. I'll be waiting for you. When Carlos' words ended, Azul's surrounding blurred. In the end, the dream came to an end, and Azul's consciousness surfaced into reality. When he opened his eyes, sunlight streamed through the dense foliage of the tree, and the chirping of birds could be heard. For reference, it felt as if he was in a classic situation that was often seen in stories. Azel pulled himself up as he had such thoughts. Then he became surprised. My body. His body had been halfway to being a corpse but now his body felt light right now. It felt as if he could fly away. For a brief moment, he circulated his magical energy through his energy pulse, and he realized that his body had completely recovered. No, it hadn't stopped at his recovery. My dragon demon magic has deepened significantly. 
His body had become much sturdier than the body he possessed before his injuries. Most of his magical energy within his body had been converted into dragon demon magic. Moreover, he felt the presence of ten dragon weapons. Moon Sword. Wings of the Storm Dragon. Box of Hate. Underworld Ruler's Marksman. Chain of the Earth Dragon. Defender of Dawn. Unyielding Fortress. Cry of the Phoenix. Master of Raging Waves. Lastly, the Sky Splitter no longer needed to be summoned through the Dragon Sword. It had recovered completely. The Sky Splitter was whole now. Suddenly, Azel felt a wave of ominous magical energy, so he turned his head. He saw the undead that had always accompanied the Keepers of Prophecy. It was Theta. You have awoken, hero Azel Kazark. You are. Didn't you say you were Theta? That's right. You are the one that brought me. At that point, Azel sensed the presence of his comrades, so he surveyed his surrounding. At an open clearing, the messed up forms of Chiron, Laura, Urin and Leticia could be seen. They were laid out next to each other. This. I've done some first aid, but they aren't in good condition. An undead saved the lives of the living, and you even did some first aid. It does sound like a joke. It is as one would expect. I'm poor at carrying out such work. Moreover, I won't be able to use magic much longer. At those words, he carefully looked over Theta. Azel realized Theta was truly in a bad state. The magical energy maintaining the undead is fading away. It wasn't, because he was exposed to sunlight. Unlike other undead, Theta was special. He was a high-rank magician, so sunlight wasn't a critical weakness. Currently, Theta looked like a being that was reaching the end of his lifespan. Azel knew the underlying reason behind it. Your existence was tied to the keepers of the prophecy. Correct. We are the sleepless guardians. We exist because we were chosen by the keepers of the prophecy. As a result of the keepers of prophecy being gone, Theta couldn't maintain his existence. Azel asked a question. The keepers of the prophecy. What happened to them? They are probably all dead. You probably anticipated this answer. I knew it, but, when they became keepers of prophecy, they no longer aged, and they only died when they were murdered. They had been in a constant state. When Leon revealed this truth, it had sounded ridiculous, but Azel understood it now. When they suffered their first death, they were able to become a part of the Guardian Shadows. It was a great magic that changed the order of the world. Moreover, Carlos had used the fact that they were of Azel's bloodline to safekeep his dragon weapons. The combination of the dragon weapons, and the profound magic connected to Azel's bloodline had kept the Keepers of Prophecy alive. They neither aged or developed. This was why their lives ended when they transferred the dragon weapons to Azel. After finishing their mission, they used their remaining power to fight. They allowed Azel to be moved to safety, and they were exterminated. Carlos, why did you choose such a method? Azel couldn't understand it. He knew that Carlos had made the Guardian Shadows, and he knew the purpose that the Keepers of the Prophecy had served. Still, he didn't understand why his dragon weapons had to be transferred to him by creating such unfortunate beings. Before he was put to sleep, Azel had given all his twelve dragon weapons except his Sky Splitter to Carlos. Of course, he thought Carlos would find new owners for them. However, he had assumed that Carlos had died before being able to transfer the dragon weapons his descendants. Even if he was able to, the dragon demon king worshippers were killing all the humans that possessed dragon weapons. He had assumed the line of succession of his dragon weapons had ended. He never would have expected his dragon weapons to be preserved in such a manner. This bothers me on many level, but... It seems I'll be able to meet Carlos. Theta, who had been observing Azel for a brief amount of time, spoke. Since I knew your destination was the Alberton Forest, I brought everyone here. This is the Alberton Forest. We are at the outer edge of it. How much time has passed? It hasn't been long. Since all the Guardian Shadows gathered here from all over the continent, we were able to use around 200 of them as diversion. Theta explained all the events that occurred leading up to their arrival in this place. The Guardian Shadows could move as if they were sliding across the surface, so there hadn't been any turbulence as the members of the party was moved. The Guardian Shadows had kept them safe. 
After Theta put the party members into a state of suspended animation, he slowly put his own life energy into them. Theta had kept them alive until they reached this place. Azel bowed his head. Thank you. That's unnecessary. Theta shook his head from side to side as he spoke. Azel Kazakh, I'm part of the sleepless guardians, so I'm not your descendant like the keepers of the prophecy. I see. However, we feel the same way as them. We consider you to be the hope. Please bring about the prophecy. I'll bring it about no matter what. Azel didn't hesitate as he gave the answer. Theta was like a candle that was about to be extinguished. Azel didn't know if the soul exploited to make an undead could find peace. However, he didn't hesitate to show Theta his unwavering resolve. Theta let out a satisfied laugh. Hoo hoo. Thank you. I want to witness their destruction by your hands. However, my journey ends here. The dark magical energy maintaining the undead exited, and the skeleton crumbled to the ground. The will infusing the bones was no longer there. Azel gazed at the spot for a brief moment before he approached his comrades. Chiron opened his eyes. He had a headache, and it felt as if his head was about to be shattered into pieces. The first thing he saw was Euron stuffing his face as he pushed his life energy into Chiron. Chiron furrowed his brows. Something is really. I feel fortunate for my current situation, yet it feels unpleasant at the same time. I tried so hard save your life, yet you say such words to me. I didn't even have the time to take a break for a meal. I had to continuously inject the life energy into you. Euron grumbled. Chiron complained. I'm thankful for that part, but. Ooh orc. He was about to raise his body, but he lowered himself when pain washed over him. He let out a groan. Euron shook his head from side to side. Please stay still and lie down. Your body is in a rough shape. Him. It seems you are right. Could you enlighten me a little bit on our current situation? We are at the Alberton Forest. What? Chiron became surprised. Euron spoke as if he was having a hard time believing his own words. We haven't entered deep into the forest. We are located at the edge. According to Azel, the Guardian Shadows transported us here. I have no idea what's going on. It is the same for all of us. Everyone seems to be alive, so that's a blessing. Duke, you were the last one to wake up. Azel woke up Laura and Euron first. Then Azel asked the Guardian Shadows to catch the small animals nearby. The two magicians used their black magic to steal the life energy from the animals, and they healed themselves. After they recovered themselves, Laura took on the task of healing Leticia, and Euron was assigned to Chiron. Leticia and Chiron was slowly brought to consciousness. Chiron asked a question. What about Azel? He went out to catch some beasts. Him. Chiron had a baffled expression on his face. From what he remembered last, Azel's body was in a broken state, yet he went out to catch wild animals. Did I fall into a hibernation for a very long time? Has it been a month? There were cases where dragon magians fell into hibernation when they suffered a critical injury. It was a mechanism for recovery. This was why he brought up this possibility, but Euron shook his head. No, it has been only two days. Then what happened? It seems the Keepers of Prophecy had kept Azul's dragon weapons in safekeeping. When the dragon weapons were transferred over to him, he made a complete recovery. It isn't just the fact that he looks completely normal now. He became much stronger than before. Are you sure I'm not dreaming right now? Somehow I am having trouble keeping up with our current situation. This is reality. Him. Since you've recovered enough to wake up, I can relax now. I'll heal you once again after I finish my meal. Azel said he would give a more detailed explanation of our current situation when everyone woke up. Let's wait for that. Understood. Chiron let out a sigh. Chapter 160. Inherited Resolution. Part 2. After a short amount of time had passed, Azel returned with the beasts he had caught. Then he gave a detailed account of what had happened. He told them about the identity of the Keepers of the Prophecy and their mission. Then the party members heard about how the Keepers of the Prophecy had met their end. The party members were at a loss for words. Let me see if I got this right. Leticia broke the silence, and she pointed a finger towards Azel. Azel, you roamed around between women, 
and your promiscuity was the reason why we were saved. Him. Unfortunately, you aren't saying anything that isn't true, so I can't give you a rebuttal. This really is. Leticia furrowed her brows. I never knew you were that kind of a man. Since you were the legendary hero, I held a slight amount of admiration towards you. It's pathetic that I had felt such emotions for you. Azel looked as if he had chewed on a bug. He really wanted to make excuses, but he swallowed any thoughts of doing so. He would probably be seen as human trash if he did so. Even Laura looked at him with cool eyes as she spoke one word. Pervert. That single word was more powerful than every other criticism. Ooh. From Azel's perspective, the future had been something that he wasn't sure he would be able to see. This was why he decided to be more faithful to the present than the nebulous future. That was the type of era he had lived in. Therefore, when he caught someone's eyes, he had share his love with her. If I said that out loud, this will really turn into a mess. Shit. He was self-aware as to how this looked like, and he had his pride. Therefore, he couldn't step forward to defend himself. In truth, he didn't know if anything would change if he made a defense for himself or not. However, this was important to him. When the atmosphere turned chilly, Chiron stepped forward to mediate. Let's drop the subject for now. Our lives were saved thanks to it. Does this mean like attracts like? I see how it is. You are a great noble, so your feelings towards promiscuity differs from normal people. Isn't it normal for nobles to go after every woman they see? Isn't it normal for them to make many children out of wedlock? Nope. I have no children. I'm sure of it. At Chiron's words, Leticia's gaze turned cold. You were careful enough not to sire any children, but you don't find promiscuity to be a problem. Why the hell are you interpreting my words that way? Stop treating me like I'm in the same category as Azel. Duke, instead of defending me, you are going to bury me alive. Azel grumbled. Chiron had been looking at Azel with playful eyes, but his expression suddenly hardened. However, I never expected the Keepers of Prophecy to have such backgrounds. The Keepers of Prophecy were allies that had been hard to trust. It was frustrating, since one couldn't discern their true intentions. Moreover, there was a strong animosity developed when they took questionable actions to confirm whether Azel was the prophesied being or not. However, when their backstories became known, such emotions melted away like snow. I still do not like the actions they had taken. However, I think can understand the motivation behind it now. Laura and Leticia was also in agreement with that statement. After losing everything to the Dragon Demon King worshippers, they were stripped of their past memories to become the keepers of the prophecy. They had fought over the long years with only their hatred and a sense of duty keeping them going. They had surely been tired and worn down as time passed. After the great darkness, it was as if they were lost in a fog of despair. The only light they could rely on was the prophesied being. This was why nothing had been off limits when they were trying to confirm whether Azel was the prophesied being or not. Moreover, when they did confirm this truth, they willingly entrusted the future to Azel. They had sacrificed themselves for him. In truth, I'm still having a hard time absorbing everything, but, suddenly, Azel spoke. It seems I've incurred a big debt to my future descendants. He had went into slumber in an attempt to beat the curse. While he was asleep, the world had changed too much. He had wanted to create it a better future. He wanted to drive away the despair that was rampant all over the world. He had wanted to embark on the future with his people. He had wanted to do so with a smile full of hope on his face. He had fought for this ardent desire even as he stepped over the corpses of his comrades. However, he had been unable to stamp out the phantoms from his past, and they had upset the world. The Keepers of Prophecy started, because of Azel. They were his descendants, who had been tormented, because Azel had been unable to tie up the loose ends. Despite this fact, his descendants had willingly entrusted the future to him, and it left a lasting resolve that couldn't be erased from Azel's heart. No matter what, I have to. Azel firmed his resolve as he thought about the nine faces that had looked towards him. I will achieve the objective you all entrusted in me. No one knew how many dragons lived within the Alberton forest. 
It was a place overflowing with wild beasts and monsters. There were so many within the vast forest that if monsters or beasts didn't have their own territory, they overflowed out of the forest into the Yellow's kingdom. It was common to see fights along the borders. Even if we go a little bit deeper, we have to be prepared for the danger we will face. It is a bit different from what I remember, but this is still one of the demon lands. It is a place where even the dragon demon king worshippers avoided. The party had to travel to the deepest part of the forest. It was called a forest, so it didn't sound too large. However, it truly was a vast stretch of land. Its size rivaled the Yellow's kingdom. If one sailed along the coastline, one would be able to see the Atazan mountain range. If combined with the forest, these amazingly large stretches of land was a wasteland where humans couldn't traverse. Chiron had heard about the Alberton forest from Azel, so he asked the question. While we have the Vitans chalice amongst our possession, we can't avoid being tracked. Still, we can't give up on the Vitans chalice. Azel spoke. The Vitans chalice was too powerful of a weapon to give up on. It wasn't an exaggeration to say that Laura's battle capabilities increased several folds when she had the Vitans chalice in her possession. Then there was the other problem. If they gave up on the Vitans chalice, it would be returned to the hands of their enemies. There is the option of sealing it. I might hide it, but it is an item that's being preserved by a Tyne's magic. Azel took a peek at Laura, and he tried to see how Euron would react. Both were high rank magicians, who boasted high level of skills. This was why they were careful in giving their answer. Of course, it wasn't as if Azel didn't know what Lauren and Euron was going to say. Laura shook her head from side to side. It's not possible. Euron shrugged his shoulders. I couldn't even discern what method was used to preserve this dragon weapon. At his words, Chiron furrowed his brows. In the end, we have no choice, but to take on the good with the bad. Fortunately, the road of darkness wasn't built anywhere near here. Even Atane respected this place as the domain of Alberton. Still, there is no guarantee Alberton would look kindly at our presence. What if the Demon King worshippers don't care about the risks of following us here? It's been 220 years, so I don't know how much the situation had changed here. By the look of things, Alberton is still alive, and it seems he still rules over this place. Azel made these presumptions before he continued his thoughts. First, we have to go deeper into the forest, despite the risks. We have to go into a place crawling with dragons, wild beasts and monsters. Why? This demon land is called Alberton. But, it isn't as if Alberton pays attention to everything that goes on in this large land. He'll only use his power as the absolute ruler of this land when humans try to claim this place as their territory. Aside from such intrusions, he is pretty lax. Is this akin to a lord possessing several villages within his territory? The guards and committee members take care of the minor problems, and the lord is disturbed only for the important decisions and events. You have to widen the scope of your analogy. Basically, Alberton is the king, and he rules over his kingdom. Under his rule, there are lords of various factions, and they squabble amongst each other. Him, are you saying it isn't a lawless region? They are living between numerous dragons, so these factions try to avoid the dragons. This precipitates the fight between them. What factions are you talking about? That I do not know. It has been 220 years, so I'm sure things haven't remained the same. However, I'm sure that dragon demons or dragon magians lead these factions. Are there a lot of dragon demons and dragon magians here? There should be over 300. Him. Chiron groaned. Wasn't that an incredible amount of force? Azel spoke. There were also a lot of humans. Then there are the wolfnoids that are hard to see anywhere else. When you say wolfnoid, are you referring to lycanthropes? No. Lycanthropes are cursed existences that shows up in legends. What's the difference between the two? Lycanthropes are humans that were cursed, and their form became a mixture of beast and human. Wolfnoid are a race that is shaped like wolfmen. Since the Wolnoids aren't really known to humans, Carlos theorized that the tales of the lycanthropes arose when people witnessed Wolfnoids. However, that story doesn't matter to our current situation. Him. Rare beings that were pushed out by humans live here. 
This place is ruled by the survival of the fittest. But they will prevent outsiders from wiping out the people within the territory. This was Alberton's will in ruling this land. And that is why humans call it the land of the demons. Did you hear this from Alberton himself? Yes. However, it was a long time ago. Azel let out a bitter laugh. The memory had left a deep impression within him. Alberton was an amazing existence. Carlos had been unable to close his mouth, which had hung wide open. A dragon told you that. It really is hard to swallow that story. Chiron shook his head from side to side. To him, dragons were beings that were incapable of holding a conversation. They were closer to a natural disaster than living beings. However, there is an existence in front of me that also told me a story that was hard to believe. I guess I should believe you. Azel grinned at his words. Laura spoke. I really is hard to believe, pervert. Azel's laughter turned pitiful. Azel forcefully let out a bright smile as he spoke. Ah, anyways, it seems our conversation strayed off topic. Azel explained why he had to go to the heart of the demon land as soon as possible. It was as he explained a moment ago. Alberton was accepted as the absolute king of this land, but he practiced a principle of non-interference. This was why several factions existed and fought amongst each other. It was the survival of the fittest. However, if Azel's party remained here, their enemies would soon track them down. They couldn't be afraid of clashing against the factions within the Alberton forest. They won't bring a large army. For example, there is a possibility only Ragus and Almeric will enter this place. They know this region well, so they'll try to fight us in regions where Alberton doesn't directly rule. Are you sure about this? It happened before. Him, at that time, Atain was here too. What did you just say? Everyone became surprised by his words, so they turned to look at him. Azel shrugged his shoulders as he smirked. I met one of my teacher named Rishu here. At the time, he wasn't affiliated with any power within this place. He lived alone, and there was a big hubbub when Rishu challenged Atain to a fight. Rishu had lost in that fight, and he was at death's door. Azel intervened, and he was able to critically wound Atain once. Azel spoke. That is why we can't take it easy by staying in one place. After everyone recovers somewhat, I have a method that will allow us to travel there in a single effort. Until that time, we'll be careful as we move inward. We also have them with us. Azel looked at the guardian shadows that kept appearing and disappearing between the trees. Chapter 161. Inherited Resolution. Part 3. The plane of darkness was in an uproar. After Azel Kazark's identity was confirmed, the dragon demon General Almeric had revealed himself. This event caused a bigger wave than the time when Ragus woke up as an undead. Even the core power of the plane of darkness could sense a storm coming. The shock that rippled through the Almeric tribe was quite significant. Almeric hadn't notified anyone in his tribe that he had been revived. Even after his revival, he kept his identity hidden. He had posed as a recluse. This really was a baffling turn of event. He was a dragon demon general, yet no one had been by his side when he was revived. So how was he able to acquire a safe haven near the dragon demon palace, and how had he managed to stay hidden? There was a reason why he had been able to do all of this. It has been a while, Sir Almeric. Queen Ain Sarah sought out Almeric to have a conversation with him. After she lost all human emotions, she rarely left her room. Also, if one thought about her position, Almeric should have gone to see her. Still, she couldn't force Almeric to come to her even if it was a matter of importance. He had suffered a serious injury. This was why she used the Great Darkness to send a clone to talk to him. Almeric smiled as he lay on top of the bed. My body is in distress, so I'll have to take audience from my bed. Please excuse my rudeness. I don't mind it. I'm not here with my real body. Thank you. Do you remember what happened? I vaguely remember it. At the time, I thought it was necessary to erase it, so I did it. However, it seems my memories won't fully return. Ain Sarah had facilitated the business of providing Almeric with a place to stay. However, she had forgotten everything until Almeric revealed himself. He had done so to draft the forces of his tribe to his cause. She had erased her own memories. 
A person with a strong ego usually has a strong attachment to one's memories. The act of erasing one's memories usually caused incredible amount of fear and resistance. The resistance was so strong that it usually threatened one's life if one attempted it. However, after Isera had listened to Almeric's story, she willingly erased her memories. Almeric looked at her for a brief moment. It was hard to call her as being Ainsera anymore. She had lost herself when she became the nervous system of the great darkness. Ainsera had lost her heart, so she couldn't read the emotions contained within Almeric's gaze. If it was anyone else, she could have read the information through the great darkness. However, Almeric was free from the control of her power. I never expected a day to come where I would pity her. In the past, Almeric had been on bad terms with Ainsera. He didn't hate her per se. He had been different in the past. Unlike his current self, he had been the embodiment of wildness. He had been feral. On the other hand, Ainsera had been noble and calm. This was why she had avoided being near him. In turn, this soured Almeric's disposition towards her. Currently, she wasn't showing a single hint of revulsion towards Almeric. It wasn't, because Almeric had changed. It was true that his disposition had changed. He had to pose as a retired elder, and he had gone through a surprising amount of change. He was much calmer than his previous self, and there was an air of intelligence around him. Even Regus was having a hard time believing he was Almeric. However, Ainsera was acting differently from her past, because her sense of self had faded away. It was a situation where it was unknown as to whether she had a sense of self anymore. Despite knowing the risk from the beginning, she had accepted this role, and Almeric could only look at her with pity. Ainsera spoke. Since you stepped forward, I didn't expect you to fail in catching them. You are poking me at a sore spot. I was too careless. Almeric let out a bitter laugh. Was it the side effect of being raised from the dead? Or was it deep emotions he felt when he met an old foe after such a long time? Anyways, he lost any rights to call Regus an idiot anymore. He had also been a prisoner to his emotions. While he enjoyed the moment, it came back to bite him. The will shown by the guardian shadows in their efforts to safely evacuate Azel had been terrifying. After giving up the dragon weapons stored within their bodies, the Keepers of Prophecy knew this was their final battlefield. Since they knew this was their final fight, they had displayed their might. They were able to drive Regus and Almeric into a corner. This confirms it. Carlos Rizester was the one that had created the Guardian Shadows. Almeric became certain of this fact when he fought the Keepers of the Prophecy. Of course, he didn't know the connection they had with Azel. However, the magic they embodied. I'm sure it was Carlos' magic. The Guardian Shadows were created using a great magic that changed the face of the world, and it was connected to Carlos. The Keepers of Prophecy weren't all skilled in battle. There were those like Balseru and Iota, who were powerful. Then there were those like Jarras, who fell behind in terms of battle capability. Some were in charge of maintaining the sleepless guardians, and others were there to control the guardian shadows. However, as their bodies slowly broke down into energy, they were able to create a menacing magic spell. The disintegration of their bodies fueled the spell. This spell was connected to the movements of the guardian shadows, and it had an earth-shattering effect. When the keepers of the prophecy were all dead, Almeric had received a life-threatening injury. Even the undead Regus suffered partial destruction. Moreover, 70% of the demon king worshippers were killed. It was a massive loss. After taking such heavy losses, they hadn't been able to exterminate Azul's party, and most of the guardian shadows present were able to escape intact. Ainsera still spoke in a disinterested manner. Even if Azel Kazark survived, there is a limit to his power. The two of you are dragon demon generals revived by the king's contingency plan. Shouldn't you be able to handle Azel? Hadn't Regus already won against Azel in a one-on-one -on -one fight? Almeric shook his head from side to side. I can't guarantee it. Azel really is a being that is hard to predict. Moreover, his unpredictability rises when one considers the fact that Carlos is supporting him the organization called the Guardian Shadows. It was created to be a deterrent force against us. 
The fact that Carlos was able to do this should make us feel afraid. I agree. Ain Sarah nodded her head. One of our plan is already in motion. Chaos and death is spreading in the human world. When the king returns, we will be able to fulfill his wish. I guess so. However, Almeric was having a different thought. What is the king's true intention? Almeric's revival from death had been arranged by Atain, but it didn't mean he understood Atain's intentions. During the Dragon Demon War, he had prophesied his own defeat. This was why he had left behind contingency plans like the Great Darkness within the Dragon Demon Palace. What had Atain been thinking? The only thing he was sure of was, when the king returns, new allies will arrive in accordance to our pact. At that time, we'll be able to learn more of what he intends to do. Regus was in the deepest underground location within the Dragon Demon Palace. He was at a location that was named the Abyss. The Great Darkness was spread across the entire continent by using the Dragon Demon King worshippers as a medium, and this place could be called the Nucleus of the Great Darkness. This was where the essence of darkness refined by magic was gathered. Regus was very familiar with this feeling. He had already been revived from death once, and his revival could be traced back to the Great Darkness. It really is annoying to come here, because of the stairs. The abyss was basically an enormous tomb. The staircase leading down was helical in structure, and the steps protruded from the walls. It was wide enough to allow only a single person to traverse down it. Regus was a giant that was over three meters tall, so the stairway was too small for him. He had to stick to the wall as he traveled downward. He was performing an acrobatic feat. There was a silhouette of a pale girl next to him. Is that the king? Kealia asked the question as she looked at the center of the abyss. There wasn't a single light within the darkness that was coalesced through magic. However, Regus and Kealia could see the form within the darkness. It was the dragon demon king at Tyne's body. It was slowly recovering as time passed. According to the observations recorded by the plane of darkness, his bones were the first to form. Organs, muscles and nerves followed next. The last to form was his skin. His skin started to grow from his fingertips and toes. It crawled inwards, and skin was now starting to cover a Tyne's body. If one thought about the process, it felt as if the revival wasn't too far off. However, Kealia tilted her head in puzzlement. Did Sir Almeric go through this process in his revival? I do not know. Even he has no memories on how he was revived. Then you don't know how you were revived also. It was as if I woke up from a long sleep, and I was like this. Him. Was it the same for you? It's always the same for me. Him. Ah. It is a little bit different each time. After I was dispersed, I pulled myself together, and I found myself in this form. This time. What do you mean? You knew what I was before I became engaged to the king, right? At the very least, you weren't in this form. Ah, I'm using your past self as the standard. That standard can't be used on my current self. Anyways, the ingredients that makes up, me, was scattered, and I was put back together. However, the current, me, that is put back together is a little bit different from my past self. I need two things to realize what change has actually occurred. I need time and a trigger. Him. It sounds profound. That was the reason why the king proposed to me. It was a mutually beneficial relationship. That was the reason why the two of you got engaged. The rules of my tribe was strict. We can only trade kernels of our techniques with those that marry one of our tribe members. That is the minimum threshold. Your relationship with him sounds quite dreary. Amongst all of us, the only one blinded by love was Ain Sarah Uni. The king was the only man for her. Unexpectedly, she loved with a fiery passion. Love seems to be out of character with her. When she inherited the great darkness from the king, she made the choice knowing the consequences. The king wasn't someone that would hide his problems. He wouldn't just push off his responsibility onto another. I didn't like that part about Uni, but at the same time, I was a bit jealous of her. I see. Kealia flew up into the darkness, and she approached a Tyne's body, which was slowly recovering within the abyss. She carefully looked over him as she spoke. However, something does bother me. What is it? 
Why did the king insist on using this strange method to revive himself? Him, he is someone that is capable of using my technique. His revival could have been much simpler and faster. So why? Kealia mumbled to herself as if she didn't understand this point. The Alberton forest was truly large. The sea of trees were endless no matter how far they traveled. Even if there were occasional gaps in the tree, their sight was obstructed by mountains. This place deserved to be called the Demonic Lands. It was that dangerous. The party had traveled for only a day, yet they had fought numerous foes. At times, they faced wild beasts. Wild beasts consolidated under a leader, and... Wow! Those are Etans. I've heard about them, but this is the first time I've seen one. Euron was taken aback. A giant possessing two ugly heads was attacking the party. It was over ten meters tall, and each of its steps shook the ground. It was of the giant race, but it was a higher race than the ogres. They were called the Etans. They are annoying. Leticia grumbled. Orc archers were shooting at him from various locations. However, the arrows were flying through an irregular path. It seems there was a magician controlling the path of the arrows. The arrows weaved through the trees. The forest held terrifying foes. However, they couldn't touch the party members. Unyielding Fortress. Chapter 162. Inherited Resolution. Part 4. Unyielding Fortress. A ripple made out of light surrounded them. All the arrows were repelled when they came in contact with the ripple. The ripple even repelled the attacks by the Etans. Etans were so large that they didn't need any weapons. Their arms were unusually long compared to the proportion of their body, and the distal ends of their hands were formed of a substance that was as hard as a rock. The swings of their arms exceeded the damage one could cause with a battering ram. However, the light ripple easily absorbed the impact. The Etans ate up too much ground with their long strides, so the party wasn't able to lose them. However, the party was able to advance in a very laid-back manner. Azel spoke. At this point, they should have realized the gap between our capabilities. It'll be annoying, but I'll have to kill their leader. Annoying? Is that all there is to it? Chiron couldn't suppress his laughter as he asked the question. Azel answered him. I am thankful that they are becoming partners for my rehab training, so I don't want to kill them if I don't have to. It is true that we are intruding into their territory, so my response will be mild. The light ripple, which was protecting the party members, was Azel's dragon weapon named, Unyielding Fortress. It was as the name implied. The dragon weapon boasted powerful defensive abilities. If Azel wanted to do so, he could have responded by giving orders to the Guardian Shadows. However, he wanted to avoid a fight, so he had focused on defense. This didn't mean their enemies gave up on their attacks. In the end, Azel had to summon a new dragon weapon. Rise Dragon Weapon. Dawn's Defender. A bubbles made out of light appeared in the air, and it formed into a silhouette. It looked as if it was drawn with white light, yet it held a resemblance to Azel. Chiron was surprised. It isn't your clone. It is my dragon weapon. I share my senses, thoughts and magical energy with it. It can fight autonomously. Also, I want to borrow your strengths. What do you mean by that? Your cooperation will let me add your powers to the Dawn's Defender. You just have to give consent. Azel let out a laugh. His expression said he was hiding a secret. Everyone was confused, but they followed his instruction. What followed next was. Ah, silhouettes made out of light appeared next to each of them. They resembled the party members. Azel spoke. The maximum I can make is eight, but there aren't that many of us. I'll fill the rest with myself. Three more silhouettes that resembled Azel appeared. There was a total of eight of them. They dashed out of the unyielding fortress, and they started to fight. What the hell? Laura was shocked. Their sight was obstructed by the forest, but Euron and Lauren was able to place a magic eye in the air to survey their surrounding. This was why they were able to see the battle. They are using our abilities. Euron mumbled in disbelief. Azel had made eight silhouettes using his dragon weapon, Dawn's Defender. These silhouettes were fighting in the same style as the party. Their martial abilities, magic and even personal abilities were being replicated. The silhouette resembling Leticia was using her abilities, which dealt with frost. 
In a flash, their enemies started to fall. The battle capability of the Dawn's defenders was so overwhelming that their enemies were being subdued without any deaths. Even the Etans were easily subdued by the magic used by the silhouette that looked like Laura and Euron. Chiron was baffled as he asked a question. Those are our abilities. Did you create an exact clone of us? It isn't an exact one. But you are correct. Dragon Weapon Dawn's Defender could create up to eight cloned soldiers. It replicated the user of the weapon, and anyone that declared their support to the wielder. It didn't matter if one was a warrior or a magician. It could replicate the person's specialty skills. However, there is a limit. It cannot replicate the power of tools like the dragon weapons. It also resonates to borrow one's thought process and overall skill. That is why the people being replicated has to be present. There's a limit to the abilities they could use, and the magical energy is inferior compared to the original. Azul's party possessed much stronger magical energy compared to an average dragon magian. The Dawn's defenders possessed inferior abilities compared to them. This still meant each of them possessed magical energy that rivaled a dragon magian. The dragon weapon could create eight of them. It truly was a terrifying weapon. Laura spoke. That was the dragon weapon you used to defeat Baldazar. That's right. It was Count Banan's dragon weapon. He was killed by Baldazar. Count Banan was a mild-mannered magician of few words. However, he had also been a determined man with the flame of revenge burning within his heart. He had lost countless family members and comrades through the Dragon Demon War. His longing for them had been transferred in the creation of the dragon weapon called the Dawn's Defender. He was a powerful force on the battlefield, but he found himself in a disadvantageous situation against Baldazar. He had to fight one-on-one -on -one with Baldazar, and he had suffered a grievous wound that he couldn't recover from. This was why he picked Azel as the person that would wield his dragon weapon. He closed his eyes after transferring his weapon to Azel. In the future, Azel would replicate his comrades with his dragon weapon, and he used overwhelming numbers to defeat Baldazar. Chiron couldn't hide his surprise. This is truly amazing. It seems the records doesn't do you any justice as to what you accomplished. I never expected such wondrous abilities. Him. We should stop talking about it. It is embarrassing. Azel let out a bitter laugh. Azel's party forged ahead as they fought. Aside from Azel, the other party members were still in rough shape. Azel had recovered nine of his dragon weapons from the Keepers of the Prophecy so his battle capability was overpowered. It didn't matter, which opponents showed up. He was able to continue his ridiculous feat of subduing his enemies with minimal bloodshed. There was a general unrest amongst the inhabitants of the Alberton Forest. Powerful outsiders have shown up at the edge of the forest. We can't even touch them. They are a strange bunch. We are the ones bringing the fight to them, yet they are avoiding killing us. They are just moving forward. Are we going to take this insult lying down? Or, as time passed, the rumor about Azul's party spread throughout the forest. The factions within the forest were antagonistic towards each other, but at the same time, they worked together to repel outside forces. This was why the news about Azul's party were being spread amongst them. This was also what Azel was aiming for. If they wanted to, the party could have moved stealthily through the forest. Azel had his concealment technique, and there were two high-rank magicians within his party. They could have avoided around 90% of the enemies they had faced. However, Azel purposefully made himself visible as he continued to fight. His intentions were finally delivered to his opponents on the morning of the fourth day after they entered the Alberton Forest. Azel's party sensed two people coming towards them from the other side of the forest. Everyone became tense. They are strong. Their opponents purposefully let their existence be known. From the force that could be felt from far away, they knew these two beings were strong. They couldn't take these two lightly. Chiron licked his lips. These won't be easy opponents. In the past four days, the party had come across skilled dragon magians and dragon demons. They all brought along monsters like orcs or wild beasts. It was a truly strange sight for the party members. However, it seems such sights were the norm in this place. Azel broke through all of them as he continued to fight out in the open. 
Are you the outsiders that's making a ruckus in the forest? His voice was low, and his white hair was untamed. He was a middle-aged dragon magian with dark blue eyes, horns and dragon stone. He was an intimidating big man with boulder-like muscles. Then there was the young and beautiful dragon magian next to him. Her long blonde hair hung loose, and she looked at the party with curiosity in her eyes. Azel stepped forward. Everyone blindlessly attacked us, so we just protected ourselves. You talk out of both sides of your mouth. You did purposefully cause the ruckus. What evidence do you have to make such an assertion? The inhabitants of the forest attacked us first. That is true. However, you are only human, yet you are as strong as the heroes of our forest. You didn't hide yourself or run away. You provoked him to attack. Do you really want me to believe that this wasn't avoidable? Everyone in my party is injured except me. That is why I behaved badly. The dragon mage and male snorted. Well, all right. I don't care what schemes you are trying to hatch. So basically you want us to prove that we are worthy of speaking with you. You want us to prove it through strength. It seems you are well aware of what I'm trying to do. Did you do all of this knowing this would happen? I will give you the opportunity to prove your strength through a one-on-one -on -one battle with me. I am paying respects to your skills, which allowed you to get here without killing a single being. If you prove your strength, I will grant your request. Do you know what I want? You want to meet Albert and Nim. Am I right? We are on the same page. Good. Azel grinned. The dragon magan male spoke. I am Albert and Nim's hero Havan. I am Sir Azel Zestringer. Azel, the one to react wasn't Havan. It was the blonde-haired dragon mage and female. However, Havan didn't wait for her to speak. A wave of dragon demon magic spread like a storm. Open dragon soul. Azel became surprised when he saw this. What the hell? By the look of him, Azel had assumed his opponent possessed a dragon weapon. However, the dragon mage and male use a strange technique instead of summoning his dragon weapon. A semi-translucent light dragon curled around Havan's body. The image of the dragon was made out of a semi-translucent green light, and it growled. Azel could feel a powerful will as if the dragon was a living being. Azel asked a question. I've never seen this technique before. Could you tell me the name of it? This is the dragon soul. It is a sworn friend awakened through the dragon's power sleeping within me. I can't discern anything through that explanation. I have no obligations to tell you any more. Now it is time for you to prove yourself. After making the declaration, Havan unsheathed his sword. It was twice as large as a normal long sword. It was a huge sword. I'm not too fond of unreasonable battle freaks, but I guess I have no choice. Azel snorted. In the next moment, Havan charged Azel, who hadn't even unsheathed his sword. However, there was no sound of sword meeting flesh. Azel had resolved into two. The close placed its hand on the surface of Havan's sword, and he sidestepped the blow. Azel's true body was behind Havan, and an explosive wave of dragon demon magic emanated from Azel. Come dragon weapon. Moon sword. A slender strand of light appeared in midair, and it formed into a sword that curved gently. It was as if the sword was carved from the moon in the night sky. Havan let out a sharp laugh when he saw it. As expected, you are a wielder of a dragon weapon. I thought you were one too. Azel gave his reply as he used his instantaneous movement to disappear. In a flash, Havan also used his instantaneous movement technique. A fierce spark formed when the red sword clashed against the moon sword. The expulsive power of the blow should have flung them backwards, but the two refused to move. At some point in time, the light dragon surrounding Havan started to move. It stretched its neck towards Azel's side, and it spat out a beam of light. Ho! Oh, oh, is that how you use it? The sound of the explosion rang out. Azel and Havan separated into their respective corners. Azel dashed towards the retreating Havan. He had been aiming for the moment when they were pushed back from the repulsive force. However, it was Azel's clone that had blitzed Havan. Havan mumbled to himself as he deflected the clone's attack. You are a mere human, yet you are able to use incarnation mastefully. Incarnation was considered to be one of the most outstanding skills amongst the dragon arts. 
One had to have aptitude for the skill to reach the pinnacle of this skill. And it truly was rare to see someone that had reached such heights with the skill. However, one of the heroes within the Alberton forest was able to use incarnation, so Havan was able to keep his cool. He didn't flounder, however, another clone formed in the next moment, and they attack Havan. Havan was frantic as he was pushed back by Azel's attacks. The dragon demon female, who had been watching all of this, let out a shout. Husband. This human. This is a battle where the pride of two warriors are on the line. Don't interfere. Havan let out a stubborn yell. The members of Azel's party became surprised. Those two were married. The dragon demon female puffed up as she grumbled to herself. Stubborn idiot. Chiron asked her a question. Are you really going to let them fight a one-on-one -on -one battle? Him, your side haven't interfered yet. Why, do you plan on helping your comrade? She tilted her head in question. Chiron shook his head from side to side. The thought hadn't even crossed my mind. Moreover, my help isn't needed. I want to say you are being impertinent, but... Suddenly, she let out a bitter laugh. The problem is that you might be right. I should have fought instead of him. While they were talking, the fight between the two had intensified. They were moving at incredibly high speeds, and at times, they used instantaneous movement to move around. It was dizzying to watch. The beautiful trees broke every time they clashed, and the shock wave swept over the surrounding. Chiron couldn't hide his surprise as he watched the fight. Havan was a dragon magian, but his dragon demon magic was stronger than most dragon demons. Moreover, his technique was also excellent. Even if Chiron was at full strength, he couldn't guarantee his victory if he fought against Havan. I'm still not sure what that is. Chapter 163. Inherited Resolution. Part 5. The light dragon coiled around Havan's body. It was acting as an armor and a weapon. Azel attacked as he appeared unpredictably from all sides, yet his attacks were being blocked by the light dragon. Moreover, the light dragon was simultaneously attacking Azel using its tail and the powerful beam of light emitted from its mouth. Is that a dragon weapon? No. Azel was surprised when he saw it. It might not be a dragon weapon. The light dragon attacked alongside Havan as if they were of one mind. However, Havan was losing. His specialty was using powerful attacks that accentuated his strength. However, Azel was cutting off his attacks before it could gain any steam. Azel's clones were too fickle as their numbers increased and decreased at any moment. Havan's senses were confused, and he couldn't highlight his advantages. He was continuously being pushed backwards. He suddenly became furious as he yelled out. Shit, what an evil weapon. He finally identified the ability of the moon sword. However, it was too late. Azel smiled. You were too slow in realizing it. This is what you get for being a brute who rely solely on your strength. Dragon weapon moon sword. It was Azel's very first dragon weapon. It was the sword he inherited from his third teacher Liglan. Liglan's dragon weapon was eccentric. Two swords made up a single dragon weapon. Originally, it was called the sun and the moon sword. The moon sword took control and absorbed the magical energy in the surrounding. The sun sword amplified the energy several folds before it emitted the magical energy. When Liglan was trying to save Azel, he had transferred only the moon sword to Azel. The two swords had to be used as a pair. However, he had been given only one, so of course, the sword couldn't be used properly. This was why Azel had gone through several dragon slayers ritual to evolve the moon sword, which had lost its other half. The reconstituted moon sword possessed much stronger ability to dominate and absorb magical energy. Its ability couldn't be compared to its former self. Shit. Havan was stunned. If one had some ability to control magical energy, it was possible to seize and absorb magical energy from one's surrounding. However, how could a dragon weapon chip away even the magical energy in his body when it hadn't even touched him? Moreover, if he was careless in emitting his magical energy, his opponent would absorb it all. In fact, he had consumed several times more magical energy than any battle he had participated in before. It was an extreme amount. In the end, Havan decided to use something he had held back as a gambit for victory. 
My sworn brother, do not hold back your power. The light dragon started to burn like a flame. Until now, Havan's attack had been interrupted before it could initiate, so he hadn't been able to use any of his big skills. However, this was his light dragon's ace in the hole ability. The power immediately boosted his dragon demon magic by several folds. Azul's eyes shone. So you aren't thinking about the aftermath. Azel immediately realized what Havan was doing. He confirmed it through the fight. The light dragon was something similar to the dragon weapons. It was formed through dragon demon magic, yet it needed the dragon demon magic of the wielder. Havan consumed the dragon demon magic needed to maintain the form of the light dragon, and he gained a several fold amplification to his power. It was a similar method to the one Azel had used to bring out a power that exceeded his vessel. In this instance, Havan wasn't doing this within himself. It was all done through the light dragon. I'm coming. Havan's movement accelerated. His strength and speed was on a different level. Azel stabbed to stop his movement, yet Havan disappeared. Havan had exited the range of Azel's attack before Azel could complete his stab. Before Azel could turn his sword, Havan kicked off the ground, and he came towards Azel. He was traveling at terrifying speed. I'll end you. This was something he hadn't been able to do since the start of the fight. He struck out with a blow that held all the strength in his body. Azel's stance had been disrupted, so there was no way he could avoid it. Havan was sure of it. When his sword reached its maximum speed, something unimaginable occurred. My god, Azel accelerated faster than the attack, and he jumped into Havan's guard. If Azel had gotten in the path of the sword, he would have been cut into two. He had done something completely insane. However, Azel didn't hesitate as he went past Havan. The exchange was brief, but Azel had bumped Havan by a minute amount as he went past. However, Havan's balance had completely crumbled under it. Havan followed through on his sword strike. He spun superbly through the air before he was planted into the ground. The beautiful trees in the surrounding broke like matchsticks, and a loud sound rang out. Azel turned to look at him as he asked the question. You want to continue this? After a moment, an answer could be heard. Shit. I lost. Havan fumed as he got up. It was a complete loss. He had attacked with the intent to kill, yet Azel had fought while trying to spare his life. It showed the gulf between their skill level. He had no choice, but to accept this fact. The blonde-haired dragon magen woman walked towards him as she spoke. You are an idiot. You charged like a boar without realizing who your opponent is. You got what you deserved. Humph. Do you think I'm petty enough to take advice after I've already started my one-on-one -on -one fight? Havan jumped off the floor. If he had been a normal person, his body would have been broken into pieces by the impact. However, not a single bone was broken. The dragon mage and female massaged her forehead. Why the hell did I fall for such a man? I'm sorry for intruding on a conversation between a married couple, but... At that moment, Azel let out a bitter laugh as he butted into the conversation. Could you facilitate my meeting with Alberton? You've passed the test given by our side, so we will do so. However, did you really need to go through all of this hassle? You are the hero Azel, who defeated the dragon demon king Atain. You know who I am. As expected, you are him. It is hard to believe, but you are the real deal. So you guessed it. At her reaction, Azel let out a bitter laugh. She put on a bright smile. I've heard a lot about you. My name is Mernal. I see. It has been such a long time, since I've been here. I didn't think anyone at the edge of the forest would know me. I assumed my identity could only be proven to Alberton. Moreover, everyone just kept picking a fight with me. Most of us don't look kindly towards outsiders. Anyways, you are correct. The outer regions are under the stewardship of Hanarosa Nim and Lebetan Nim. You probably do not know them. I don't know who those two are. Lebetan Nim was also present in the forest when you visited the forest in the past. Yet I do not know him. Azel tilted his in confusion. When he came here to meet Alberton in the past, he had made a ruckus that disturbed entire forest. Anyone that was worth their salt in the forest had come to fight him for two months. 
That was why he had met everyone that held influence within the forest. Mineral had on a bright smile as she spoke. Lebetan Nim is a dragon, who acquired wisdom about 100 years ago. Azel was shocked at her words. There are other dragons that acquired wisdom aside from Alberton. It was something that could happen at any moment. He knew it was a possibility, but he couldn't hide his shock when he found out that it actually had happened. It was at that moment. Ah, the one to gain wisdom was Lebetan. It wasn't Lakunda. At his words, everyone's gaze headed towards Euron. Mineral and Havan looked at him with wary eyes. Mineral queried him. How do you know the name of Lakunda? How did you know Lakunda was a dragon that was at the cusp of gaining wisdom? Ah, that is. There is someone that informs me of such things. Euron let out an awkward laugh as he spoke. It was information that was given to him in his dream last night by the guide. This was why he had unconsciously responded to their words. However, the reaction shown by Mineral and Havan was very severe. Mineral let out an overpowering energy. It was suffocating. Are you playing with me? Wait a moment. Azel stopped her. He's one of my companions, and he really does possess such an ability. You really want me to believe that? It can't be helped if you don't believe me. Well, it's just how it is. This guy receives weird information from his dreams. Azel shrugged his shoulders as he spoke. Anyways, please present us to Alberton. Him. Mineral glared at Azel with suspicion, but in the end, she let out a sight. I'll do so. It was as if Azel's party hadn't fought them for the past four days. There was no resistance as they headed straight towards the heart of the forest. Mineral asked him a question. What are those things that are hiding in our surrounding? When the two of them had approached Azel's party, the guardian shadows had hidden themselves completely. They had no idea about the existence of the guardian shadows. However, they were now able to see glimpses of the guardian shadows from between the trees, and they were becoming worried. Azel answered her. They call themselves the guardian shadows. If no one attacks me, they won't become hostile. What if they worry me? It can't be helped. Did Alberton give you the power to expel me depending on your judgment? At his words, Mineral put on a coy expression. Havan scratched his head. Alberton Nim and the other elders probably knew all about this. Yet they sent us as envoys. I have no idea why. I think you were right. They are cantankerous old men. Mineral agreed with Havan's words. The elders had been snickering as they sent the two of them as envoys. It seemed they some ulterior motive in doing so. Was this the reason why? Azel let out a bitter laugh. I believe you are right. Alberton is highly proficient in magic, so there is no way our presence wasn't known to him. If it wasn't Alberton, the act of checking up on Azel through the magic eye wasn't even work. However, there had been so many observation-type magic on their party, since they entered the forest. He had no idea which one was being used by Alberton. Suddenly, Mineral asked a question. So why do you want to meet him? Some unknown being arranged it. What do you mean by that? It'll be a bit difficult to explain all of this to you. I also have to get the full story from Alberton. Azel let out a bitter laugh. When he decided to come here, there hadn't been some crucial reason behind his decision. He just wanted to meet someone from the past that knew him, and he had wanted to hear what had happened. However, as he followed the instructions of Yuren's guide, it became crucial for him to come to this place. The problem remained that he had no idea why he had to come here until he met Alberton. However, suddenly, Chiron turned to look at Havan as he asked a question. When you were fighting Azel, you used something called the Dragon Soul. What is it? You want us to talk about our secret technique to outsiders? Ah, now that I think about it, I'm being rude. I'm sorry. Recently, Azel didn't hold back in supplying Chiron with information. Leticia also didn't hesitate in exchanging techniques, and he had gotten used to it. He had forgotten the mindset of most traditional martial artists regarding sharing information. Chiron acknowledged his fault as he gave an apology. Havan smirked. It seems you do have some manners. I cannot speak about such things without the consent of the elders. Please do not speak any further about that subject. I'll be careful. Havan spoke in a threatening manner, but Chiron knew he was the one at fault. 
This was why he didn't take any offense as he accepted Havan's words. Suddenly, Mineral stopped in front of a spring with a large boulder in the middle of it. I've called someone that'll heal you guys. Your wounded members will slow us down, and it would take us several days to reach our destination at this pace. Do you have someone that can heal us? Do you have a healer? Azel asked in puzzlement. This was obvious, but there hadn't been one 220 years ago. At the time, only the priests from the temples could use the healing art, and there hadn't been any priests here. Myrnal shook her head. No. Unfortunately, we do not have any hurlers here. However, there is someone with the ability to heal. Is it an ability of a dragon weapon? Several heroes acknowledged by Alberton carried dragon weapons. However, 220 years had passed, and there were probably beings like Havan, who used this mysterious technique called Dragon Soul instead of a dragon weapon. The woman called Mineral seems to use a similar technique as him. From her outer appearance, Mineral looked to be of the same age as Chiron. By that age, she probably could have made her own dragon weapon if she had diligently studied the dragon arts from a young age. However, Azel decided she was a user of the dragon soul. The energy emanating from her body felt similar to Havan. Soon, he could feel someone approaching them from the opposite side. Azel instantly could tell this being was a dragon demon, and he felt something strange. Is it someone I know? The feel of this dragon demon magic wasn't unfamiliar. It is to be expected. I'm sure a lot of beings from the time I visited here survived. Azel was having such thought when he caught sight of a figure. He became puzzled before he became surprised. It was as if he had seen a ghost. The middle-aged dragon demon male was refined. He had neatly trimmed black hair, and he possessed a stylish long beard. His eyes were red, and two black obsidian-like horns curved towards the sky. There was a red dragon stone on the back of his hand. It was the same color as his eyes. How can you? The dragon demon male looked puzzled as he looked at Azel. Azel's eyes widened when he recognized the dragon demon in front of him. Are you perhaps? Aren't you the simpleton prince? At his words, the dragon demon let out a bitter laugh. The laughter held surprise, but he didn't sound too happy. He spoke with a voice that revealed that he was feeling complex emotions at that moment. It has been a long time since I've heard that insulting nickname. He was Dragon Demon Atine's son, and the father of Niberus. It was Cybane. Chapter 164. The Wise Dragon. Part 1. Cybane was officially declared missing from the Plane of Darkness around 20 years ago. He went missing after he fought against the Guardian Shadows within the Rulan Kingdom. No one knew why he had gone there, and his fate had become a mystery. The Plane of Darkness was dogged in their search for him and they were able to find where he had gone. This resulted in Niberus inheriting his dragon weapon, but she had been unable to make contact with him. This was the extent of the story he had heard from Laura. Azel spoke. You've aged. I guess it is to be expected since a significant amount of time has passed. Azel couldn't immediately recognize Cybane, because he had aged in the past 220 years. During the Dragon Demon War, he had looked like a young man. In terms of human age, Cybane currently looked as if he was in his late forties or early fifties. He had cut his long hair, and he had grown a beard. He looked completely different. Cybane spoke. You really are. You look exactly as you did in the past. It is almost unbelievable. How is it possible for a human to do this? How are you still alive? For a brief moment, Cybane became suspicious. He wondered if the man in front of him was the descendant of the original Azel. However, how could his descendant recognize Sabane, who had aged? Azel spoke. I'm not obligated to answer your questions. That is true. However, I did come here to heal your comrades. Could you take that into consideration and answer my questions? Since we are meeting in this place, I believe we are no longer enemies. The simpleton prince I knew didn't have such a flexible personality. It seems a lot has changed over the years. Azel let out a bitter laugh. From what he remembered, Cybane had been obsessed with honor, and he had been inflexible during all negotiations. He also thirsted for fame, so he did a lot of idiotic things. 
the leadership group of the Human Alliance had been thankful for his existence, since Cybane had been very predictable. It seems his personality had gone through a lot of change over the past 200 years. Azel spoke. I slept for a long time to alleviate the curse put on me by your father. I've woken up recently. Are you talking about a hibernation? It is fair to make that comparison. How could a human go into hibernation? How can this be? It was through a very profound magic. Atain used magic to revive the dead. Is it really surprising that I went into slumber for the past 220 years? Of course, it is surprising. When you are referencing the raising of the dead, who are you talking about? By the way you phrased it, you aren't talking about an undead. Azel was baffled by his words. Didn't you hold a high position in the plane of darkness before you went missing? How come you don't know anything? After I came here, I cut off all contacts with the plane of darkness. Aside from the time I gave my dragon weapon to my daughter, so you are saying you cut off contact way before Almeric was revived? Sir Almeric, Cybane became surprised, but his expression turned serious soon. If that is true, it seems the time of my father's revival is approaching. He was the same now as in the old days. He was the simpleton prince. Azel watched his earnest reaction, and it confirmed that he didn't know any important information even though he was the prince. Cybane let out a sigh. I want to hear many stories from you, but this isn't the place to do so. Still, Alberton Nim is quite mean. He sent me here with no prior information. He always had a playful personality. It seems that hasn't changed. Azel spoke as he thought about the past. When he came here before in the past, Atain and his party had arrived in the forest right after him. The dragon hadn't explained anything to either side so the two sides had almost fought when they came across each other. At the time, Azel and Carlos had wanted to smack the smirk off of the dragon's face. Havan and Mineral had been sent as envoys without any background information. Afterwards, Cybane was in the dark as he was sent to heal them. It seemed the dragon's personality hadn't changed. Cybane spoke. We should start the treatment. Sabane's expression turned peculiar when he looked over the faces of Azel's party members. He looked closely at Laura as he spoke. Miss, are you perhaps from the Ornsaurus tribe? Yes. Laura answered him. Sabane went missing before Laura made her public appearance, so they hadn't met before. However, Laura had inherited all the characteristics that identified her as a descendant of Ornsaurus. He asked in puzzlement. Why is someone from the Ornsaurus tribe with Azel? I betrayed them. I'm not sure if you are aware of this fact, but our elders are the worst. Him. Cybane murmured to himself. She was so frank in her admission of betrayal that Cybane lost his train of thought for a brief moment. It seems the number of stories I want to hear from all of you have grown. However, let's heal you first. He closed his eyes as he concentrated. A powerful wave of dragon demon magic emanated from him. Dragon soul release. He was also using the technique called the dragon soul. However, there was a clear difference between the dragon soul of Havan and Cybane. The silhouette of a dragon wrapped around his body, but it wasn't made out of light. It was made out of pitch black darkness, and it was crawling over his body. It really was an ominous sight. Azel queried. I'm asking just to be sure. What is it? Are you sure you took that out with the intent to heal us? What if I did? It didn't look like it no matter how one looked at the dragon's soul. His party members felt the same way about it. Cybane spoke. I know what you are trying to say, but it is true that my dragon soul's ability deals with healing. However, the source of my magical energy is darkness, so it looks like this. Him. It is made from magical energy of darkness, but this is nothing like the black magic where one has to take life energy to heal a patient. You also don't have to worry about any side effects. I confirmed all of this through experimentation. I promise upon my honor, it is hard to believe you just by looking at its outer appearance, but I'll trust you for now. I heard humans bow by getting on their knees. I guess this is my lot in life now. Cybane grumbled as he approached the party members. He put out his hands towards Laura. I'll start with the miss. May you hold my hands? Yes. Larua looked a bit tense as she followed his direction. 
The dragon of darkness surrounding Cybane was emitting an intense power. One needed a good amount of courage to expose one's hands to it. However, when she grabbed his hands, it unexpectedly didn't feel too out of the ordinary. It was as if she was dipping her hands into water. Afterwards, the dark dragon twitched as it expanded. The darkness deepened further, and it completely encased his body, and it encircled Laura, who was holding his hands. Azel queried Mineral. Will this really be okay? I understand why you are worried, but his healing ability is considered to be one of the best in our forest. It hadn't been too long since he awakened his dragon soul, but it is an excellent ability. You can relax. Him. Even after hearing her words, he wanted the dragon of darkness crawl around in front of him. He was unable to relax. He tried to expand his sense to see what was occurring inside, but he couldn't penetrate the darkness. He had no idea what was going on. He remained frustrated as he waited for around 10 minutes. Two people appeared as the darkness retreated. Laura. Laura still held Cybane's hands, and her eyes were closed. When Azel called her name, she broke out of the trance, and she opened her eyes. Soon, she looked down at her body with surprise. I'm completely healed. What? Is this true? Chiron and Urin queried as if they couldn't believe it. Laura had been severely wounded. She had been treated by a high-ranking black magician by injecting life energy into her. However, she needed time to completely recover. However, Cybane had healed her in around five minutes. Laura mumbled to herself. It felt as if I was taking a comfortable nap, but I never expected such results. This was possible, because your dragon demon magic is strong. This won't be as effective against a wounded civilian. However, as a cost, your dragon demon magic was changed into life energy, so your energy pulse should be close to empty right now. After hearing Cybane's words, Laura checked her own status. Her magical energy had bottomed out. However, it was akin to her using her magical energy in an intense manner. It didn't evoke a tortuous feeling of tiredness. A pleasant drowsiness washed over her. Cybane spoke. All of you have strong magical energy, so the healing process will go easier. Who's the next patient? Cybane's surprising healing ability allowed the party members to recover to their normal state within the hour. Everyone except Laura was unable to recover fully. Cybane explained why. As I've said before, the healing effect becomes stronger depending on the strength of my patient's dragon demon magic. When humans and dragon magin takes the power of a dragon through the dragon slayer's ritual, the body recovers through the absorption of the power. The concept is analogous to what I did. When one won and imbibed the dragon's power through the dragon slayer's ritual, one's body strengthened in a gradual manner. However, the recovery happened almost instantaneously. Cybane's healing ability copied this concept. In the case of Laura, her supply of dragon demon magic had been low thanks to her grievous injuries. However, she possessed the dragon weapon Vitten's chalice within her. Cybane was able to pull out her reserve power to instantly heal her wounds. By comparison, Chiron and Leticia didn't possess any dragon weapons. Since their body was a mess, their energy pulse was also a mess. They could only use 20% of their normal dragon demon magic, so the result of their healing process was weak compared to Laura. In the case of Euron, he was a human, and he hadn't gone through the dragon slayer's ritual. However, he had practiced the training method left behind by Carlos. This was why there was a hint of dragon demon magic within him. Still, one couldn't expect much result with Euron. Cybane spoke. The two of them will be at full health tomorrow. The human youth will take around four days. It seems you are a black magician, but you should refrain from using the stolen life energy. You'll develop side effects. Understood. Euron nodded his head without making a fuss. Euron had experienced the healing effects, and he knew Cybane was a more skilled black magician than him. This was why he had no ill feeling when he was given the warning. Azel expressed his surprise. It is an amazing ability. Did you give up your dragon weapon to your daughter? Because you gain this ability. No. One cannon gain a dragon soul if one possesses a dragon weapon. Him. Please understand that I am not allowed to talk more on this subject. You are all outsiders. If you want to hear more about it, 
You'll have to receive permission from Albert and Nim. You were saying I should ask my questions later. I'm also refraining myself from asking you questions. Ah, do you perhaps know if my daughter is fine? At the very least, she was alive a couple days ago. That means you fought my daughter. That's right. Azel knew he could be buying Sibane's enmity, but he didn't hide the truth. During the Dragon Demon War, they had been enemies that were unable to stand each other. Even if Azel had slept for a long time, it wasn't as if his enmity towards Sabane had disappeared. Sibane lived through the entirety of the 220 years, but he might also be having a hard time erasing his hatred towards Azel. Moreover, the Dragon Demon War didn't feel too far behind for Azel. Sibane let out a sight after he looked at Azel for a brief moment. All right, let's resolve that problem at a later time. Follow me. Albert and Nim wanted to meet you all. The heart of the forest is still far away. Will we be able to arrive there by today? It is possible. How? Albert and Forest was about the same size as the Yellow's kingdom. If their whole party was healthy, they might be able to do it. However, it wasn't a distance that could be traveled with the wounded. However, Sibane was sure of himself. How did you think I arrived here as soon as I was contacted? Do you have a dragon weapon that can bridge space? This isn't a dragon weapon, but it is something that can do what you described. What is it? Sibane spoke as he enjoyed seeing Azul's frustrated reaction. Road of Emptiness. Chapter 165. The Wise Dragon. Part 2. The Road of Emptiness existed within the demonic land of Alberton. It was something Laura, Euron and Leticia didn't know about. In truth, there was an independent road of emptiness present here. It was separate from the road of emptiness controlled by the plane of darkness. I was told my father installed it here as a gesture of goodwill towards Albert and Nim. Sibane spoke. There weren't that many waypoints, but it really was of big help when one wanted to travel across the vast Alberton forest. Azel couldn't suppress his surprise. It is an unbelievably useful facility. It really annoys me that you guys can use it to your heart's content. If the road of emptiness didn't exist, the party wouldn't have been in as deep of a hole as they were in right now. Even if one could identify the location and destination of the party, time was needed to mobilize a force. Since their party was small in number, they should have been able to lose their trackers easily by fluidly changing directions. As expected, I have to destroy it. In the past, he didn't want to reveal his location, so he had left the road of emptiness alone. However, the Vitten's chalice made it impossible for him to hide his whereabouts. It would be beneficial for him to steal their preternatural mobility by destroying all the road of emptiness. How long will it take to move the next set of people? Azul's party consisted of four members. There were three from the forest including Sibane. There were a total of seven of them so they had to use the road of emptiness twice. The number restriction was four. Sibane spoke. It normally takes around ten minutes. Him. After a short amount of time had passed, the rest of the party was moved. Chiron expressed his amazement. When I heard the name, Road of Emptiness, I thought I would have to roam around the darkness. I just entered it, and I just popped out at the other end. Amazing. This waypoint for the Road of Emptiness was made with the same architecture and metallic material that was the propriety of the Plane of Darkness. There were magical etchings on the border as the structure slowly rotated in place. There was a darkness of unmeasurable depths at the center. When one entered from one side, one's vision would darken for a brief moment before one's surrounding would change. It was an extraordinary device. Follow me. Sibane took the lead as he started to walk. When they exited the waypoint for the Road of Emptiness, they caught sight of a lake. There were houses nearby the lake. These houses were made out of a mixture of wood and stone. The several dozen houses looked as if they were made to be part of the large trees that sparsely populated the lake. When I came here last time, they didn't use stone. It seems things have changed. Is that so? It probably is the influence of outsiders like me. This place was called the heart of the demonic land but it was the size of a small village. There were less than 200 houses here, and the population didn't exceed 1,000. Still, the whole party was tense. It was in response to the dragon demons and dragon magians present here. 
there were almost an equal amount of them compared to the human residents here. This is amazing. Chiron expressed his surprise. There were dragon demons and dragon magians present, but this didn't mean they were all combatants. It was true that they were born with superior physical capabilities and magical energy, but each of them held different interests like the humans. They chose to do what interested them. Still, Chiron couldn't help but feel threatened when he saw a large concentration of dragon magians and dragon demons. By the feel of the wave of dragon demon magic being emitted by them, there were many here that were cultivating magic or the dragon arts. Suddenly, Euron spoke. There are a lot of children here. He wasn't talking about the human children. There were a lot of dragon demon and dragon magian children. Everyone looked at the party with curious eyes. Chiron spoke. There really is. There's a surprisingly high number of them here. In human society, it was very rare to see a dragon demon or a dragon magian. This was why Chiron had never seen this many dragon magian and dragon demon children before. It was more than the total number of children he had seen throughout his life. Euron let out a bitter laugh. It isn't that surprising. Him, what do you mean? The worshippers of the dragon demon race continue to have children to replenish their forces. The facility I grew up in had a lot of children. At least, these children were born into a happy environment. A bitter hurt stabbed into Euron's chest. He thought about the children he had been unable to rescue. Sybane turned to look at him. You, were you part of our organization? I betrayed them. If we are being frank, it is hard to find something good about the organization. Him, from Sybane's point of view, he was at a loss for words. After the Dragon Demon War, he had scraped together the remnants of the army. He was one of the main figures that had created the current organization. He let out a bitter laugh as he spoke. I can't deny what you are saying. I'm here, because of that. Suddenly, Azel became curious as to why Sybane had left the Plane of Darkness. It seemed he still held affection for his daughter, Nibiris. Why was he living here in hiding after cutting off all communication with the Plane of Darkness? We have a lot to talk about, but... Sybane stopped after reaching the northern end of the town. He spoke as he moved to the side of the road. We'll speak about it at a later time after you meet Albert and Nim. Go, Azel. I'll do so. At the northern end of the town, the lakeshore led into the ridge of a mountain. Azel remembered the location of Alberton's dwelling. It seemed the dragon hadn't moved. Azel went up the mountain road with his comrades. While they were climbing up the mountain road, they felt a pressure mount. Everyone in his party was somewhat familiar with this feeling. There is a dragon on the other side. Everyone could feel this truth. There was a dearth of dragon demons and dragon magian in town. They were only several hundred meters away, yet a much larger presence could be felt from the other side. Chiron queried, what kind of dragon is Alberton? He is basically a winged dragon. Basically, he was a winged dragon until he gained his wisdom. Now he is a dragon that common sense cannot be applied. It is useless to discuss what type of dragon he is. This is why you should erase all preconceptions you have regarding dragons. Soon, the party arrived at the summit of the mountain. Aside from Azel, everyone was unable to hide their shock. It was enormous. Of course, all dragons were large. However, the dragon that was looking down at them as it perched on top of the peak was. It was bigger than any dragon they had seen before. Normally, flying dragons were on the smaller size compared to the other dragons. Usually the smaller dragons were 20 meters long from the head to their tail. The large ones were usually 40 meters long. It was rare to see a flying dragon that was over 30 meters long. However, the dragon in front of them was a flying dragon, yet it was at least 60 meters long. Is that really a flying dragon? Chiron couldn't believe what he was seeing, so he carefully observed the dragon. It had large wings, and an sleek body. Then there was the white scales that had a bluish sheen. It was most definitely a flying dragon. The flying dragon suddenly grinned. The party members became startled. It was from a completely different species, yet it was as if a playful old man was laughing at them. Its emotion could be clearly read through its expression. In the next moment, something more amazing occurred. The dragon opened its jaws, and it started to speak in the language of humans. 
The dragon was precise and clear with its speech. It has been a while. Should I call you Azel Zestringer or Sir Azel Kazark? Which do you prefer? You can call me whatever you like. You can just call me Azel. Alberton, has your growth period ended? Azel smirked as he replied. Alberton raised its front paw to scratch its cheek. It was such a human-like gesture that everyone stared at Alberton with a dumbfounded expression on their faces. I think so. I don't think I'll get any bigger. Your power seems to have grown. I don't think the growth period for my power has ended yet. The resonance of power flowing out of Alberton was subdued. However, there was heavy weight to it. One could guess that an incredible amount of power dwelled within its enormous body. Suddenly, Alberton lowered its body, and the party saw a pose that was more amazing than the one before. It bent its arms as it placed its elbows on the ground. Then it propped its chin on its paws. Each id movement was so surreal that it was as if they were in a dream. Chiron let out a laugh that sounded forced. Alberton laughed as if it enjoyed seeing such reactions. This is interesting. I knew you would visit me someday, but now that you are here, I'm very surprised. You are a human, yet you haven't changed much through the years. I was also surprised. It is good to see you. After he had woken up, Alberton was one of the few beings left that had known Azel in the past. Azel had been thrown into this era. It felt as if he was a ghost from the past. This was why he had been delighted to see Regus and Almeric. It was also why he didn't react with hostility when he met Sybane. These beings remembered the era Azel had lived through. They recognized him, and it was a joy to talk about those times. Azel couldn't hide the happiness and excitement he was feeling right now. Do you know why I'm an here? I heard you slept like the dead for the past 220 years. I do sleep occasionally, but I've never slept past 20 years. It is amazing to see a human sleep so much. Now that you are a loner with no friends, are you expecting me to introduce you to a nice girl? Your knowledge about humans have really broadened. Azel grumbled. He queried the dragon. How did you know I was asleep for a long time? In terms of how humans keep track of time, Carlos Rizesta looked me up a long time ago. He told me about you. He said he'll stay at Laos, and he'll be waiting for you. Him. If you want permission to go to Laos, you can do whatever you want. That is also what I told Carlos Rizesta. What happened to Carlos? That is a question you can answer by going to see him. I know that, but he was in a state where it would have been difficult for him to live amongst humans. That is all I'll say on the subject. He became a being that might explode one day like a volcano. I'm not sure what you are trying to say. You'll find out once you go there yourself. It isn't something that interests me. Moreover, Carlos Rizesta probably wants to reveal everything to you himself. I think so too. Azel let out a sigh. There were too many things he wanted to ask when he met Carlos again. At the same time, he was afraid to meet Carlos. Carlos was his best friend, yet Azel was afraid to meet him again. It was absurd. Azel had been severed from all his relationships from the past, and he was sent far into the future. The fact that Carlos was still here was a precious miracle. Still, he was afraid. After he received his dragon weapons from the Keepers of Prophecy, he met Carlos through a dream that had been arranged by him. Afterwards, Azel was swept up by a foreboding premonition. It felt as if something would come to an end if he met Carlos. It was only a hunch, but Alberton spoke. I know why you are here. Someone told you to visit me. Right. That is correct. Could you tell me who that someone is? I can't. Was it Carlos? You'll have to find that out for yourself. I've also made a promise so I cannot speak about it. Then, Azel took a deep breath before he spoke once again. What are you going to give me? Chapter 166. The Wise Dragon. Part 3. You speak as if you are here to pick up something left behind for you. Am I wrong? There is something. As expected, you are too perceptive. It isn't fun to make fun of you. How can I measure up to Carlos? That's true. Alberton smirked as he spoke. Tell me about what you have learned along the way here. After you woke up, what have you learned about the world that has changed? I need to know the whole story then I'll know what I need to tell you. Him. 
Azel took a brief moment to think about it. What truths had he learned? He knew how the dragon demon king worshippers were reshaping the world. He learned about the truth behind the great tragedy called the Great Darkness. He found out about the Guardian Shadows. He found out about the true identity and mission. He learned about the identity of the demon race. Alberton spoke after he heard Azel's story. Him. It seems you know the most of the story. Then I'll have to tell you the back story. Back story. It is as the demon, Balsirk, had said. There is something fundamentally wrong with the structure of this world. Azel, you told him that you were indifferent to this. In reality, it is an important problem. Why? Even without that factor, the world is. From the perspective of humans, the world is a mess. However, such perspective is limited. You are looking at the problem from within the civilization created by the humanity. You are looking at problems that should be solved between humans. It doesn't matter if these types of problems repeats itself or if it is fixed. Every being that lives as a group forms a unique structure, and problems naturally arises from such arrangements. However, there is still a problem that remains even when we pull back from such micro-perspective. In this land, I made it so that the humans on the outside won't be able to covet. You were attempting to prevent the species of this world from dying out. Didn't you tell me that before? That's right. Humanity rose in power, and this also meant there were losers in this world. The result came about, because the ability to cooperate between humans were an advantage they held over the other species. Of course, there are other factors that led to their rise. It would probably take me four days and four nights to tell you my analysis. However, you aren't a good partner to have such conversations with. I'm sorry for not being much of an intellectual. Azel grumbled. Alberton was a wise dragon, and at the same time, he was a magician that had learned profound magic techniques. Carlos was of the same ilk as the dragon. In the past, Carlos had left Azel behind to have a conversation with the dragon that lasted deep into the night. Alberton laughed. It is more fun to have a conversation with magicians. After I end my conversation with Azel, would the human magician and the dragon mage and girl keep me company? Ah, of course. It will be an honor. Laura and Euron were taken aback, but they accepted Alberton's offer. Him. Where was I? I believe I was talking about why I established my demonic land. After he answered his own question, Alberton continued to speak. There were also losers amongst the humans that were being culled. I thought it was too cruel for a species to be exterminated just because they lost the fight. It would have been great if humans could demonstrate forbearance as beings that possessed wisdom. It would have been great if humans could coexist with them. Unfortunately, this is not the case. I see. It was an undeniable truth. Humans were creatures that wouldn't hesitate to kill those that are different from them. The reason could be geological or cultural in nature. I created a land where the others could continue to live. I created a fence, and I cannot guarantee it will last. Maybe, I'm doing this out of self-gratification, but isn't there some worth if I can create several hundred years of history? Alberton ignored the conflict between the several factions within the forest. The law of the jungle was the foundation, but the forest did have other rules. There were premises that were held above all others. When an outside force tries to invade their land, all conflicts within the factions are forgotten. They had to face their enemies with one heart. A species couldn't be wiped out no matter what. These were the two ironclad laws that were held up by the residents of the Alberton Forest. Alberton spoke. The problem regarding the demon race is also a problem that is outside the borderlines. Do you mind if I go into a fairly long story? Aren't you just going to tell me anyways? That is true. I'm not going to give you the right to refuse. Alberton let out a playful laughter. 5. The demon race occupied a world, they considered to be hell. And they were severed from our world. However, distortions of unknown origin cropped up at various locations of the world. It started happening in the distant past. Every distortion allowed a demon to step into this world. The demons that were able to manifest in this world desperately tried to find someone they could converse with. There was no desire that was greater to them. However, most of their attempts bore no fruit. They were dragged back to hell before they were able to encounter anyone they could converse with. 
How long did they continue these attempts? Finally, a demon that had a slightly different idea appeared. The demons didn't seek to do this initially. When the demons stepped into the real world, there were always no humans around. Moreover, they were on a time limit, so they desperately searched their surrounding. However, there wasn't a trace of human around. The reason was very simple. Dragons were nearby. This was a time where magic still didn't exist. Of course, the dragon slayer's ritual didn't exist either. This was why the relationship between humans and dragons differed in the past. The relationship was one-sided. It was simply a predator and prey relationship. The territory of the dragons were much larger back then, and humans dared not intrude within their habitat. They had been given a miraculous opportunity to meet humans, but they were unable to meet any humans. They were devastated by this fact, so they attempted to communicate with the dragons. It was more of a desperation than curiosity. The demons knew it wouldn't work, but they wanted to take a shot in the dark. However, this attempt resulted in a surprising result. Maybe, it was possible, because they didn't possess a real body. The demons were more active and successful in communicating with the dragons than the humans. It was as if the demons were able to lend their ability to think to the dragons. The dragons had been dull tyrants, yet they surprisingly became lucid. They were able to communicate and converse with the demons. It was a miraculous event for both the dragons and demons. Dragons pined for wisdom, and demons thirsted for conversation. Their wishes were realized. However, the dragons were dull beings. It was as if there was a constant fog within their head. They had many questions when they looked at the world, but the answers to these questions always seemed to slip away. Their thoughts failed to develop under the mental fog. Their frustration with their inability to answer their own questions grew stronger every time they met the human-like beings. These feelings began to mount, and it reached a point where they couldn't hold back their frustration anymore. They went on a rampage. Wait a moment. Euron interrupted the story. Alberton turned to look at him. What is it? If it is as Elder had said. Ah, do you mind if I call you by that title? You may. Yes. So, do dragons have the ability to read mental images of humans? There was a theory amongst magicians that said dragons had the ability to read the mental images of a person. However, this couldn't be confirmed unless one could converse with a dragon. I have the chance to do so right now. As a magician, he was itching to confirm this theory. Alberton let out a bright smile. TH Party was once again surprised by the fact that the dragon's smile could express a variety of emotions. If I'm to be precise, we are able to read the mental images of all living beings. It isn't exclusive to humans. Moreover, it isn't as if I'm reading it, because I want to read it. It just flows in. When humans think hard on something, they send out a mental wave that doesn't dissipate easily. This is why such mental waves come to us even through vast distances. The dragons couldn't look into their mind. A mental wave flowed out of a person when one had a thought. Dragons had the natural ability to read these mental waves. So that is the reason why dragons pine for wisdom. Correct. If a being didn't know what wisdom was, how could one pine for wisdom? It would be a very strange occurrence. Dragons knew what wisdom was. When they received the thoughts that leaked out of humans, they could experience the mental images from the perspective of the person who possessed wisdom. However, this experience lasted only for a moment. Wisdom sparked in the minds of dragons for a brief moment as if a light had been illuminated within their minds. However, this light was extinguished in an instant, and the dragons inevitably developed a want for this light. Euron was astonished. So this is why dragons go on a rampage. Dragons were fundamentally reluctant to enter into human territory. They did so for the possibility of earning wisdom through the dragon slayer's ritual. However, there were times when the dragons went on a rampage in human settlement. No one had known what precipitated these events. Their stress mounts before they explode. Even humans went into fits of rage when their frustration mounted. The call of the wild was strong within the dragon, and this meant that their self-control was weaker than humans. It was very natural for them to lose control. Suddenly, Azel asked a question. When we came here last, didn't Carlos ask about this truth? From what Azel understood, 
Carlos had let the theory of dragons being able to read mental images of humans remain as being a theory. Azel knew Carlos' personality well, so there was no way he wouldn't have asked Alberton about it. Alberton answered him. He did ask the question, but I couldn't give him a clear answer. At that time, I didn't know the answer to Carlos' questions. I see. Alberton had acquired wisdom, but this didn't mean he had learned everything to do with the world. He continuously yearned for knowledge, so he investigated the unknown. Let's continue my story. Alberton continued his story. The dragons and the demons had gained what they had desired. However, their gain was like a daydream. They could wake up from it at any moment. The demon race desperately squeezed out their knowledge. They didn't want this miracle to go to waste. They wanted to make something whole no matter the cost. Fortunately, the dragons felt the same way as them. The two sides were sharing wisdom. And before this miraculous time could come to an end, they came up with an idea. They wanted to extend this time indefinitely. So they took a gambit that would allow both sides to exist in one place. It was a merging of dragons, who possessed a body, and the formless demons. Alberton continued to speak. This was how a being with no parents walked this earth. This being defined himself as being a dragon demon, and he named himself as Atain. This was how the dragon demon race was born. Alberton's story continued. Azel, you are pretty knowledgeable about the first generation of the dragon demon race. I believe so. Most of them had been his enemies. Still, he had shared conversations with numerous first generation dragon demons. Atain was the first dragon demon, but he wasn't the last. Afterwards, more dragon demons appeared on the surface of this world, and the bloodline of the dragon demon was propagated. Atain had known his own name, and he knew the desire of the dragons and the demons that gave rise to his birth. However, he couldn't remember anything else. Amongst the demon race, there were very few that knew the process in which one became a demon. Most demons didn't remember their prior memories. Many demons didn't even realize they had been humans once before. This loss of memories occurred once again in the process of becoming a dragon demon. From the moment Atain walked on this world, he felt a powerful desire to find out more about himself. Not all first-generation dragon demons had been like Atain. Azel was well aware of this fact. For example, Rishu didn't care about the demons or dragons. Anyways, Atain had a fervent desire to learn, so he wandered the world to find clues. As he did so, he became cognizant of his own abilities. He conducted countless experiments to bring out his potential. This resulted in the discipline of magic and dragon arts forming. In the process of transferring this knowledge to humans, Spirit Order was born. He really was the first magician. However, I never expected him to have made the dragon arts and the spirit order too. Azel was astonished. Wasn't Atain really the main character of a mythology? However, Azel didn't deny or become suspicious of this truth. From Azel's perspective, it sounded like the truth. Alberton laughed as he spoke. It seemed he was enjoying this. Chapter 167. The Wise Dragon. Part 4. Of course, this doesn't mean he made everything in this world by himself. He was the founder of magic and the dragon arts, but many new possibilities were pioneered when these disciplines were spread across the world. This holds true when one considers the emergence of the necromancers, the birth of the undead, and the dragon weapons. The dragon weapons aren't the work of Atain. That is very unexpected. When I heard it from Atain, I was a bit surprised too. However, it seems a female dragon demon, who was a Tyne's distant descendant, created the dragon weapon. According to Atain, if we are to go by human history, it was during the era of the Five Star Kingdom. For a brief moment, a silence descended amongst them. Chiron was struck dumb as he asked the question. The Five Star Kingdom, isn't that over 3,000 years ago? It was an era where paper and ink didn't exist. The record of the kingdom was carved in hieroglyphics on a clay tablet. It was so long ago that historians argued with each other as to what it was like to live in that era. Alberton spoke. It was way before I was hatched from my egg. Excuse me, but how old are you? I'm not sure. I'm pretty sure I've been alive for over a thousand years. It was assumed that dragons had a lifespan of several thousand years. 
They were so long-lived that they outlasted nations, yet they rarely stayed in contact with humans and other creatures. This was why it was hard to determine a dragon's age, even if there was a record of their existence. Alberton couldn't remember his life before he gained his wisdom. This was why he didn't know his own age. Anyways, I'm in my early youth compared to Atane. Early youth. Everyone was dumbfounded as they stared at Alberton. Alberton let out a sly laughter as he continued speaking. Anyways, Atine's activities paved the way for other first-generation dragon demons to come into existence. The process had only been a conjecture even for Atane. When he conducted activities all over the world, the demon race naturally paid attention to him. Atane tracked down the information regarding the cause and effect of his own existence. He was finally able to find out about his origin. Opportunities were hard to come by, but when they arose, the demon race tried to recreate what happened in the past. First generation dragon demons appeared from various locations around the world, and their bloodline was propagated. As time passed, humans flourished. Civilizations advanced, and a societal system that was benefit to the many was established. The number of humans continued to grow. The dragon demons and dragon magens continued to grow in number, but the speed couldn't be compared to the humans. However, first-generation dragon demons rarely came into existence. Him, I can see by your expression that you are curious as to why I went into this long story. Frankly, you are right. I am enjoying the true history lesson, but, why did he need to know about all of this? Azel wasn't a seeker of truths. Laura and Chiron were magicians, so their eyes were twinkling. However, Azel just wanted the dragon to get to the point. Anyways, I needed to tell you this story to get to what I want to tell you. In conclusion, the speed at which the first generation dragon demons are forming is increasing in speed. Him, what do you mean by that? Azel, two new first generation dragon demons were born after you visited this place. Moreover, two first generation dragon demons came for a visit to my lands. One of them died in a territorial dispute with a dragon. You are saying at least four first generation dragon demons were born in the past 220 years. Moreover, you are predicting more to be born in the future. That's right. What does it signify? It means the instances where our reality overlapping with hell is increasing in frequency. Him. Azel furrowed her brows. Alberton spoke as if it was a very serious problem, but it didn't tug at Azel's heart. Alberton spoke. You reacted as I had expected. This is why I said this problem is beyond the bounds of human civilization. It seems the magicians of your party already understand what I'm getting at. At his words, Azel turned around to look at Laura and Euron. Both of them had serious expressions on their faces. Azel queried them. What's wrong, Azel, if what the elder said is true? Euron's face crumpled as he spoke. The cause is unknown, but it seems the, hell, where the demons lives is encroaching into our reality. I guess that is the reason why more dragon demons are being born. So what's wrong with that? It is a huge problem. If our current reality is invaded by hell, our world might come to an end. No. What I want to say is. Azel furrowed his brows. Is this something we should be worried about right now? Him. From a macro view, I understand this problem is something all of humanity should know about, and we have to research it. However, this is the same as asking someone that is full about what they are going to do, while there are people starving out there. That is why it doesn't really tug at my interests. You were right, but, Euron was hard pressed to find words. Azel was absolutely correct. The truth revealed by Alberton portended a danger that would bring the end to this world someday in the future. However, it had nothing to do with their fight against the dragon demon king worshippers. Azel let out a sigh. I don't know why you revealed the truth about this future event and the demon race to me. If you delivered such information with the intent of asking me to stop the destruction of the world. I'm only good at cutting down enemies that are in front of me. You shouldn't tell me such news in secret. You should tell the whole world, so they could come up with a solution. At the very least, you acknowledge that it is a problem that has to be solved. Azel answered Alberton's observation. Of course. However, it isn't something that I can solve on demand. 
If someone with the knowledge of this problem works on solving it and asks for my help, I will lend a hand. However, I can only do this after I end the fight that is right in front of me. Maybe, this person arranged you to hear this truth with the intent of getting your help. This person wanted me to become cognizant of this problem. And when I eventually came here asking for your help, he told you to not to turn me away. Is that what you were implying? Maybe, this person arranged such an overly complex plan to deliver such a story to me. I want to give him a piece of my mind for using such an inefficient method. Anyways, I've received the information he wanted me to know. I'll think about helping him when he asks me for help in person. Maybe, he is already close to you. What do you mean by that? It is what it is. Azel glared at Alberton when the dragon spoke his words in a meaningful manner. Alberton let out a sly laughter. In the end, Azel let out a sigh. Do you have any other story I have to hear? I do. What is it? Carlos taught me a technique, and as an exchange, he asked me for a boon. It seems the part I've been waiting for is finally here. What is it? It is the dragon's soul. At his words, Azel's eyes widened. Alberton spoke. Carlos' gift to you is the transfer of the technique that was developed in this land. The party descended the mountain as they left behind Euron and Laura with Alberton. When they entered the town, they saw Sybane teaching the children. After a while, Sybane excused himself from the children, and he approached the party. Did the conversation go well? It was all right. What are you doing? I'm teaching the children about magic. There probably are a lot of magicians here that can do this task instead of you. That is true. However, everyone left their children with me. They wanted me to teach them the basics of magic. I never expected myself to have aptitude for teaching, and it is an enjoyable experience in some ways. Sybane smiled. Azel spoke. I see. However, why don't we walk for a bit? Him. Let's do that. Azel nodded his head as exchanged significant looks with Chiron and Leticia. He had a lot he wanted to talk about with Sybane. He didn't want to know the reasons behind Sybane's departure from the plane of darkness. He didn't want answers to such questions. He just wanted to have a conversation with Sybane. I never expected a day would arrive where I would feel glad to talk to the simpleton prince. From Azel's perspective, Sybane had been a hateful enemy. He left the plane of darkness, but he had stolen the knowledge that was important to humanity prior to leaving the place. He had a hand in spreading the calamity called the Great Darkness. Moreover, he was partially responsible for the slaughter that occurred within the county of Kazakh. When he thought about Sybane's transgressions, it wouldn't be enough to rip him from limb to limb. However, the nostalgia and happiness of meeting someone from his era overshadowed his hostile feelings. This fact baffled him. Sybane asked him a question. Do you mind if I ask what you talked about with Albert and Nim? The world may come to an end in the distant future, so he wanted me to find a solution. However, I'm busy dealing with what is in front of my eyes, so I asked him to find someone that is capable of looking at the long-term view. You must have shared an interesting conversation with him. Also, I'm going to learn the dragon soul before I leave. Dragon soul. Sybane asked in surprise. Were you accepted as a resident of the forest? No. So why would he teach you the dragon soul? I was told that it is a technique that isn't allowed to be leaked outside of the forest. Alberton had given Azel a brief description about the dragon soul. The dragon soul was born about 100 years ago. A resident of the forest had come up with it. Several thousand years had passed since the birth of the dragon weapons, and a new way to use the dragon demon magic was discovered. The dragon soul could be learned only by those possessing powerful dragon demon magic. It was same prerequisite as the dragon weapons. Moreover, a dragon soul and a dragon weapon could not coexist. This was why it was impossible for those possessing dragon weapons to cultivate the dragon soul. The fact that the Duke and Leticia doesn't have a dragon weapon became good fortune for them. Azel had received his original dragon weapons from the Keepers of Prophecy, and he had planned on giving one to Chiron and Leticia. However, he had acquired the technique called the Dragon Soul, so he didn't have to needlessly decrease his battle capabilities. Of course, he put a condition on it. I can pass it to a limited number of people. Initially, 
Alberton put a condition that Azel wouldn't spread the technique beyond his party members. However, Azel tried to negotiate with the dragon. Laura and he already possessed dragon weapons. Moreover, Euron was weak in terms of dragon demon magic. The only ones that could learn the dragon's soul in his party was Chiron and Leticia. He didn't know what Carlos had given up to receive this boon, but there was no way it was worth two people being able to learn the dragon's soul. He wanted to increase the number of people he could teach the dragon's soul to. The negotiation was successful. After Azel left the forest, he received the right to teach the dragon's soul to a maximum of five people. I wonder what was exchanged. It must have been worth it, if Albert and Nim agreed to such a preposterous demand. Dragon Demon King worshippers weakened the power of humans by erasing important knowledge. However, they couldn't carry out such activities within the Alberton forest. This was why the forgotten knowledge regarding the Dragon Slayer's ritual, dragon weapons and other techniques remained intact here. However, Alberton had forbidden such knowledge from being leaked outside. The residents of the forest needed power to stop the humans from encroaching into the Alberton forest. This was why it was decreed that the dragon soul, which was developed in the forest, would never be spread beyond forest. Azel spoke. That's right. He wanted me to learn the dragon soul from the creator of the dragon soul technique. Could you guide me to her? Creator of the dragon soul. Sibane's expression turned peculiar. Chapter 168. The Wise Dragon. Part 5. The Creator of the Dragon Soul. Sibane's expression turned peculiar. Azel was puzzled, so he asked a question. Is it someone I know? I believe so. If Albert and Nim hasn't informed you of it, he probably wants you to meet the person yourself. He probably wouldn't want me to tell you the identity of this person. From my perspective, it is annoying. But since I'm in Alberton's care, I'll have to be patient. I'll overlook it. Azel clicked his tongue. Sibane had burst out laughing at the sight. He asked Azel a question. So could you tell me about my daughter? At his words, Azel became silent for a moment. Instead of answering the question, he asked a question of his own. Why didn't you meet your daughter when you gave her the dragon weapon? I was keeping a promise. Promise. Sibane let out a bitter laugh. When I came here, I was at death's door from the wounds I received from the Guardian Shadows. As a condition for taking me in, Albert and Nim required me to sever all connection with the outside world. The reason was simple. The relationship between the Alberton Forest and the Plain of Darkness was poor. When Atain was alive, there had been a mutual respect between the two sides. After the Dragon Demon War, the Plain of Darkness had invaded the Alberton Forest several times. This was why their relationship was frayed now. If one considered the context of the situation, Alberton had shown great generosity when he accepted one of the key figures in the Plain of Darkness into the forest. Even the act of delivering the Book of Darkness was controversial within the forest. However, Alberton Nim allowed me to do it. Suddenly, he remembered a story he heard from the Count Biorin Michael. He asked the question, around 20 years ago. It was said that a powerful dragon demon fought against the Guardian Shadows within the Rulan Kingdom. Was that you? Did you hear it from the Guardian Shadows? If so, you are correct. I see. It all started from there. The Guardian Shadows relentlessly tracked me down, and in the end, I arrived here. Why did you do it? What do you mean? Why didn't you escape using the help of the Dragon Demon King worshippers? Why did you come here? Sibane shut his mouth. The pursuit of the Guardian Shadows was so dogged that he wasn't able to escape. However, he didn't say this, because he did have another reason for coming here. Soon, he let out a sigh as he spoke. Before I tell you that story, I would like to hear about my daughter. Nibiris is alive and well. She is making good use of the Book of Darkness you gave her. Currently, she is one of the vanguards put forth by the Plane of Darkness. She is in the forefront amongst the younger generation. She used to be in a rivalrous relationship with my comrade, Laura. I see. Aside from that, you won't be happy hearing the rest of my story. I would like you to tell me. There is no reason why you should try to spare my feelings. Since he spoke those words, Azel didn't really need to spare his feelings. Azel felt trepidation as he told the truth. 
All right, I almost died at the hands of your daughter. She almost killed my comrade. Moreover, I almost killed her too. You should thank Laura next time you see her. What do you mean by that? Your daughter's life was in my hands. However, Laura betrayed them, and as a price for your daughter's life. To be precise, everyone present with her was spared, but Laura had to betray them and give up the Vitans chalice to me as a price. If I didn't accept her offer, your daughter would already be dead. If he hadn't, he would have never become comrades with Laura. Azel was sure now that he had made the right decision at the time. Sybane had a complex expression on his face. I see. Moreover, I killed the man assisting your daughter. His name was Joran. Sybane looked at Azel with a surprised expression on his face. Azel spoke. He lamented the fact that he couldn't protect Niberus. He died as he apologized to you. It seemed he was indebted to you, Joran. So that is how he died. Sybane raised his hands to cover his face. His voice held a deep sadness. One could clearly see that there was a deep connection between Sybane and Joran. From Joran's perspective, Sybane had been his savior, who had led him down the correct path in life. Sybane also didn't treat their relationship lightly. Azel just watched as Sybane silently grieved. Azel asked him a question. Do you resent me? I would be lying if I said I didn't. Sybane looked at Azel with sad eyes. There are people, who had given themselves up to despair, yet they decided to put their trust in me. I don't have the right to blame you for anything that happened since I left them. Why did you do it? Azel asked once again. Sybane let out a bitter laugh. As I've said, everyone had given themselves up to despair. For me, my wife's death was the final straw. Even before I reached that point, I shuddered when I saw my surrounding, which was slowly descending into madness. His eyes headed towards the lake. However, he wasn't looking at the calm surface of the lake. He was looking further into the distance. When you killed my father, we suffered an irreparable damage. From the perspective of humanity, the Dragon Demon King's army was the biggest calamity to happen in their history. However, if one looked carefully through the world's history, one could find organizations, who had similar aspirations as the Dragon Demon King's army. If one only focused on their actions, the Demon King's army were like any other army under a king. They just had very high aspirations. A conquering force would usually place the conquered people into a lower class. So why was their actions considered to be out of the ordinary? It wasn't. Whether it was in small scale or large scale, these incidents were common throughout human history. The only difference was the fact that the conqueror wasn't human. The center figure of the Dragon Demon King's army was a Dragon Demon. This particular conquering force had shown overwhelming force and power compared to any other conquering forces from the past. This was why the humans had pushed back fiercely. Their resistance was unprecedented. Basically, if the fact that a Dragon Demon was leading the army was taken out of the equation, the Dragon Demon King's army was like any other armies from human nations. However, the Plane of Darkness thought differently. The poison of madness started to seep into the irreparable wound. At some point, we reached a point where we couldn't turn back. After losing in the Dragon Demon War, they deified Atane, and they clung to the belief that Atane would revive from death. The members of their organization started to turn into religious zealots. The remnant of our defeated army were elite warriors of our kingdom. However, they degenerated into being a dark religious group. They started conducting all kinds of evil acts in the name of Atain. They did it to get ready for the revival of their savior, Atain. Their original creed had been to unite the continent to create a utopian world. Atain's original intent was shattered into pieces. It was nowhere to be seen. If the upper levels of the organization controlled themselves, it might have been a different story. However, the madness affected the upper levels of the organization the most. As Ainsira's sense of self was sucked into the great darkness, the atmosphere worsened. Azel asked the question, didn't you think about stopping that? I tried. However, I didn't have the ability to bring about that change. He was the last remaining child of the Dragon Demon King. However, he had only been a symbol. In reality, he didn't have any true power. I was just put up as a front, so that the others could make use of me. 
I became painfully aware of my shortcomings. I didn't have any political influence. He was a figurehead and proof that the Dragon Demon King's line continued. He had tried to reach a position where he would be able to correct the wrong he saw. He went around the world, and he willingly did dangerous and vile acts. He gathered comrades in the process as he built up the organization. However, the popularity he gained only earned him a spot on the bottom of the power structure. It was twisted. As he worked harder, he was getting farther and farther away from power. The casualties of the Dragon Demon War. No, these beings that were a husk of their prior selves refused to go out into the front line. They sent out the young bloods to fight for them, and the weight of the madness over the organization deepened. If Ainsera was behind him, the situation might have been different. However, Ainsera kept losing her sense of self, so she slowly became disinterested in the culture within the organization. She didn't care about the discord between the various factions. I was tired. I've been tired for over a 100 years. It didn't take that long for us to lose our minds. The truth was that we became crazier as each day passed. Our past couldn't highlight the fact that we've gone mad. Even if he fought to save someone, it was useless. The elders were gripped by the ghost of past glories, and anyone he saved would have been sacrificed by them. He had been in a dilemma where the fundamental problem worsened as he solved the problems in front of him. There was no end to the dilemma, and it wounded Sybane. There were two incidents that drove him to give up on everything. That is, he was about to tell Azel the reasons when he shut his mouth. He had seen Mineral approaching them. She put on a charming smile as she spoke. Instructor Sybane, I'm sorry for intruding in on your conversation. A message was sent to our guest here. A message. The creator of the dragon soul is waiting for him in his abode. He wants our guest to visit him there. He likes to wander around, so if we don't hurry, he might leave on a whim. He seems to be an unpredictable person. All right. After he spoke those words, Azel turned to look at Sybane. I'll hear the rest from you later. Let's do that. I still have some stories I would like to hear from you. All right. Azel left behind Sybane. He followed Mineral towards the creator of the dragon soul. Sybane mumbled to himself as he watched Azel's back move away into the distance. The thing that makes me despair the most. When my father realized that we failed to bring about our ideal world and everyone was falling into despair, he might have put his trust in you. They were deep within the forest. The territory ruled by Alberton was vast. There weren't too many living within the forest, so there were gaps where no faction ruled over the land. Still, the residents of the forest didn't dare to cause too much trouble. Alberton was like holy king to them, and the land he ruled was like their holy land. The creator of the dragon soul lived at the edge. He lived at the, the peak overlooking the eastern shore. Mineral spoke. This isn't really a great place to live, so he only resides here when he had a student. There is a fine town over there, yet he chooses to live in such a place. He must be unsociable. He isn't like that. Mineral shook her head from side to side. He is friendly and informal. Like the other first-generation dragon demons, there was a time he was unapproachable, because of the tumultuous atmosphere around him. But now, a first-generation dragon demons normally have a violent personality. Azel was curious, so he asked the question. He didn't hold first-generation dragon demons in high regards, but the ones he met had disparate personalities. Ragus was an idiot. His idiocy knew no bounds. Atain was unreadable. Then Terra was Rishu. He had be qualities of an innocent beast. Mineral answered him. I haven't met too many first-generation dragon demons. However, from what I've heard from my elders, they receive the nature of dragons quite strongly in the beginning. That is why they are like wild beasts, and many die early from fighting everyone. Him, Azel hadn't known this. Mineral continued to speak. At the very least, he doesn't have that disposition, so you don't have to be worried. He is quite popular with kids. Of course, he is monstrously strict as a teacher. Did you learn from him? I did. Many have tried to learn the dragon soul, yet very few have been able to manifest it. Was it the same for your husband? No, he was my first pupil. It's a love developed between a teacher and a pupil. Isn't it a bit romantic? 
when I first met him. As if she had been waiting for this opportunity, she enthusiastically told Azel about her love life with Havan. She was talking about her own love life. Of course, it gave goosebumps to anyone who heard it. It was an unsightly story for others. However, as he listened to her story, he realized something. Outsiders called this place the demonic lands, but it was still a place where people lived. He made himself somewhat agreeable as he heard her story, and he asked her a question. Is marriage here the same as the humans? Why wouldn't it be? Ah, the only difference is that the divorce rate is higher here. Sir Sybane also remarked on this fact. In the Alberton forest, dragon demons and dragon magians married humans. It wasn't seen as something out of the ordinary. Since each races had different lifespans, it was common to see couples that had an age difference of hundred years. In dating and marriage, people unhesitatingly broke off relations without regret. Of course, outsiders would consider such a culture to be strange. What would have if a being that could live for over 300 years married someone that can only live for less than 100 years? The probability of them staying together was very low. Maybe that was the cause. They became married, but the ritual didn't require them to stay together until death. Also, the start to their marriage differed from outside. There are cases where this isn't true, but we get married when a child is conceived. So you have a child. My son was in the crowd of children you saw earlier. Mineral let out a playful laugh. Azel had a thought as he looked at her face. There is no way she looks like a mother. It might be, because she was a dragon demon. Or maybe it was the unique atmosphere of this place. She wasn't giving off the energy of a mother with a child. Anyways, it seemed marriage here was a promise that they would take care of the child as parents. When the child safely comes of age, they had the choice of keeping the marriage or they could divorce. The choice was up to the individuals. As outsiders, their culture seemed very foreign. However, Azul's party accepted their way of life quite easily. Azel had lived through everything life could throw at him during the Dragon Demon War. Leticia lived at the fringes of society, so regular societal bonds didn't hold much water with her. Chiron also traveled throughout the continent, so he had experienced numerous cultures. The party shared their stories, and they were able to reach their destination before the sun set. I can hear the sound of ocean. The metallic flavor of the ocean was being carried by the wind. One could also hear the faint sound of waves. Their destination was a large cliff that had been carved by the ocean. When they ascended to the top, they caught sight of a hut made out of wood. Then, thank you for coming all this way. A dragon demon male greeted them. It has been a while, master. Mineral gave a respectful greeting, but Azel couldn't follow suit. The dragon demon looked like he was in his MID 20s. His eyes and dragon demon stone was green. On top of his ears, there was a grayish-white horn that looked similar to the horns of a mountain goat. His face was kind, and there was no tension on his face. He also wore loose clothing with no weapon in sight. Then there was the most eye-catching characteristic. He had bluish-white hair color. It was a color that could never develop within humans. Azel knew of only one being that possessed this hair color. When I observed Alberton's attitude, I thought this might be a possibility. It really is you, Rishu. He was Azul's fourth teacher. He was the first generation dragon demon Rishu. The disheveled blue-haired dragon demon named Rishu let out a gentle laugh. He was markedly different from what Azel remembered. It has been a while, Azel. Chapter 169. Advent of Confusion. Part 1. The situation within the continent was quickly deteriorating to the worst it has ever been. In the end, the Bayer's kingdom and the Yellow's kingdom had gone to war. The two armies clashed at the borders, and the Yellow's kingdom achieved victory in the battle. Afterwards, they marched straight towards the capital of the Bayer's kingdom. The army of the Bayer's kingdom counterattacked, and the fight between the two kingdoms continued to this day. The war intensified. Then there was the war between the Udusk Kingdom and the Garan Kingdom. It was seesawing back and forth. While the casualties at the border increased, chaos erupted inside the Udusk Kingdom as the slave revolted. After the Dalan Kingdom's king was poisoned, 
the first prince wanted to settle the succession in an amicable manner. However, the next two people in line of succession was assassinated. The first prince became enraged as he blamed the death on the nobles, who opposed him. In the end, a civil war erupted. Then there was an outbreak of war between the Rulan kingdom, and the Raris kingdom. Also, dragon demon princess Arietta was fighting against the second grand alliance that had appeared at the western border of the Rulan kingdom. It had been a fortnight, yet the fight hadn't ended yet. The sound of battle was ongoing as Arietta opened her eyes. The noise wasn't the reason why she awoke from her sleep. The sound of battle had been ongoing since yesterday night. She had fought from the front as she defended the castle wall. However, she needed rest, so she had changed shifts with the soldiers to get a brief amount of sleep. She was taking a break when the battle was ongoing. It sounded crazy, but that this was a protracted battle. It was something she had to be prepared to do as a warrior. She used a dragon arts technique to force herself into a deep sleep. No one had come to wake her up, yet the reason why she had woken up was simple. The sound of a dragon's cry could be heard. When she realized this fact, Arietta mumbled to herself. It almost sounded like a groan. They mobilized a dragon again. Why is there so many dragons inside this forest? This was already the third dragon that had been mobilized against them by their enemies within the Balan forest. The earth dragon had died after it entered into the dragon slayer's ritual with the Azel. The water dragon had appeared before the second grand dark alliance had made their appearance. It died while attacking the fortress. At present, another dragon had appeared again in front of them. Arietta quickly went outside. Giles, who had been sleeping in the next room, came out of his room. He followed behind her. Giles spoke. Ficon was killed, yet their spirit remained unbroken. Was it because they had kept this dragon hidden as a secret weapon? Maybe. The Second Grand Alliance had been formed around a central figure. It was a mutant orc named Ficon, and Arietta had killed it. However, their enemies had another pivotal figure. Gakan was another mutant orc and it had worked under Ficon as its lieutenant. Before the two of them could reach the castle wall, the dragon's attack broke down part of the wall. The castle wall had already been in rough shape from the battle with the water dragon. They had to fight the second grand alliance without being able to repair the walls, so it didn't stand a chance when another dragon made its appearance. Arietta climbed atop the rubble. It was hard to even breathe within this powerful gale. An enormous dragon stood within the heart of the gale. The dragon possessed dark green scales, and its terrifying eyes looked over the castle wall. She had never seen this type of dragon, yet Arietta instantly knew what it was. Storm dragon. It was a storm dragon. It was able to freely control the power of wind. It was a more difficult opponent than the water dragon that had appeared before at the western border fortress. The water dragon could use its fullest power when it was raining, or there had to be a body of water nearby. The storm dragon wasn't limited by such requirements. The western border guard was using broken down structures to stop the advance of the storm dragon. They shot the ballistas installed on top of the castle walls, and soldiers fired catapults from the inner castle. Magicians kept shooting their spells. The knights either threw spears, or they tried to use chain hooks to tie down the dragon. Arietta asked a question. What about Saiga? He is facing the enemy's detached force. Since they sent out the dragon, their enemies could not directly attack the castle wall. There was no way a dragon would be able to differentiate between allies and enemies in its attack. However, it seemed they weren't willing to bank everything on the dragon. The mutant orc Gakan took a small detached force through harsh terrains, and they were coming at the castle wall in a roundabout way. It was the worst case scenario. Arietta closed her eyes for a brief moment as she thought over the problem. Soon, she made her decision. Sir Giles. Yes. Go help my brother. What? I want you to take all the soldiers here, and I want you to lead him towards the detached force. We won't need our soldiers here. What do you mean by that? Arietta didn't explain herself. She let out a deep breath before she spoke. Oh, dragon that rules over the winds. Her voice was amplified using her magical energy. Her words cut through the winds to reach the ears of the dragon. 
I am the dragon mage and princess of the the Rulan kingdom. I am Arietta. At this point, Giles realized Arietta's intention. He desperately tried to stop Arietta with his words. Princess, you can't. I request the dragon slayer's ritual. However, Giles was a beat too late. Arietta had made an irrevocable decision. The swirling gale died down as silence descended. Everyone, who had been desperately attacking the storm dragon, stopped their attacks in confusion. After a brief moment, the dragon broke the silence as it nodded its head. The dragon slayer's ritual was approved. Arietta spoke. Everyone listen to me. I want you all to stop attacking the dragon, and draw back. I repeat, stop all attacks on the dragon and draw back. If you attack the dragon from this point forward, it would bring a bigger calamity down on us. After speaking those words, Arietta spoke towards the storm dragon. Many do not know the meaning behind this ritual. I request we move this battle to a faraway location. Will you agree to it? She spoke those words to the dragon. She couldn't believe she was trying to talk to a dragon, but at the same time, she was sure her intent would be delivered to it. Soon, the storm dragon nodded its head. Giles spoke to her as Arietta got ready to follow the retreating form of the dragon. Princess, do as I say, Sir Giles. Princess, you are an idiot. You presume much, but I can't deny your words. Maybe, I was influenced too much by a certain person. Arietta remembered the moment when Azel initiated the Dragon Slayer's ritual with the Earth Dragon. He had done it to save her life. As she was tutored under him, she knew she would have to go through the Dragon Slayer's ritual someday, but she never expected it to be now. I wonder if he felt the same as I feel right now. Please pray for me. Arietta let out a dazzling smile as she jumped into the air. Her white hair swirled in the air as she moved away into the distance. Giles watched her with a devastated expression on his face. Then, from afar, the sound of the dragon's roar rang out. Leticia would never forget her first meeting with him. She had been branded as a failure by the Almeric tribe, so she had been sent to the Black Magic Research Facility to be used as a test subject. Each day was like hell for her. She didn't know if it was a god's miracle or a devil's curse, but she was lucky enough to escape from that hell. However, her escape hadn't been smooth at all. The plane of darkness wouldn't let her go easily. Persistent trackers were sent after her, and she had to continuously fight against an endless number of pursuers. She used her mighty strength to defeat her enemies, but she steadily became wounded and tired. In the end, she reached her limit, and she collapsed in front of her pursuers. Rain had been falling on that day. Her pursuers had lost half their party thanks to Leticia. They grinded their teeth from the hatred they felt for her, but they couldn't kill her on the spot. Shit, do we really have to take her back alive? She is a precious test subject, so we have to keep her alive. I've gagged her, but she might try other methods in an attempt to kill herself. Be wary. In the end, she'll be wishing for her death, so let go of your anger. Leticia had been bounded and gagged. She despaired as she listened to their conversation. I came up here thinking there was a landslide. What the hell are you doing? It had been Gissel. He was a dragon demon youth with disheveled black hair, who would become her teacher in the future. He had been residing in a nearby town, and he had heard the thunder-like sound that was created when a part of the mountain was destroyed. He had thought a landslide had occurred, so he came up here to make sure the landslide wouldn't do any harm to the town. Instead, he had found them. Are you a dragon demon? This is a problem. If you back off, we won't raise our hands against you. They were dragon demon worshippers. They weren't tolerant of dragon demons, who weren't within their organization. However, they had given his dragon demon an out. This meant they knew this dragon demon was a formidable opponent. The dragon demon youth kicked away the offer. Somehow, I don't think I'll be able to overlook this situation. Your idle curiosity will result in your life ending prematurely. I'll warn you once again. This isn't any of your business. If you back off, we won't raise our hands against you. Now that you put it that way, I really don't want to back off. The youth was not show any signs of fear. He let out a bright smile. The elite soldiers of the plane of darkness had no choice, but to attack him. You guys are dangerous. It seems you are from the plane of darkness. 
Why do all of you think it is okay to kill people to keep secrets? He slaughtered them before five minutes was up. Leticia had seen it with her own two eyes, yet she was having a hard time believing what had just occurred. He's strong. This batch of pursuers weren't just minor members. These were elite members dispatched from the plane of darkness. However, they all perished without being able to ham a single hair on this youth's body. Are you okay? I don't know why they were pursuing you. However, since I know who they are, I'm sure they were up to no good. You probably were not at fault. Let's go to my dwelling for now. You are. Ah, I forgot to introduce myself. My name is Gissel. What is your name, Miss? Leticia. This was the first meeting between Gissel and Leticia. Gissel took Leticia to his dwelling, and he treated her. She didn't know what he did, but after that day, no one was able to track her down. In hindsight, he probably manipulated her tracks to send her pursuers on a wild goose chase. It took a long time for Leticia to open her heart to him. Her life had been messed up from the start. She had been born to be used as an exceptional tool, yet she had been branded as a defective product. She became a test subject that experienced living hell. It would have been stranger if she had a normal personality. Gissel was the first person to treat her as a person. He treated her as a person, and he taught her everything about how to live as an individual. As she lived with him, Leticia was able to laugh at others, and at times, she was able to tell terrible jokes. You graduate today, Leticia. You'll be fine on your own. After two years, Gissel allowed her to stand on her own two feet. It wasn't something that was abruptly sprung on her. Gissel had made it clear in the beginning that he wouldn't stay in this place for long. He always told her that there would come a day when he would have to leave. He had lived here for two years, because of Leticia. Leticia thought Gissel was cold-hearted for leaving her behind, but she bid him farewell without making much of a fuss. She didn't make a fuss not because she didn't love Gissel. As she lived with him, she had found herself. However, at the same time, her rage and hatred continued to burn in the corner of her heart. She couldn't forget it. She wanted to fight the dragon demon king worshippers throughout her life. She knew it wasn't the right way to live life, but she couldn't give up on the emotions that was etched into her soul. I don't have proof that this will happen, but. Gissel let out a bashful smile as he spoke. I have hunched that I will meet you once again in this life, Leticia. After seven years had passed, his hunch was proven to be true. It was realized in an unexpected fashion. Chapter 170. Advent of Confusion. Part 2. Gissel. Leticia was struck dumb as she looked at the dragon demon in front of her. She was aware that he had the face of her teacher. She knew it was him. At the same time, it felt as if she didn't know this person at all. The reason being, why did you dye your hair into such a strange color? Her teacher hadn't possessed bright blue hair color before. He would have been at the center of attention wherever he went if he had possessed such hair color. Aside from that, he hadn't changed much from what she remembered from her memories. He had already reached adulthood, so his appearance hadn't changed or aged. It hadn't been long enough for such changes to take place. Jesel smirked. You are still the same, Leticia. I didn't dye my hair. This is my original hair color. My hair was dyed when it was black. Azel queried in surprise when he heard their conversation. So Leticia's teacher Jisel was you, Rishu. That is correct. I thought it might be a possibility, but I was told you had different hair color, and your reservoir of dragon demon magic was small. That is why I abandoned such thoughts. My hair color draws too much attention outside. That is why I dyed it black. Also, it isn't too hard to hide one's dragon demon magic. It isn't too hard. We aren't talking about someone else, right? We are talking about you. Azel put on an expression as if he had heard something really strange. Jisel. No. Rishu laughed. It has been over 220 years. How can I be the same as before? You did change a lot. First, you did age a lot. Isn't it normal to say you grew up a lot? I'm far from being old. Rishu grumbled. In Azel's memories, Rishu had looked as if he was in his mid-teens. He looked to be in in his mid-twenties right now. At the time, he was like a rude brat, 
who didn't know that the world was really dangerous. Of course, in the past, Rishu was considered to be someone that possessed great power. However, that had only been true in outward appearance. The current Rishu had not only grown up, but his demeanor had changed a lot. His sharp eyes had softened. There was an air of calmness, and he looked comfortable in his own skin. His dragon demon magic used to have a murderous and violent intent. There was a calmness to his energy now. He now understood why Leticia was unable to recognize how monstrous his dragon demon magic was. You've become scary, Rishu. That point made him shiver. Rishu was formed from a unification between a dragon and a demon. He possessed no parents, and he had been on top of the food chain as soon as he walked on the surface of this world. Didn't his current demeanor mean that Rishu had obtained techniques that allowed him to use his power in a rational manner? He even developed the dragon soul. There hadn't been a technique that opened up so many possibilities like this since the dragon weapons were created several thousand years ago. Maybe, Rishu was stronger than Azel, who had recovered his dragon weapons. Rishu looked intently at Azel and Leticia before he spoke. I knew we would see each other again, but this is quite surprising. It's a happy coincidence to meet you, Leticia. However, Azel's presence does make me wonder if I'm dreaming or not. Were you aware that I had fallen asleep? I did. Albert and Nim knew about it too, right? He did. It seems we have a lot to discuss. Before we do that, there is something we have to do. What is it? We have to build a house. Everyone was at a loss for words. Rishu shrugged his shoulders. I heard you wanted me to teach you about the dragon soul. It isn't something that can be done in a day or two. It is impossible for four people to sleep in my hut. The town isn't that far away from here. Can't we just travel back and forth? It isn't a bad idea if we are trying to strengthen your physical fitness, but it won't be possible. There are days where the training will put you in a state where you won't be able to return. Rishu spoke with a bright smile, but his words implied that their training would be very brutal. You can travel back and forth on days when you are able to. However, we should build a temporary shelter. Let's converse as we build the house. You know how to build a house. I built this hut. As I traveled around the world, I picked up on how to be a carpenter. I really can't see you as a carpenter. The current Rishu was radically different from the one Azel knew. What kind of life did he live during Azel's hibernation? Rishu laughed as he spoke. Azel, your words made me into what I am right now. What do you mean? I'm a bit disappointed that you don't remember it. You told me understand what it is to be human. Ah, Azel finally remembered the past event. After losing to Atain, Rishu had been at death's door. Rishu asked what he had to do to become as strong as Azel. At the time, Azel told him to understand what it is to be human. Azel never expected him to remember his words after all that time. Rishu spoke with a soft light in his eyes. I followed your words. I approached and got to know various humans. In the process of understanding them, I fell in love with them. They were so small and weak that my heart ached. I couldn't help but love them. Rishu placed a hand on his chest, and he gave himself up to his recollection. As Rishu spoke, Azel tried to merge the memory of Rishu he had known, and the figure named Jissel, who was described to him by Leticia. Jissel was completely different from the Rishu from his memories. However, what if it was as Rishu had said? Was this change the result of Rishu taking his advice and approaching the humans? It took you a very long time to return. During that time, I lived amongst the humans. At times, I lived amongst them as a dragon demon. I also lived amongst them disguised as humans. I protected, nurture, loved, fought and killed humans. There was some contradictions in his words, but Azel knew what Rishu was trying to convey with his words. It was hard to love humans, yet they were easy to hate. If he was able to find values that made humans worth loving, it would have been easy for him to find reason to hate them. Humans killed other humans. As a dragon demon, would it have been strange for him to be able to separate the humans he loved and wanted to protect with the ones he wanted to kill? Rishu continued to speak. I've experienced much happiness and joy. At the same time, I experience an equal amount of heartache and pain. 
The ones that shouldn't be sick got sick, and the ones that shouldn't have been killed got killed. These were all done by the hands of humans. How much tragedy had he seen in the past 200 years as he wandered the world? After the Dragon Demon War ended, the world had been overflowing with tragedies. The absolute threat called the Dragon Demon King's army was gone, but that didn't mean everyone could live a happily ever after. Still, Azel was able to experience a brief period of peace. Even as he was dying from a Tyne's curse, he knew he had fought for a worthy cause. His actions resulted in a lot of people finding their happiness. He was able to experience this when he ruled over the county of Kazakh. However, Rishu had seen many darkness that Azel hadn't been able to witness. These darkness didn't go away, because the war was over. Still, humans shone within this darkness. The dragon soul arose from such experiences. I hope I can repay some of what I gained from you with this. Recompense. I never expected to hear such words from you. Do you think it would be fun to live the same way in an unchanging world? We have no idea what will happen the next day, so we have to enthusiastically live our lives. Rishu laughed as he spoke those words. When he saw Rishu's laughter, Azel perceived that a lot of time had passed. It had been a while since he had such a feeling. Rishu had been like simple beast, but enough time had passed for the first generation dragon demon to become a mature adult. Leticia quickly took control of her shock, and she calmed down. It didn't matter what occurred in front of her. She was used to focusing on the reality right of her eyes. She was able to do this, because she had experienced pain at the bottom of hell. Jissel. No. Would you prefer to be called Rishu? I don't care either way. I'm used to being called by various names. That means you used aliases aside from Jissel as you wandered the world. Didn't you do the same? I did. If you were to choose a real name, what would it be? It is Rishu. Then I'll call you by Rishu. The Jissel I remember didn't have such an eye-catching head. You don't like the color of my hair. Everyone tells me it is pretty. They are jealous of my hair color. It doesn't matter if it is pretty or unsightly. Leticia furrowed her brows. Your hair color is radically different from what I remember. That is why I find your outer appearance to be strangely objectionable. Him. If it is bothering you, do you want me to dye my hair black? It's all right. I'll probably get used to it the more I see it. It seems that part about you remain the same. How have you been? I never expected you to show up with Azel. I was surprised. I met him while I was killing the dragon demon king worshippers. So, Leticia spoke about what happened during the seven years after they parted. There wasn't much to talk about. Before she met Euron, she had traveled to various regions around the continent to fight dragon demon king worshippers. Occasionally, she was mistaken as a dragon demon king worshippers, so she was chased by the guardian shadows. She healed herself in hiding when she received injuries from battle. Then there was the very brief periods of time she set aside for training. She had lived a very dreary life. This was why she had much more to talk about when she talked about Euron, Azel, Chiron and Laura even though they had been comrades for only a brief amount of time. Rishu let out a gentle smile after he heard her story. You've met some good comrades, Leticia. Him. Leticia had an awkward expression on her face. Good comrades. From the time she gained independence from Rishu to the fight against the dragon demon king worshippers, she had been alone for a long time. Occasionally, she did fight alongside others, but she never became colleagues with anyone else. This was why the concept of partnering with outs for foreign to her. Currently, she had opened her heart, and she traveled with them. Sometimes it did feel like a dream. It was as if she was seeing herself from a distance. Rishu asked her a question. It seems you've gotten better. You are hurt yet you are able to keep your dragon demon magic calm and ordered. Did Azel teach you a lot of things? It isn't as if I hadn't learned nothing. Azel always had a knack for teaching others. He's able to learn everything easily. Yet he has a talent for breaking down a theories in a logical manner. You guys were each other's teacher. That's right. Of course. If we considered the content of what we learned, I learned more from him. In truth, I wasn't at a point in my life where I was capable of teaching someone else. Rishu let out a bitter laugh. 
At the time when they taught each other, he had really been like a beast. He had taught Hazel about the dragon's power, but it was hardly a proper instruction. Leticia became surprised. I can't imagine it. I've never seen anyone be more patient in teaching others than you. It didn't matter if one student was good at studying or not. The most important qualities of an instructor was patience and an ability to stay calm. From what Leticia had observed, Rishu had excelled in those departments. It didn't matter if he was teaching Leticia or the village children. Rishu had never expressed any annoyance, and he had taught them with patience. Chapter 171. Advent of Confusion. Part 3. Rishu let out an embarrassed laughter. I learned that from Azel too. I wasn't a good teacher, and I wasn't a good student either. From the moment I set foot on this world, I was strong. I could do whatever I wanted. This might be why I hated studying subjects that had anything to do with logic. Of course, I was terrible at explaining what I knew to others. When Rishu thought back on the words he had spoken out loud, he had a hard time deciphering what he had been trying to say. If a bird with wings asked a flightless being to teach one how to fly, what would the answer sound like? He regurgitated concepts when Azel had no basis for understanding it. Of course, his explanation had sounded nonsensical. Still, Azel was like a person sifting through trash to find treasures. Azel had gathered pieces of what he had said to create meaningful words. I knew everything at an instinctual, but when someone else. No, I couldn't even explain what I knew, yet this man was coming up with precise explanations. Even I couldn't help but marvel at it. Basically, he made a brute into a person. That's right. To be precise, he made me want to become a person. At the time, Rishu had been satisfied by what he was. He had been born as a powerful being, and he could easily acquire whatever he wanted. However, at the time, he had met Azel. Azel had been born weak, yet he had exceeded those that were born into power. Azel had reached a higher state than him. Rishu was able to realize his shortcomings, and the desire to become a better existence appeared. My desire for wanting to become stronger started when I was defeated by Atain. However, I wanted to become a better person when. It was thanks to Azel. Azel had taught Rishu many things, and he left behind a present that would become guide his life. Understand the humans. Leticia, I met you, because I had heard those words. You followed my words for the past 200 years, and you lived amongst the humans. At first, that was my motive. However, you can say it is my way of life now. It is a long time even for me, but the time passed by so quickly. It didn't seem like a lot of time to him, but babies born not too long ago started to crawl. Then the children grew to walk, talk, cry and laugh. They quickly grew up. I couldn't help, but marvel at the process. I saw it countless times, and I should have been tired of watching it. Maybe, it was because I wasn't born under the protection of parents. I didn't grow up under such an environment. No, it isn't normal for one to be self-aware at birth. This is true for when one is a baby. Still, one's first experience becomes stamped into one's basic instincts. Even if one can't remember it, it is imprinted somewhere in one's soul. I don't have what the humans had. To be precise, I would also include other dragon demons and dragon magians into the same group. I wonder if that is what separates us. I'm sure this is an experience unique to the first generation dragon demons. Ah, I'm speaking about this as if it is common knowledge. Have you heard about this, Azel? I heard about it. Azel said you possessed the most dragon demon magic amongst the first generation dragon demons. In many ways, I feel duped. I wasn't really trying to be deceptive towards you. It doesn't matter. In the past, I knew you didn't tell me every minute detail of your past. It doesn't matter who you are. I learned many things from you. The fact that I owe you a lot remains unchanged. When you put it that way, I am thankful and embarrassed. Rishu let out an embarrassed laughter. He scratched his cheeks. As she observed him, Leticia asked Rishu a question. It seems there are infinite variety even amongst the first generation dragon demons. This was true about Ragus and Almeric, but. Ah, you did say you met those two. 
How is it? Regus was a completely crazy and idiotic battle fiend. Almeric was. Him. He was like a mountain hermit that lived a full life, but he was horrifyingly strong. After Azel keeled over, the four of us tried to attack him. We lost without being able to do anything. Him. Could you give me a more detailed account? When Rishu wondered about it, Leticia went over what she had experienced. After hearing everything, Rishu tilted his head in puzzlement. From what I heard about Almeric from Azel, he didn't have such a personality. Azel also said that his personality had become markedly different. I'm not well acquainted with them. If Azel says it is so, he's probably right. I heard you fought with Atain, yet you aren't acquainted with Regus and Almeric. When I fought Atain, it occurred within this forest. At the time, he only brought Ornsaurus. When I left this forest to roam the world, the Dragon Demon War had ended. This was why I never became acquainted with them. Ah, I see. Atain was. He was quite the entertaining fellow. Him. Leticia furrowed her brows. Rishu continued to speak. His way of thinking was a bit outrageous. Outrageous. Normally, when one encounters a problem, one usually chooses between two choices. It is to either solve the problem or avoid the problem. That's right. However, Atain wasn't like that. After he solved the problem with his ability, it didn't end there. He would sit in front of the problem to come up with other ways he could use to solve the problem, then he would come up with methods that could be used by others to solve the same problem. The former sounds reasonable, but the latter. It does sound strange. It doesn't end there. Afterwards, he investigates the problem itself. Why did the problem arise? Is there some way that would ensure that this problem never arises? He would methodically analyze the problem, and at each stage of the analysis, he would come up with various methods he and the others could use to stop the problem from arising. He would continuously find subjects that he would become engrossed in. Him. It was clear that Atain was an eccentric figure. Leticia asked a question. It seems first-generation dragon demons are powerful. I experienced their might when we came across Regus and Almeric. They were really strong. Was it the same for the dragon demon king Atain? Him. It is impossible to compare Atain to the two of them. He was that strong. No. I misspoke. I meant Atain wasn't strong only because he was a first-generation dragon demon. In truth, this might also be true of Regus and Almeric. What do you mean? After the first generation dragon demons started appearing in this world, they all possessed massive amount of power. However, there are only few instances where a first generation dragon demon was able to transcend one's lifespan like Atain and the dragon demon generals. They transcended their lifespan. Those words. Are you saying that not all first generation dragon demons live so long? Yes. Unless one gets murdered, dragon demons live longer than the dragon magians. However, not all of them are able to live as long as Atain and the dragon demon generals. There's also the fact that they were the first, so there is a difference. Then there is the, the temperament of the dragons. They are similar to the dragons before they go through the dragon slayer's ritual in that they are aggressive. This is why they die early on. Still, first generation dragon demons are overwhelmingly powerful, so why would they die so easily? You can't see Regus and Almeric as the standard. Your party can handle normal first-generation dragon demons as if they are kids. Is that really true? Leticia's eyes widened. This was completely different from what she had perceived to be true. Rishu let out a bitter laugh. It is true that the first-generation dragon demons are born with much more potential. There aren't any beings in this world that are born with as much dragon demon magic as them. However, Let's us say a first generation dragon demon was born with twice the dragon demon magic you have right now, Leticia. Even that much sounds amazing. Leticia was a dragon magian, but she had been a test subject born to become the heir to Almeric. Her potential was excellent. Moreover, she experienced a unification with a demon, so her dragon demon magic was better than most dragon magians. That is why twice the amount of her dragon demon magic was an incredible amount. However, what if the first generation dragon demon knew no dragon arts? How strong would he be? I see. So that is what you meant. Of course, 
It would be difficult to find an adversary in nature that would be able to rival them. They could rip apart humans with their bare hands, and their physical capabilities were so overwhelming that beasts couldn't track their movements. However, one had to go through a learning process to fully utilize one's dragon demon magic. Even if they didn't have techniques that maximized their power through magic techniques or dragon arts, the dragon demons had the natural ability to cause fire or wind to manifest. Still, one had to establish how to best use these powers through experience. Beasts grew up to be crafty hunters, but many died in the maturation process. Even after they are fully grown, a single mistake could cause the beast's death. The life of a first generation was like that. They are strong, but they are much weaker than a dragon. Moreover, dragons are protected by their parents until they mature. If we take that point into consideration, it is harder for the first generation dragon demons to survive. On top of that, first generation dragon demons rarely form groups. They work alone, and that also decreases their chances of survival. Even if they possessed strength and intelligence, they were like beasts trying to survive in nature. They had to live the life of an independent adult beast. This was why many died in territorial battles. They often succumbed to starvation and fatigue. Of course, the speed at which they improve their abilities is incredibly fast. Still, the upper limits of their natural ability is clear compared to those that learned the dragon arts or magic. If that is true, Leticia furrowed her brows. From what Azel had said, he said you were incredibly powerful from the very first time he met you. Were you just lucky? Or were you somehow special? It is both. Rishu let out a bitter laugh. According to Atane, I was probably born with the largest amount of power amongst the first generation dragon demons. This was why I had no natural enemies, and even before I learned techniques from Azel, I was able to win fights against dragons for territories. Basically, he had been stronger than a dragon when he hadn't learned magic or the dragon arts. He really was someone that possessed a ridiculous amount of potential. However, it isn't as if all first generation dragon demons are powerful. You should look at the first generation dragon demons that were born in this forest. The only that is special is probably Hanarosa. Hanarosa. I've heard that name earlier. He is in charge of the eastern edge of the forest. He came into being around 120 years ago. He is powerful, yet he is an introvert. This was why it was easy to rope him to our side. Somehow, it feels as if the image I held of the first generation dragon demons are being smashed into pieces. It'll be destroyed further in the future. You'll have the chance to meet other first generation dragon demons in this forest. I see. Let me ask you one question. When he nodded his head, Leticia's face hardened into a serious expression. Rishu nodded his head. Speak. If I learn the dragon soul from you, will I be able to go toe to toe with Ragus and Almeric? Him. Rishu furrowed his brows. Then he tilted his head. From your explanation, I can get a rough idea of their battle capabilities. It'll be impossible in the short term. I see. I'm talking about the immediate future. It is impossible for you to go toe to toe with them in terms of strength. If all of you had the highest ranked dragon weapon like the Vitten's Chalice, it would still be a tall task. However, the story might change depending on what type of abilities you guys can earn through the Dragon Soul. Chapter 172. Advent of Confusion. Part 4. Arietta vacantly stared up at the gloomy sky. She had no idea how long she had been standing there like that. She suddenly started hearing sounds, and she started to wake up from the static state she had been in. Dragon Demon. Can't believe. The information. Dragon Demon Princess. Words that had meaning were interspersed between the sounds, and the words burrowed into her consciousness. At the same time, her senses started to recover. It was as if a painting that had been neglected was brought out into the light. Her world had been black and white, but color was returning. Her sense of smell, sound and touch came back to life once again. Shapes around her came into focus. Arietta smelled the thick scent of blood. It was enough to make her nose go numb. There was an enormous amount of blood around her, and her body was dyed red with it. Moreover, she realized she was holding something in her hands. 
Arietta became startled when she realized she was holding onto a corpse of a dragon magian with a broken neck. Did I fight with the enemy? She moved her body in a flash. Her sword blocked the halberd that was being swung at her back. The magical energy of the weapons repulsed each other. It created a white spark. Enemies. She didn't know what was going on, but her enemies were targeting her. When she realized this fact, her body reacted. She yelled as she pushed away her enemies with surprising strength. Shake free and roar. Power of the dragon. She spoke a cantrip infused with the power of the dragon arts. A storm of mental waves hit her enemies. While her enemies staggered, Arietta assessed the identity of her enemies. Dragon Demon King worshippers. There are three more to go. At the same time, the memories leading up to her trance started to return. She had gone through with the Dragon Slayer's ritual with the Storm Dragon. It had felt like the longest fight of her life. The fight felt like it lasted an eternity. In the end, she was able to defeat the dragon, and she had taken the dragon's power. I see. I've won. Even she was having a hard time believing it, but she had won against a dragon in a one-on-one -on -one battle. This was why she was overflowing with energy. She felt as if she would be able to win against another dragon right now. Shit. This is completely different from our intelligence. We were told the three of us would be able to capture her. The Dragon Demon King worshippers were taken aback. They had mobilized the Storm Dragon to bring down the Western Border Fortress, yet it was neutralized through the Dragon Slayer's ritual. This was why they decided to assassinate Arietta. Their plan was to put the continent into a state of confusion, and the Western Border Fortress had to fall for this plan to work. Arietta had strayed far from the fortress to conduct the Dragon Slayer's ritual. It was a golden opportunity for them to kill Arietta. The only problem right now was the fact that Arietta was drastically stronger than what their intel had suggested. The intel was considered to be relatively fresh, since they had assessed her capabilities when they tried to capture her at the Balin Forest. However, Arietta had become incomparably more stronger after she received instruction from Azel at the Dukedom of Tarantos. From the beginning, she possessed great potential for a dragon magian. Even Chiron had acknowledged her talent. Moreover, she had trained her basic foundation ad nauseum. This was why she was able to succeed in the Dragon Slayer's ritual after learning the secret techniques from Azel. It is hardly necessary to say this, but I'll have to thank Azel again. Arietta let out a smile. This caused the Dragon Demon King worshippers to grind their teeth. Is this the doing of the great sinner Azel Kazark? It wasn't enough that he caused harm to the king. Now he is interfering with our great work. At his words, Arietta's expression turned peculiar. She queried them. Azel Kazark, what are you talking about? Don't play innocent with me, dragon demon princess. The Azel you were with confirmed that he is the Azel Kazark. It has been verified. For a brief moment, Arietta looked at them in a dumbfounded manner. Are you saying Azel is the hero Azel Kazark? In the past, Azel had said the same thing to her. At the time, she had a hard time believing his assertion. Still, if she went over the memories she had with him, it didn't feel implausible either. So he really was telling the truth. Ha ha ha. This is quite humorous. I unknowingly received instructions from the legendary hero. Arietta had queried Azel about this subject several times. She remembered a particular conversation she had with him. These are precious techniques, yet you are teaching it to me for no cost. Are you sure about this? I'm not sure why you are doing this. It's all right. However, I want you to promise me one thing. Ah, of course. I won't pass on these techniques to anyone. I want the opposite. I don't want you to hesitate in sharing it with everyone. I want you to gather as many people under you. And you have to wake them up to the reality of this era. That is the only cost I want from you, princess. Why, Sir Azel, why are you going so far? How can you gift everyone your techniques without any reservation? We need power to confront the darkness that will arrive once again. Our enemies put enormous effort over time to manipulate the history of humanity, and our true powers were stolen from us. Our fighting techniques should have evolved as time passed after the Dragon Demon War. However, we lost the essence of our fighting techniques. 
we have regressed. If those that still possess these lost techniques rise up once again, we will be faced with a bigger calamity than the Dragon Demon War. At times he had spoken about the Dragon Demon War as if he had been there. He talked about how the warriors of this era were inferior in quality. The martial artists of this generation wasn't lacking in resolve or talent. They had been castrated in terms of techniques, and the limitation it caused was frightening. She had been taught by Azel as he pointed out these problems. He broke down his techniques down to the basics, so she would be able to teach it to others. He had been meticulous in his teachings. Arietta hadn't forgotten the promise she had made to Azel. She didn't hesitate to teach the people under her. She didn't hold anything back. It was an era where the essence of dragon arts and the spirit order had been assaulted by the dragon demon king worshippers. The forces under Arietta, Saiga and the Dukedom of Tarantos could be called the strongest force in the human realm right now. It would have been better if I knew this earlier. I am envious of my teacher. As she mumbled those words, Arietta used instantaneous movement to appear behind the dragon demon king worshippers. The dragon mage and magician shot a thunderbolt towards her. However, the attack was in vain. The thunderbolt passed through empty air. It had been her clone. From the opposite side, Arietta attacked in a fearsome manner. She clashed with the warrior wielding a halberd. She glared at him as she yelled out loud. Shake free and roar. Power of the dragon. Her cantrip turned into a storm of mental waves. The magician, who had been trying to support the warrior, flinched immediately. However, the two warriors gritted their teeth as they defended their mind. They were taught battle tactics and secret techniques from the warrior training facility within the plane of darkness. Do you think that will work a second time? One of the warrior charged forward in a frontal attack. However, his eyes widened before he could finish his words. Arietta had been clashing with the warrior holding the halberd, but in a flash, she passed by the halberd wielding warrior to cut down the other warrior. Shit! Did she mess with my senses? The storm of mental waves was abate. In response to the harsh storm of mental waves, the two warriors had created a stiff mental wall. However, the structure of this mental wall was simple. Arietta used this floor to slightly tweak their senses. The information that was transferred from their eyes to their brain was delayed by a beat. It allowed her to easily slice through the defense. Oh evil darkness, rend apart. She used instantaneous movement to flip the field then she brought down her sword from up high. A torrent of light came pouring out following the trajectory of her sword. The scream was drowned out by the sound of the explosion. Unfortunately, the warrior with the halberd pierced through the explosion. The magician had been killed, because his reaction had been too slow. The warrior had been able to defend against the attack. However, Arietta snorted when she saw this. The warrior was immediately puzzled by why Arietta hadn't followed up with an attack. Soon, he found out the reason why. Someone else had ambushed him from behind. It was a young knight with curly blonde hair and a baby face. It was Giles Vince. When he realized the Dragon Slayer's ritual was over, he had sought out Arietta. Princess. I'm sorry for being late, you could have taken a little more time to get here, and it wouldn't have mattered. You should just scold me instead. Giles let out a bitter laugh as he moved in to dispatch the warrior wielding a halberd. Giles spoke. You are human. Why does that matter? I'm not obligated to tell you anything. The halberd wielding warrior recoiled in fright. He had suddenly heard a voice emanating from right next to him. He turned his head in surprise to look at the source of the voice. Oh no. However, no one was there. Giles used this opening to get inside his guard. A halberd had the advantage of unleashing devastating attacks with its long reach. However, the warrior had fallen for Giles's trick, and it had created an opening. Giles had closed the distance, and the halberd's advantage had been neutralized. You are merely an unbeliever. All Dragon Demon King worshippers were self-conceited. These unbelievers do not know the forgotten techniques. They don't stand a chance against me. Up until now, the Dragon Demon King worshippers had always been superior in terms of techniques compared to their opponents. The unbelievers had lost the techniques dealing with the mind and the senses, so how could they compete with him? 
However, the dragon demon king worshipper didn't have this advantage over Giles. Giles took advantage of the warrior's weak spot, and he had neutralized the only advantage the warrior had over Giles. He had neutralized the weapon's long reach. The halberd-wielding warrior was barely able to block the sword strikes that were coming at him like a storm. He glared at Giles. The warrior's mental wave had been cultivated into being as sharp as a blade, and it impacted on Giles's mind barrier. If he could mess with Giles's senses, he believed he could turn the table. When he put on a smile of satisfaction, he was hit with a sharp headache. You've already suffered under the princess attack. Do you really think I'm an idiot that knows nothing? This isn't just self-conceit. You are the idiot. When the warrior attacked what he assumed to be a weak point in the mental barrier, Giles sprung a trap he had prepared. When the mental wave hit the mental barrier, a counterattack immobilized the halberd-wielding warrior for a brief moment. Giles separated the warrior's head from his body. After defeating his enemy, Giles took a knee to pay his respects to Arietta. I congratulate you for defeating the dragon. I still can't believe I was able to succeed. Even after seeing it with my own eyes, I'm also having a hard time believing in it. At Giles's words, Arietta let out a bright smile. The dragon's corpse was lying amidst the broken trees. Its neck had been torn away, and an enormous amount of blood had poured out. The surrounding region was dyed red with blood, and half of Arietta's body was soaked in blood. It was a ghastly sight. Arietta asked him a question. How's the situation at the fortress? It is all wrapped up. The prince was able to kill the leader. I see. The remaining enemy force might rally and attack the fortress. Let us return. What are you going to do with the dragon's corpse? We'll have to return for now, and we'll bring back enough manpower to take the corpse back with us. We've already killed the two mutant orcs and the dragon demon king worshippers that worked secretly behind the scene. However, that doesn't mean there aren't any more left. We should be on our guard. Understood. Also, Arietta stopped speaking for a brief moment, and she broke out in sudden uncontrollable laughter. Giles looked at her in puzzlement. She laughed as she spoke in a playful manner. These guys said that Sir Azel is Azel Kazark. What? Last time, he spoke about it as if it was a joke, but it seems he was telling the truth. If I tell Anora this fact, I wonder what expression she would make. The situation at the fortress had been precarious, so she had evacuated Anora to the back. Arietta was looking forward to telling her this truth. Suddenly, Giles spoke. If it's Ms. Anora, she will probably be shocked by something else. What do you mean? She'll probably faint at how you look right now, princess. Him. Is it that bad? This might sound rude, but it would be best if you washed yourself once with water. I'll do so. However, Sir Giles. Yes. You don't seem too surprised. Isn't it the same for Princess? Yes. It is surprising how easily I accepted this truth. It might be the same for Muzanora. That won't be any fun. Do you think Saiga will be surprised? I believe so. The two shared conspiratorial laughter. Chapter 173. Another Enemy. Part 1. The essence of spirit order had everything to do with the mastery over one's mind. It boosted the mind, and one could control one's senses according to one's will. In turn, the mind and senses were expanded using the mental waves. If one limited the comparison to the manipulation of the mind, an archmage at the zenith of his magical power couldn't come close to a high-ranking spirit order practitioner. In martial arts, one trained one's body first. Techniques were cultivated then the mind was trained. However, spirit order was the opposite. The training of one's mind allowed one to gain control of one's magical energy. This was used to cultivate techniques, and the body was trained last. The techniques used to control the mind was the essence of the spirit order. It was inevitable that one of the most important training method was meditation. When one meditated, Spirit order allowed one to observe one's inner workings as if one was reading the palm of one's hand. One could find out the rhythm of one's heartbeat, and one could observe how one's circulation changed depending on the rhythm of one's heart. Then there were the rings of life surrounding the heart. The rings of life created magical energy as it pulsed with the heart. One could observe the pattern in which magical energy was spread throughout the body. 
The pulsing of the heart created the magical energy, and the magical energy saturated one's energy pulse before it was spread outside of one's body. At the same time, one's senses expanded. Even as one closes one's eyes to monitor the inner working of one's body, one was able to meticulously observe one's surrounding. The sound of dew falling on top of the grass could be heard. His senses extended beyond it. It was as if his senses were following the blowing winds. Further and further. In the next moment, Azel opened his eyes from several hundred distance away. Smoke emanated from his entire body. That wasn't the only thing that happened. From behind Azel, the sound of an explosion rang out as strong winds swirled around him. The beautiful trees were broken. The animals and birds fled in surprise. What did you just do? Laura, who had been standing there, asked in surprise. Azel created cold air to cool his body. Instantaneous movement. That really was instantaneous movement. You traveled around 500 meters. Azel had been meditating on top of a mountain. When his senses reached this location, he used instantaneous movement in a lightning-fast manner to travel to this place. It was slightly less than 400 meters. This is what happens when I use my full strength. However, this isn't a practical move. If I use this in a real battle, my body would be sent flying by the rebound. Azel's instantaneous movement from a moment ago was several times faster than the speed of sound. Moreover, he had to suffer enormous shock at the beginning and the end. This one instantaneous movement had tired him out. He had consumed an enormous amount of magical energy, yet his energy pulse had filled up in no time. There were eight rings of life encircling Azel's heart. They were all finished using the dual banding technique. It was as if his source of dragon demon magic was limitless. He was continuously producing highly dense dragon demon magic. Laura mumbled to herself as if she couldn't believe what she was seeing. Even if you've inherited nine dragon weapons, I can't believe your magical energy became this high. It isn't just the dragon weapons. What? Carlos hadn't just stored my dragon weapons. He used the Keepers of Prophecy as a source for dragon demon magic. An enormous amount of power was stored within the dragon weapons. This was why a flood of power had come into me when I inherited the weapons. It was as if I had completed a dragon slayer's ritual. This resulted in Azel's wounds healing in an instant, and his body had become much stronger. It also increased the density of his dragon demon magic. In the process of settling the swirling power within his body, Azel had been able to create his eighth ring of life. He had also completed the dual banding. Laura queried, didn't you say you handled 13 dragon weapons in the dragon demon war? I did. How strong were you at that time? Him. I'm not sure. It should be comparable to my power right now. I never expected to recover my power to this extent. Azel answered her as he tilted his head to the side. Laura puzzled over his answer. Azel hadn't been able to inherit three dragon weapons. These weapons were destroyed. So why wasn't there any noticeable difference in his power? I'm inferior to my past self in some aspects, and I'm superior in other aspects. If I'm to point out the inferior parts, I've lost three dragon weapons, and my body is weaker than before. Moreover, the quality of my magical energy is a bit lacking compared to when I had use of my full dragon demon magic. His body was incredibly strong, but in comparison to his body during his prime years, it came up short. Moreover, the loss of three dragon weapons meant his tactical advantage had lessened significantly. The improvement is the magical energy. Magical energy. If I'm to be precise, the amount of magical energy I can produce in a short period of time. I can produce over twice the amount as before. How can this be? You. In the past, you were also an octopal master. Laura queried him. She couldn't comprehend what he was saying. It wasn't an exaggeration to say that an octopal master had almost reached the human limitation. In the plane of darkness, no one had reached this level. So there wasn't many she could use as a measuring stick. In the case of Duran, he had died at the hands of Azel. Duran had been superior in terms of magical energy compared to most dragon magians. He wasn't someone that could be easily ignored. Azel possessed twice that amount. It is thanks to a technique called dual banding. 
Azel had never talked about the dual banding to his party members. He had two reasons for doing this. First, he had never completed the technique before. He was walking through uncharted territory. He was making good use of this technique, but he hadn't consolidated it into something that could be taught to others. He wasn't confident in his ability to teach it. Moreover, no one in his party fulfilled the criteria for learning the dual banding. Chiron and Leticia were dragon arts practitioners. Laura and Euron were mages. Giles and Bohr. Their standard is too low for them to learn the dual banding. Azel had lost all of his magical energy, so he had been able to start applying the dual banding with his first ring of life. However, dual banding was a technique that required an extreme sense for magic. If one wasn't a high-ranking spirit order practitioner, one wouldn't be able to understand the basic concept of the technique. One wouldn't be able to get into the construction phase of the dual banding. Suddenly, Laura spoke. May you show me your maximum output of magical energy? Him. Should I give it a try? Azel accepted her request. The eight rings of life had been formed around the heart in a slightly staggered manner. The beat of his heart caused him to vibrate. A torrent of magical energy flooded forth. He wasn't doing anything, but waves of magical energy was pouring out of him. The ground started to shake. The radius of the earthquake ranged several hundred meters. Dirt and pebbles were floating in the air. When the earthquake started to calm down, the wind turned into a fierce gale. My God! Until now, Laura had never experienced being overwhelmed by someone else's magical energy. It was to be expected. She was of the dragon demon race. Moreover, the Onceris tribe had wanted an excellent heir, so they had employed forbidden techniques to create her. She had grown up while being subjected to hellish training. Her potential dragon demon magic had been brought out to its full capacity. However, she was having a hard time breathing just by being near the torrent of magical wave flowing out of Azel. It felt as if she was on a beach as she watched a tsunami coming towards her. What could anyone do against such vast magical energy? She felt an acute sense of despair. What's worse, Azel hadn't raised his magical energy to its maximum output yet. He had done a self-assessment, so he knew his limit. However, he had wanted to monitor his power with his senses as he produced it. This was why he had brought up his magical energy in a gradual manner, and he was still increasing the output. It was at that moment. Hey, Azel. You are interfering with my training session. A displeased voice could be heard. At the same time, the mountainous magical energy produced by Azel quickly diminished. He let out a bitter laugh as he spoke. We are also training. When he turned around, no one was there. The owner of the voice was Rishu, and he was standing at a beach that was one kilometer away. However, the two of them conversed as if the distance was inconsequential. They could see each other clearly and they used their magical energy to modulate their voices. Their voices could be delivered to each other at such large distances. You should either do it farther away from here or you should put up a barrier. What the hell are you doing? The forest is in a complete mayhem. I'm trying to teach a very subtle technique. I'll be careful. By the way, your magical energy has become outrageously large. I think you might be comparable to me. Not yet. I might be comparable to your old self. Haven't you become stronger? Laura was shocked at his words. He has such an enormous amount of magical energy, yet he is inferior. She had once heard that Rishu was the strongest in terms of dragon demon magic amongst the dragon demons. However, the amount of magical energy shown by Zell right now had exceeded the amount of dragon demon magic possessed by Almeric. He might exceed the amount possessed by Regus after his transformation. Yet he was saying he was inferior to Rishu. Rishu spoke. Anyways, you should be careful. Their lives are on the line when learning the dragon soul. It'll be troublesome if an outside factor caused them to lose concentration. I'll keep that in mind. Azel shrugged his shoulders. They had already stayed ten days at Rishu's home to learn the dragon soul. Each members of Azel's party had their own training regiment to pass the time. Azel sparred against the warriors of Alberton. Laura and Euron continued to speak with Alberton. They also exchanged knowledge with the other magicians. Chiron and Leticia were learning the dragon soul from Rishu. As each day passed, 
they became indebted to Sibane. I have to treat such grievous wounds for you every day. I would like you to stop this. Sibane had been called here at night, and he let out a sigh. Rishu scratched his head. Ah, I'm sorry. The fact that you are here makes me push them harder. Chiron and Leticia was on the floor, and they were moaning. The process of learning the dragon soul was harsh. The reason being one had to endure the process of one's dragon demon magic move in an uncontrolled manner. One had to put one's life on the line to learn this technique, so the sense of accomplishment at the end of each session was large. Moreover, one was able to acquire a huge amount of power in a very short amount of time compared to the time needed to create a dragon weapon. Sibane spoke. Their reservoir of dragon demon magic is large, so healing him is easy. However, it feels as if I'm fixing dolls you have broken on a daily basis. Wouldn't it be better to do this a little bit more slowly? I'm sorry, but they told me they don't have a lot of time. That is why I have to do this in a quick way. Anyways, once they learn how to summon the dragon soul, their own ability would have the biggest influence on what happens next. Him, you must be feeling some mixed emotions. That is true, but at this point, it is out of my hands. Sibane let out a bitter laugh. When he left the plane of darkness to become a resident of this forest, he had to give up his past as the son of the dragon demon king. He had cut ties with his comrades, and he had no longer been able to do anything for his daughter. It was unfortunate, but he couldn't break his promise. It wasn't just about his own resolve not to break his word. Alberton wouldn't have allowed him to go back on his word. After staring at him for a brief moment, Rishu changed the subject. I heard Azel defeated the warriors of Alberton. He is establishing the record for the most consecutive victories. There were those within the forest that possessed dragon weapons. There were also beings that had awoken their dragon soul. These beings were under the direct command of Alberton, and they were called the Warriors of Alberton. It was the highest honor to be called the Warrior of Alberton within the forest. These beings became aware of Azel's identity, and they had expressed their burning desire to spar with Azel. In the past ten days, Azel had set a winning record by notching 37 consecutive victories. Rishu grinned. It seems they've totally lost face. I bet everyone is grind their teeth right now. Chapter 174. Another Enemy. Part 2. That's right. Rishu Nim. Will you not fight him? The only one that can break his record here is Rishu Nim. The strongest residents of the forest were dragons. It was either Alberton or Libetan. Then there was the magician Hanarosa. Hanarosa was known for his fighting ability and leadership skills. He was the administrator in charge of outer region of the forest. Basically, Rishu was strongest amongst the warriors of the forest. However, he was in a bit of a unique situation. He had created the secret technique called the Dragon Soul. He also trained the warriors of the forest. This was why Alberton hadn't required an oath of loyalty from Rishu. He was allowed his freedom. This was why he was the only resident not under the authority of Alberton. It is all right for now. I'm busy teaching the dragon soul. Him. Anyways, it won't be a battle to the death. I can't fight him with all my might. It is the same now as in the old times. When they came here during the dragon demon war, Rishu and Azel taught each other. On top of that, they also got into endless sparring matches. They fought with their fists and swords. However, they never truly fought with everything on the line. We might have a chance to fight. I have to be patient for now. I have a task I need to accomplish. Rishu spoke those meaningful words, and he let out a bright smile. Rishu thought Chiron and Leticia were good students. Amongst all he had taught before, they had won the highest potentials. They had learned the basics of the dragon's soul in two weeks. This was something very hard to do. You should put deep import on my following words. The wakening of the dragon soul is different from creating a tool like the dragon weapon. This was the crucial difference between a dragon soul and a dragon weapon. In the dragon soul technique, a dragon demon or a dragon magian was imbuing life into their own dragon demon magic. Dragon demon magic was a power that could bend reality to one's will. It was similar to the power of the dragon where the dragon had dominion over nature. 
The difference was the fact that dragon demon magic was weaker than the dragon's power, but it was more versatile. This was the trait that had been inherited from the demon race. To be precise, the demon race had originated from the humans, who were weak. However, it also meant they possessed an all-purpose power. It was flexible. When these two traits were added to the dragon demon magic, one was able to construct a strong image. This allowed one to create all kinds of phenomenon in reality. Furthermore, dragon arts and magic were foundational techniques that increased the variety and efficiency of one's power. This meant one was able to clone one's soul using one's will. This was how a dragon weapon was formed. One has to choose to make a dragon weapon over a long period of time. For spirit order practitioners, a comparable example is making one's rings of life. For a magician, it is like creating a word of power. Spirit order practitioners crystallized their magical energy to create the rings of life. It was used as the source for their magical energy. Magicians decide on the power they want to imbue, and they created words of power. The magical energy was molded into characters. It was inscribed within one's body, and external power was injected into these characters to refine it into the form and quality one wanted. This is why dragon arts practitioners have a hard time making a dragon weapon. During their training, they never experience the process of crystallizing their magical energy. Dragon demons and dragon magian didn't have to go through the annoying process of crystallizing one's magical energy. They didn't need to go through the painstaking process to use their power. From the moment they were born, they possessed a massive amount of magical energy. All core organs were given to them from birth. These were the eyes, dragon demon stone and the horns. One has to crystallize one's magical into a high-density form. It isn't just magical energy. One has to be able to manifest one's dragon demon magic outside one's body. That is the dragon weapon. Of course, one need an incredible amount of pure dragon demon magic, but the crystallization process takes a long time in most cases. However, the dragon soul is different. Dragon weapons were tools made through refining one's dragon demon magic. On the other hand, dragon souls were. Life was imbued into one's dragon demon magic. It isn't a tool. It is more correct to say that it is a different form of oneself. It only takes on the form of a dragon, because the essence of dragon demon magic comes from the power of dragons. This was why the dragon soul didn't need to go through the long process of crystallizing the dragon demon magic. It all came down to whether one could awaken the dragon soul with one's dragon demon magic. That was it. It was a tribulation where each attempt entailed a significant amount of danger. I feel like dying. Chiron was utterly worn out. He had his head planted on the table. He raised his head as he spoke. Euron. Yes. Where did you get that book? They have books here. Ah. It seems the magicians are able to produce a good enough paper. There were a lot of records binded into a book, so I borrowed some of them. Who? They were making paper in this forest, and they were making books to keep records. It was quite amazing. What about the others? They are still back there. Azel is still having fun. He is. Are you jealous? In truth, I am. Shit. His body itched when he heard the news that Azel was sparring with the warriors of Alberton. However, the path to learning the dragon soul was too perilous. He didn't have enough energy to do anything else. Chiron had a dissatisfied expression on his face when he suddenly had a thought. He asked Euron a question. Now that I think about it. What is it? It's about the conversation we had last time. What? I'm talking about the story about Bayon. Ah. That. Euron finally realized what Chiron wanted to talk about. While they were being chased by dragon demon king worshippers, he had talked about the guide, and he had brought up the name of Bayon. Azel had awakened not too long afterwards, and events had been moving at a hectic pace. Euron had forgotten about the conversation. Chiron asked him a question. At the time, what were you trying to tell me? I suddenly remembered the conversation when I saw you. Him. That is. Euron awkwardly scratched his cheek as he started to speak. Have you heard this phrase before? Duke, you don't need a sword. What you desperately need is money and personal connections. What did you just say? In a flash, Chiron stood up in shock. How do you know those words? 
Chiron looked at Euron with shock and disbelief in his eyes. The words spoke by Euron had been spoken by Bayon, when he had been trying to establish his medical association. Bayon had spoken those words in a private meeting with Chiron. Euron spoke. I'm saying it now, because I thought my words would be more convincing if I started off with that nugget. Stop beating around the bush. Get to the point. You were very impatient. It is simple. I am Bayon. Ah, if I'm to be precise, I used to be Bayon. What an absurd story. I knew it would sound absurd to you. However, when I mulled over the identity of the guide, I came up with this theory. How is this possible? Reincarnation. You probably heard about such stories now and then. I think I'm the reincarnation of Bayon. Euron shrugged his shoulders. Souls were real. No one in this world doubted this fact. No one knew what the afterlife looked like, but at the very least, they knew souls existed. The proof was with the black magicians. Souls were used in necromancy, and the creation of the undead. When a person died, it was assumed that a soul had two choices. It could remain in this world or it could cross over to the underworld. If the soul remained in this world, there were cases where they became a spectre or an undead. There is a theory that believes in the rebirth of a soul in a new body. This theory exists in the discipline of magic, but most people believe it is a superstition. You just said it might be superstition. How is this supposed to persuade me? I'm not sure about it either. At times, I experience someone else's life through the dreams sent by the guide. I don't see the entire picture, but I see bits and pieces of this person's life. I become this figure in the past and I experience specific parts of the past. Whenever Euron had these dreams, it didn't feel as if he was a third party. It felt as if he was dreaming about something he had experienced before. I just can't remember it, but I believe I lived and experienced all of them before. That is what I think. The dreams sent by the guide had shown him many of Bayan's memories. After meeting Azel, he had gained access to the memories of the time he had established his medical association. He remembered meeting Chiron. As I experienced these events. In recent days, I came up with a theory. I wonder if the guide is just another manifestation of myself. Him, let us say that reincarnation exists. I might be a being that is continuously going through the cycle of reincarnation. However, the continuity between each reincarnation was severed. I don't think I'm the same person that is swapping out bodies each time. Each reincarnation shares the same soul, but we become an entirely new person each time. However, there was a third party that had observed his reincarnation from the beginning. This consciousness had accrued a continuous memory of his reincarnation, and it was delivering the knowledge to him. I wonder if that is the identity of the guide. In this case, the being that started the reincarnation was outstanding. I'm thinking he might have been an amazing magician that had the ability to scar this world through his magic. I think he started the reincarnation cycle with a specific goal in mind. That goal is probably has to do with my plight. My head hurts from hearing what you have to say. I understand what you are going through. I don't expect you to believe me anytime soon. I'll try. What? I'll try to believe in your story. If you believe me then you believe me. How can you work on believing in me? If it was before, I would have told you that you were speaking out of your ass. However, I've been experiencing improbable events that your story sounds plausible. Regus, Almeric and Azel. Things that he considered to be impossible was appearing in reality. I at this moment, he couldn't dismiss Uren's story as bullshit. However, if you are the reincarnation of Bayon, him, I wonder how he could have become you. Reincarnation sounds like a bum deal. What's wrong with me? Bayon was a wise man, who cured the incurable great calamity. He put his life on the line in this endeavor, and he became the flame of hope for humanity. I want you to put your hand over your heart, and I want you to be honest. Are you someone that is comparable him? You, if you put it that way, I feel aggrieved. You have to take in the age difference into account before comparing our achievements. I want you to ask me that same question in ten years. Chiron had a peculiar feeling as he watched the grumbling Euron. He hadn't personally been close to Bayon. He had respected the man, so he had wanted to sponsor Bayon. Chiron had looked up to Bayon. 
Age and his station hadn't mattered. He had fought and won against the despair that had blanketed the world. Bayon was a human that had deserved Chiron's respect. That man reincarnated into this guy. When he heard that Euron was Carlos' descendant, he had an easy time believing in it. Euron had a strikingly similar appearance to Carlos. Azel had confirmed this fact, and even Almeric had remarked on it. However, he was having a hard time finding any commonality between Bayon and Euron. If he forced himself to find one, they both possessed knowledge of unknown origin. If everything came from the guide within his dream, it sounds plausible. Bayon had found a thread that unraveled the great darkness. Everyone had been powerless up until that time. There had been some unsavory rumors that he had made a deal with a demon. In the end, his actions had resulted in saving humanity, so no one had the gumption to bring up such suspicions. If your theory is correct, why doesn't the guide reveal everything to you? Chapter 175. Another Enemy. Part 3. I also have a question about that point. Currently, I'm living my reincarnated life. I don't think the guide is holding back information to preserve my new sense of self. Why? If it is as you've said, the guide has a clear objective, and the guide is leading you towards a specific direction. Why wouldn't the guide clear up his identity? Wouldn't it be better if your goals is aligned with his? My guess is that the guide has set conditions he has to follow. Conditions. It doesn't matter if it is me or Bayon. After being reincarnated, I believe the guide isn't allowed to act in a way that would hinder the independence of the newly formed self. If there are two selves present, I believe memories of the two selves might overlap and merge. The confusion caused by this act might result in a completely different person emerging from the process, so you created another theory to support your other theory. I did. That is why I can't ask you to believe in it, since I don't know if it is the truth. Euron let out an embarrassed laughter as he shrugged his shoulders. This was what he thought, and if Chiron didn't believe him, it couldn't be helped. If Chiron thought about it, Euron's attitude had always been like this. His attitude remained consistent from the moment Chiron had met him. He was a hard person to trust, but his actions under duress made Chiron want to trust him. You are light-hearted and carefree. Bayon was much more earnest and meticulous. How can a guy like you claim to be his descendant? I'm not his descendant. I'm really him. Yeah, yeah. There were a lot of dragons within the Alberton forest. Unlike other places, Alberton and Lebeton took control and created order within their habitat. This was why there were a lot of dragons that were reaching their maturity here. The number of dragons that reached adulthood was easily over 1,000. Moreover, the Dragon Slayer's ritual was considered to be the most honorable tribulation one could go through. When she learned this truth, Laura was puzzled. This place is ruled by a dragon, so why? One of Mineral's pupil was getting ready for the Dragon Slayer's ritual. When one decided to go through the Dragon Slayer's ritual, one had to notify and get permission from Alberton. Then the dragon that will be challenged would be notified, and a future date was set. Both sides fought at peak condition. Mineral tilted her head. Is it weird? Of course, it was weird. The plane of darkness only treated the dragon slayer's ritual to be a honorable tribulation, because it allowed him to acquire a massive amount of power. On top of that, it was the only way they could create a dragon weapon. However, how could taking of a dragon's life considered to be honorable when this land was ruled by a dragon? Mineral let out a laugh. It is like this from Alberton Nim's perspective. He had acquired wisdom, so he wouldn't deny the other dragons their rights to do the same. Wisdom is what the dragons desire the most. Wouldn't it be cruel for Alberton Nim to deny their chance to pursue the desire? Should the dragons give up the desire just because he protects them? Ah, after Rishu Nim invented the dragon soul, the number of people attempting the dragon slayer's ritual have decreased. However, there are still many that wishes for a dragon soul or a dragon weapon. The dragon slayer's ritual is essential for this. Unlike the outside world, Alberton Nim presides over the ritual. It is fair for both sides. I see. The dragon and challenger wanted the fight even at the expense of their lives. From the perspective of a civilized society, it was barbaric. However, 
Neither dragons nor humans were able to find an alternative method to acquire what they want. Laura queria her. The dragons. How many dragon slayers ritual does one need to go through to gain wisdom? It had been several thousand years since the dragon slayers ritual was found. However, very few dragons had acquired wisdom during that time. There might be other wise dragons residing in this wide world. However, Laura only knew about Alberton and Lebeton. Mineral answered her. I have no idea. What? Alberton Nim and Lebeton Nim does not remember how many dragon slayers ritual they had performed. It also depends on the opponents they faced. However, I'm sure one or two rituals isn't enough. It was an almost never-ending tribulation for the dragons. They had no idea when they would acquire their wisdom. Yet they continued to fight with their lives on the line for that sliver of possibility. The only thing that is certain is. Each successful dragon slayer's ritual brings about a noticeable rise in intelligence. However, even in victory the dragons possess the intelligence of a beast. The wisdom is acquired by the dragon only at the last moment when the threshold is crossed. This is the extent of information that is known to us. It is quite cruel, isn't it? At Laura's comments, Mineral let out a bitter laugh. From the perspective of the dragons, it was cruel. It didn't matter if a dragon was one step away from achieving wisdom. They could die without experiencing any results they had accrued if that last step wasn't taken. Mineral spoke. There might come a day when a more sensible person might find another way. On the other hand, people get sick, old and starve. There might be no ideal solution to a painful death. We only had this method. Cybane was a bit uncomfortable with Azel residing within the forest. At the same time, he was gripped with the desire to converse more with him. It was quite the conflicting emotion. The funny thing was the fact that Azel shared the same emotions as him. May I ask you for a favor? What is it? Will you help me persuade my daughter? I believe I was clear in spelling out my relationship with Nibiris. Of all the people he could ask, he was asking this of Azel. Cybane let out a sigh. I know. However, I have no one else I can ask for help. I'll tell you information that will be of help to you. I believe the truth I can tell you will be worth it. You have no idea what information I was able to gather outside. Do you really think you'll be able to produce any useful information? I do. I have information that'll definitely be worth it. Him. I want you to persuade my daughter. No. If you can't persuade her. I want you to subdue her by force. Bring her here. Please give me a chance to persuade her. Azel thought about it for a brief moment. Could his information really be of any worth? He already had enough information about the inner workings of the plane of darkness. However, it was also true that he was intrigued by Cybane's attempt at trying to persuade him. Cybane seemed. In the end, Azel nodded his head. I'll attempt it. However, I cannot guarantee success. Is that fine? Thank you. Cybane lowered his head. When he saw this, Azel's expression turned complicated. In the past, Cybane had been the prince of a hostile enemy force. They had tried to kill each other. Now he was lowering head, while asking Azel to save his daughter. Cybane spoke. There is two crucial important information I can give you. First, I'll have to finish the story I didn't finish last time. I'll have to tell you how I got here. You said you had two reasons, you remembered. First, it was my wife's death. When the madness descended, the remnant of his kingdom morphed into a religious organization. Cybane became tired of the plane of darkness. Just spending a year or two in such an environment would make anyone want to quit. He spent over a 100 years there. He monitored the situation that spanned longer than a human's lifespan. The things he loved and cherished was turning hideous. All his work had built up his hope, but he knew full well that his actions hadn't improved anything. Still, he continued to work hard believing that things would get better. He hoped that everything he had loved once could return to what it used to be. He deluded himself as he endured through the long years. By the time his delusion crumbled, it was a wonder he hadn't gone crazy. It was an arranged married, but I loved her. At first, I pitied her, and I wanted to treasure her. My feelings started out like that. It was funny. After a little time had passed, I realized I found my first love at my age. 
His married life with his wife Elberus was his most brilliant memory during his long stay in the Plain of Darkness. There was no tension between him, and he had been happy spending peaceful times with her. They had been so happy when Niberus was born. Azel had a peculiar feeling as he watched Cybane, who was reminiscing on old events. Cybane had loved his wife, and he was happy for the birth of his daughter. This wasn't the first time Azel had experienced this. His enemies had been capable of laughter and tears. They showed they were capable of love and humanity. Hadn't he counseled Laura about this very subject? Even though he had encountered this a many of times, he couldn't help but feel complicated emotions arise from within him. Cybane didn't realize Azel was feeling such emotions. He continued to speak. However, treachery was fermenting in the background. Cybane spent more time wandering around the world than the time he spent inside the plane of darkness. While he was gone, Elberus had been abused. He wasn't talking about physical abuse. From the time she was young, Elberus had been sickly. Those that had called her useless in the past continued to bully her. Elberus had always smiled in front of Cybane as if nothing was wrong. From behind the scenes, she continued to be mocked and insulted. They told her she was useless even as a tool for propagating the great bloodline. Even after she gave birth to Niberus, the insults never went away. Others pressured her to take drugs for fertility. They pressured her to go through with magical experimentation. I was really an idiot. I realized this after she had died. When Cybane was with her, he had tried to shield her. No one dared to speak out of turn. However, he had to go out for missions. Moreover, he couldn't stop branch members of her family from approaching her. They were her kin, and her tribe was one of the influential families within the ruling body of the Plane of Darkness. They conducted body modification experiments, so she could have more children. In the end, her body became too burdened by the stress, and she lost her life. When he found out the truth, Cybane had gone mad from rage and grief. His usual self-control was nowhere to be found. He had killed the person that had authorized the experiment, and he had killed everyone that had carried out the experiment. It resulted in him eradicating Elberai's entire tribe. At his actions, the elders reacted in anger. However, they couldn't kill Cybane, who was the legitimate son of Atain. They tried to imprison Cybane, but he fled the plane of darkness before they could. That means, Azel furrowed his brows. Basically, you are a traitor. That's right. However, I found this out when I talked to Laura. They covered up what I did. Cybane let out a bitter laugh. Laura and the younger generation within the plane of darkness were told that Cybane had went missing after fighting the Guardian Shadows. They didn't tell anyone what had happened. They had completely sealed away information that would shake the loyalty of the younger generation. I asked my mother to take care of Niberus, who had just went into hibernation. It was questionable as to whether Ain Sarah was able to still feel love for her own child anymore. Still, she was his only option, and Ain Sarah agreed to his request. My mother put my case into arbitration, but the elders were uncompromising. They sent out a hunting party to take me into custody. However, I used the fruit of the missions, which I carried out over the years. Fruit of the mission. 